the other day, um, Mus uh, Musk was saying something about level level five AI to be able to um, make uh, fully autonomous um, driving. Okay. And, uh, and, and I think that's going to be really interesting uh, to see if they can, you know, some of, some of the, there's uh, some companies like Zooks, I don't know if you've heard of them, uh, that are trying to do this self-driving uh, taxi cabs and stuff, kind of an uh -huh. Uber, but self-automated. Uh -huh. It's going to be pretty, pretty nifty. I mean, you can imagine what's going to happen to our traffic congestion and all that when, when you have, uh, you know, it's all done by computer instead of uh, random humans, right? Yeah, you're not kind of uh, tailgating, causing, you know, yeah, causing just, traffic. Even, okay. Exactly. The traffic is just, when you look at it, it's like, there's no reason why this traffic couldn't move faster. It's just right. because people kind of stopping and going and randomness and causing a lot of, uh, you know, congestion. No reason, <laughs> except for the human factor. But as soon as you add, uh, you know, uh, it's going to take a long time, but, but imagine... In the future, maybe 30, 40 years when they can put AI in, in the cars, and then you're going to have much smoother uh, traffic flow, much more efficient. Yeah, I look forward to it. I look forward to pulling my Airstream and I can go to sleep as I go from <laughs> coast to coast. <laughs> yep, yep. I think it's going to be interesting, and I'm all for it, but it's, it's going to be a key moment when we have the first mishaps, accidents, and lawsuits from automated cars, things may take a few steps back then. Well, we, That's we already true, did David. have that right. person that was, was that there was a fatality already. I know, Someone, but such things are always coded in a sort of a utopian naivete when it comes to pr the practical world, I think, you know? Yeah, probably. That's probably true. Well, the human okay, I will go to sleep while we're going coast to coast, but... You know, right. So there's a there's a whole human factor, the emotional part, because like a, even with this uh, vaccine, you know, uh, with a Johnson and Johnson, if you just look at the statistics, it's like okay, 0.001 percent of people have died, but the fact that there's any deaths gets blown yeah, out has, because does it have to be perfect? Yeah. It does, yeah, exactly. So it's it's the same thing with this. I think you're right, David. Is is there's going to be some mishaps and it's going to be blown out of proportion statistically. But it still matters, right? Because as a human, exactly. Yeah. Even if it's a tiny, tiny number of, of problems, we'll just compare that out. that little tiny graph to the graph we have now. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yep. So, but you know, there yep. the lawyers will need something to do. You know. Yeah. As always. Yeah, we have to make sure that we make the AI to our benefit, <laughs> not to its own yeah. benefit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see how that works out. But... but humans left to their own devices have done some pretty crazy things. Oh, yeah. yeah. But now being into astronomy, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, all, a lot of this, uh, this golden age of astronomy kind of with chipsets and all that, getting into smarter telescopes, you know, smarter, smarter EAA, a um, lot of cool stuff happening right now. I mean, you're getting all the bits and pieces. And um, yeah, like I, I would give it the analogy, it's kind of like the 90s with PCs, home PCs, where you plug in, plug in PCR card, card slots, hard drives, and, and then they didn't, they just started to have USB so you can, but, but now imagine in the future, we're going to have more and more integrated um, uh, telescope systems that you'll be able to, instead of an image train, you know, getting all those, uh, you know, spacers and everything, you're going to be able to have, uh, you know, a calibrated um, kind of ocular so IP slash imager combined uh, that will be matched. And you can just plug that in and then uh, it will be a, a lot easier and more accessible for people, I think. And, and, the, and the costs will be going down as well. We just need to make sure that Elon, while he's making uh, still more money, doesn't uh, rob us of a dark night sky. Oh, you know, I've been up and down on that one, David. It's interesting that you mentioned that. That's, that's a fascinating topic because initially he's it's like, oh. He's certainly you not know, a hero for 
professional astronomers right now with the no, Starlink. No, I, that's the thing because it's like okay, you know, and then I was thinking, oh well, well with stacking and you know all the capabilities of that you can filter it out. But like you said, that's a key point, especially professionals. Time is of the essence. So if you rob yourself that imaging time and you have to take out that frame. It's like, great, you can take it out, but you've lost that time, that data for that time that you use that telescope. And that, and that's what I'm seeing with live snacking is like, okay, I'm going there and I, I do, do 10 live sacks of 30 seconds, but then invariably a satellite comes through and does a photo bomb. And then I've lost my, you know, a couple of minutes of my nice image. That's so right and in front of the supernova that you would have captured. <laughs> It, yeah, you, you got it right on, Scott. So it, it is actually rather annoying, <laughs> and it's going to get worse, that's for sure. It's a, it's a major problem for professional astronomy, a huge problem. In, yeah. in fact, Jeff Hall at Lowell Observatory is is on the, he's, he's essentially the, when it comes to writing about this, the leader of the AAAS committee on this. It's a major problem right now. Yeah. So they're trying and, and to that's just now, yeah. To, to to be a little more sensitive to what he's doing to to so, professional research. So if we were, I mean, if if Elon was listening right now, okay, uh, what what would we say to him? Because he's not the only guy that's going to put up constellations of satellites, right? Well, let me ask you one question first. Do okay. you really think that he's more interested in that than he is in making money? <laughs> just, he is a billionaire. Let's have a, let's have a come I don't to know. Jesus. You know, I, I can't say. I can't well, say. I, you know, it's interesting, Dave. But one thing that's a pattern as as people get older uh, and billionaires, you know, they, they start to become more uh, philanthropic, right? Uh, so, so they have their money now. They've, you know, they they were all nasty people when they were young to get their, you know, their billions. And, and then they start to say, well, you know, I want to do something else. And, uh, you know, more more than just make money. I've made my money. But, you know, the, what, the aspirations are pretty high for somebody like, uh, you know, both of these guys. So you're right. They, they, But they are still mortals. They're still human beings. And they can only do so much in their lifespan. So the question is, when are they going to reach that pivot point to say, I'm not, you know, this is much as this is as far as I can take the baton with my billions. And I, now I'm, I've done my earning. Now I'm going to switch to, you know, like Bill Gates or whatever, even though he has some personal problems right now. But, you know, um, but or are they going to just keep him going to the grave and just be, you know, fight to the right to the edge uh, and just keep him wanting more uh, to, to get to really realize an unreasonable, realizable dream in their lifetime? That's that is the question. And I think that if you look at um if you look at Musk, he's still pretty young. Um, he has big aspirations. He wants to even go to Mars himself. So you're right. I think you're right, David. He at this point, he's not going to really care. But what we can ask to you know answer Scott's uh, question, we can say, hey, come on, Musk, uh, help us put a, some observatories in in space, some more telescopes in space, to kind of offset this disruption. And, and then also put some on the moon, right? Let's put a, a couple observatories on the moon with the instrumentation that we, you know, to replace our Earth-bound telescopes. That would be a great, great thing. What do you guys think? I admire your idealism immensely. Thanks, thanks, Dave. Bless you for that, Cameron. And I hope you're right. <laughs> Something I do wonder about, if, if I may add, are the uh, preventative measures they suggested for the Starlink satellites? Because there was an article in Sky and Telescope a couple of months ago, I can't remember who wrote it, unfortunately, but they were saying they had that first generation of satellites just to, to test out the technology and they were very bright. And then uh, they re-entered the atmosphere and, and burned up and then they started launching the new constellation where they would um, basically paint the satellites black and, and make them a little bit darker. So the author of this article did um, some kind of mag magnitude estimate on the different generations of satellites and what they were doing and found that the ones with the preventative measures uh, came in at about eighth magnitude. And while that wouldn't really matter to us 
using the naked eye, even at a dark sky site, I do wonder what that says for the professional amateur astronomers or, or the, excuse me, the professional astronomers and the amateur photographers, because eighth magnitude can be bright. You will see that across your image if you're going in deep enough. Oh, yeah. You're well, right on, you're Connell. If you're taking wide field spectra of multiple galaxies with a Keck 10 meter telescope, there's really no difference yeah. between eighth magnitude and first magnitude, you know, it, it's, it's a wash, you know, so you know, it may not matter as much for us as amateurs, but for professional astronomy, it's a disaster still, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, we have a word for that. It's called putting lipstick on a pig. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's 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 just a PR thing, and um, it's not. It doesn't matter where it really matters, <laughs> which is the professional. Yeah, that's that's the unfortunate part. Yeah. So it's um, money is all about money. But but again, I I want to be idealistic and say hey. Come on, Musk, build us some uh, some Earth, uh, orbiting observatories, and uh, uh, and 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 uh, put some moon, on the moon base. Let's uh, subsidize some of the um, some of the buildings and 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 change or or build some uh, you know radio telescopes, uh, optical telescopes, all different types of scopes on on uh, in on the dark in some. I guess they would have to be in uh, kind of shadow areas of the moon. They wouldn't be able to take any direct sunlight, <laughs> so you'd have to put them in kind of uh, maybe the south pole of the um, the moon, something like that, not in the north pole, but uh, but that would be really good. Some moon bases. Hmm. Well, knowing how ground-based telescopes work with space-based telescopes, you still need the ground-based stuff, you know, you need it. Well, just the yeah. volume, you can't put, you know, 500 observatories on the moon, you know, the volume of yeah. astronomy that's going on, on earth is, you know, astronomical in a word compared right. to what you could do from orbit or from another, you know, which is a little <clears throat> you know, unrealistic given time and money to immediately go and build things on the moon. You know, some yeah, no, you're right, and the you know you think our USB connection is a limitation. <laughs> you still have to yeah. tether to the moon and bring all that data and analyze it. Yeah, it, it's it's true, David. Yeah, no, you're right. But you know, maybe he'll become more sensitive as time goes on here to to what astronomers are doing. We already had a major problem before this, and that is that in the United States, essentially, light pollution has ruined everything east of the Mississippi River, you know, light pollution yeah. was a pretty big problem to begin with. Yep, still is. Yep. Still is. All kinds of pollution. Yeah, we need to find a way to be opportunistic. So, you know, as as we, um, and we're, we're already, this is the fact that we're having this conversation as part of it is just kind of thinking uh, about how can we take advantage of the billionaires spend and see, you know, and, and the way things are going um, to be able to kind of maximize it. For example, there is an opportunity with light pollution to uh, with LED, oh, there was an opportunity, but we kind of missed it uh, where we could, you know, change the, the, uh, the spectrum of, of the LEDs, for example. So they wouldn't be emitting white light on all across the whole thing right the whole spectrum but of course, um, energy companies who are driving this want as much energy to be used as possible yeah, absolutely <laughs> yeah that's, that's like the, the, the rubber tire manufacturers <laughs> ripping up all it's the so true. in la it's the economy <laughs> stupid yeah no it's, it's the economy <laughs> stupid. No, it, it's always the economy no, it's true it's true you got to find a way knowing how humans behave with the economy and they drive to continuously make money um how do we you know may, may try to get some uh some of that funneled into the right you know to a more productive and future a more sustainable uh future we need to do many many more global star parties and have millions of people see them <laughs> yeah, that's right yes. <laughs> yeah, all the answers are right here <laughs> that was great. Right <laughs> Thank you.
It's early morning on February 15th, 2013. A meteor weighing 10,000 metric tons is about to explode nearly 23 kilometers above Chelyabinsk. Shortly after local sunrise, a blinding sight for the stunned spectators on the ground. A massive explosion equivalent to 440 kilotons of TNT. Hundreds of tons of debris released and quickly moved up into the atmosphere. The highly sensitive OMPS instrument on board the Sumi MPP satellite made its first observation of the plume. Nearly three and a half hours later, an entire 1,100 kilometers east of the explosion and already at 40 kilometers altitude, well into the Earth's stratosphere. A surprising observation since the stratosphere usually acts as a bumper that caps aerosols trying to rise up from the lower atmosphere. By inserting a column of data from the first plume observation into two NASA models, scientists were able to project the plume's trajectory. The model showed that the plume at higher altitudes, shown in red, would move ahead of the lower layer, shown in yellow. The reason would be the difference in wind velocity at the lower and higher altitudes. Also illustrated here is how accurately the satellite observations coincided with the projected path of the plume. When OPS made its second observation, back at Chelyabinsk, nearly five hours after the bolide, there was still evidence of the plume at a lower 30 kilometer altitude. On February 16th, one day after the bolide, the OMPS instrument detected the far end of the plume even further at 1,700 to 4,300 kilometers eastward from the explosion. By February 19th, four days after the explosion, the satellite observation showed that the meteor debris had circumnavigated the entire globe and returned to Chelyabinsk forming a complete global belt. The clean shape of the belt was another surprising prediction, considering that northern hemisphere winds during the winter are usually rather inconsistent in direction. A further look into the model simulation showed that the evidence of the plume would persist for a long time, which also coincided with the satellite observations. We have now seen how accurately the models were able to project the plume's trajectory. This is critical since the same models are used to study climate and ozone depletion. The unprecedented sensitivity of the OMPS instrument and its ability to see vertical profile of the atmosphere helped scientists track and study the meteor plume for months, revealing a much better picture of what the aftermath on the atmosphere could be from potential future and even bigger events. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and welcome to the 57th Global, Global Star Party. Um, it's uh, uh, the theme of uh, our program today is um, you know falling stars and fireballs, but uh, you know uh, that could take us almost in any direction in uh, people's experiences in astronomy. What I will tell you is I think all of us as, as astronomers, amateur astronomers, stargazers, uh, our experience is often punctuated by spectacular um, views of, uh, of uh, bolides or falling stars, um, uh, you know, the uh, meteors that uh, fall to Earth and uh, sometimes uh, explode in the sky. Some of them leave smoke trails. I even heard one one time. So. Um, which is uh, still to this day, I've, I've never experienced it again, but I always kind of keep, <laughs> I know maybe I shouldn't do this, but as I'm driving or walking or whatever, I always kind of keep my periphery 
locked on the sky, you know, because you never know when you might see something, you know, and, and uh, this could happen the day, the evening, of course, anytime at night. And so, um, you know, I love to see uh, this, you know, these things streak across the sky. Um, uh, just a few days ago, ago I reported a bolide that uh, was um, uh, just, you know, visible here in Spring, Springdale. And uh, it was the first time that I'd seen a bolide start to break apart and then turn deep, deep blue before it, uh, it went away. And so, you know, I've seen green ones, yellow ones, orange ones, red ones, you know, but this was, this was the first blue one. So, um, and I know that everybody else here has, you know, amazing stories about uh, uh, bolide, bolides and meteors and meteor showers and this, this kind of thing. And it always gets us all excited. But, um, uh, you know, our program tonight uh, normally starts out with David Levy. David is running just a little bit late. He, he uh, uh, emailed me uh, uh, yesterday about it. And so he'll be on a little bit later on in our program, maybe in about half an hour or so. Um, but uh, it gives me great pleasure right now to uh, bring up uh, David Eicher. David Eicher is editor-in-chief of Astronomy Magazine. Uh, really, uh, you know, the magazine's an authority and, uh, uh, and for many, the authority in their astronomy news and information. And, uh, um, you know, so it's something that, uh, you know, if, if I, you know, uh, think about my experience in amateur astronomy, Astronomy Magazine definitely played a huge role in it and still does. So, um, uh, you know, and David Eicher has been someone that has been involved with the magazine for a very long time. Before that, he had his own uh, magazine, uh, you know, about deep sky astronomy, and uh, he has written many books on astronomy. I'm holding one right here. This is uh, his book, Galaxies. Um, David, I don't know how many books you've written so far, but uh, I think many, and I think you got more in you before before it's all said and done indeed i'm going to uh experiment with a little bit uh, from a new book project tonight if you'll permit me yeah absolutely so I'll, I'll turn it over to david but i know that you're going to love this so well thank you scott so much and it's a pleasure to be with you as always tonight and and to see our pals online here mm -hmm. um and uh tonight i'd like to talk a little bit i'm going to do a reading tonight because uh, we're starting to move back some capability into our building after a year and a half back at Astronomy Magazine. And so the microscope is temporarily uh, uh, non-deployed. So I'd like to, I've been doing a, some writing about a project uh, that involves some chemistry and astronomy. So I thought I would do a little reading tonight from some of that material because it involves uh, a bit of it, uh, some of my early times with Carl Sagan, who's always fun to, to talk about. And I won't read the whole 5,000 words of this section here. We'd be here all night, but I'll read some of it and share a little bit of that, those thoughts with you, if I may, Scott. Absolutely. All right, this is called Chemicals. Uh, smells are powerful memory triggers. Stand on a warm beach and breathe in the sea air or approach the oven with freshly baked blueberry muffins and you'll identify. For me, one of the earliest smells that stands out is the strong aroma of chemicals in my dad's lab. He was a professor of organic chemistry at Miami University in Southwestern Ohio. And sometimes as a young kid, I would make my way over to his office after school. The university's chemistry department, headquartered in a massive building called Hughes Labs, seemed like a flurry of activity. Students darted in and out, lab work dragged on as glassware clanked, professors lurked in their offices and poured over papers, equipment buzzed from all directions. What was that strong smell, I finally asked. It's from chemicals here in the lab, was the obvious answer. This son of a chemist then one day blurted out, probably at the dinner table as a very young kid, I don't like chemicals, they smell. I then heard the first lecture on the terrible, stinky nature of chemicals in my life. Everything is made of chemicals, my dad shot back, except for thoughts, and they're the result of chemical reactions. 
Then, and I'm going to skip around a little bit here, so so there'll be uh, or we'd be here too long. But so bear with me. The memory of that dinner time spark lingered. A quarter of a century later, I thought about that realization again. I was driving on a Wisconsin highway, making my way northwest from Milwaukee, past Madison, and on up to Eau Claire. I was going to a scientific meeting, Comets and the Origin and Evolution of Life, and it was the late fall of 1991. I was a young editor at Astronomy Magazine, and I was excited to be on a journey covering a professional meeting and also set to hang out with one of my heroes, Carl Sagan. So we'll skip then Eau Claire 1991. Now I was an associate editor of astronomy and still publishing Deep Sky as well, now a quarterly. I still vividly remember the moment when Carl walked in the room and I shook his hand and said hello. And this was after I had corresponded with him for about uh, uh, 15 years at that point about career advice and, and what I should do and everything. And I decided to ignore him completely and bail out of being a professional astronomer and get into journalism. I still vividly remember the moment when Carl walked in the room and I shook his hand and said, hello. I reminded him of our correspondence and was a bit surprised when he instantly recalled me and all of our previous discussions. He looked as much like a movie star as a scientist. He was taller than he seemed on TV. He reached for something in his wallet, which looked fancy. I think it was a snakeskin wallet and he was dressed immaculately. He had the kind of presence that commanded the room when he walked in. His warmth, smile, and laughter were infectious, and I was immediately struck by his generosity with his time and uplifting spirit. He talked at length about things that seemed important to me at the time, but could hardly have been important to him. So we'll skip further then. Uh, and of course, Carl's connection to the conference on comets and the origin and evolution of life was a special one. After all, he spent his early years as a scientific thinker leaning into the subject of chemistry. In his New Jersey high school, he was president of the chemistry club. He made cardboard cutouts of molecules to understand how they formed. At the University of Chicago, he began to weave chemistry and astronomy together, working in the lab of geneticist Hermann Mueller and writing a thesis on the origins of life with the Nobel Prize laureate chemist Harold Ure. Ah, when I talked about this with Anne, this is Carl's widow, Anne Dreen, the executive producer of Cosmos, the new generation Cosmos. Mm -hmm. Just a few years ago, how proud I was to tell her that my dad worked for URA on the Manhattan Project at Columbia University during the Second World War. There was an early connection between the Sagans and the Ikers. And we skip ahead a little bit more, and this is how Carl talked a lot about chemistry and what we're made out of, and actually was one of the uh, uh, early astronomers who helped to found what became known as cosmochemistry the field of chemistry applied to astrophysics. Taking this concept to a much wider audience, Sagan's explosively popular Cosmos published in 1980, along with the PBS TV documentary included a similar version of, a, of his famous saying, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. Of course, you know that famous quotation of his, how thrilled I was when I received in the mail that fall an inscribed copy of his book signed by Carl and with the notation for Dave Viker, friend of the cosmos. And that is still a treasured artifact that I have here. Oh, wow. That is so cool. So we skip ahead a lot more or we'd be here so long you we'd have to talk about the whole periodic table. And we'll go now to talk about, uh, well, the discovery of what chemistry is all about. And even the Greeks um, and Romans realized eventually, of course, when they thought about the substance of earth and what matter was, that it was made of minute particles, of course. 
This was a century after the Greeks, Democritus suggested that all matter in the world was composed of tiny shapes called atoms. This led to the basis of the first great and widely accepted notion of matter uh, from the philosopher Aristotle, of course, who expanded the idea and added the four basic elements, uh, ether uh, and another ether, the ether, um, the material that fills the cosmos above Earth's sphere. So then writing onward uh, later in time about all these things, we're skipping a long time here. Rene Descartes, the French philosopher wrote about the nature of matter, but then taking Descartes' idea a step further uh, was the great physicist Isaac Newton, of course, uh, who developed the idea of matter in a more sophisticated way. With his landmark work, Principia Mathematica, Newton defined matter as a mechanical substance with intrinsic properties that the universe could affect. Mass and gravity and other properties could dictate what happened to matter and how it interacted with things in the cosmos. This was a novel thing that Newton introduced at that time. At one point, Newton listed the qualities of matter, extension, hardness, impenetrability, mobility, and inertia. In his lesser known work, Optics, that's with a K, uh, Newton conjectured that God created matter as solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles that are even so very hard as never to wear or break into pieces. Hmm. So a quasi-modern understanding of matter was then finally coming together. Being composed of normal matter myself, Sitting in a conference room in Eau Claire and listening to the lectures, my mind was awash in these thoughts of chemistry in the cosmos. And I think this is just important for us to remember now uh, the basics of what we're made out of here. Speakers described how comets delivered a significant amount of water to early Earth, contributing a fair percentage of the H2O in our oceans. They described how complex organic molecules are present in comets and how it's possible that cometary nuclei could have slammed into Earth in large numbers and helped to seed the earliest life on the planet. They described the subtle interplay between small bodies like comets and asteroids in the solar system's early days and the larger, rarer bodies like Earth and the other young planets. Could life have been delivered from the stars above uh, by a comet smashing into Earth? Or was there so much in terms of complex organics already simmering throughout the oceans, waiting near a hydrothermal vent, time passing and allowing just the right combination of chemicals to come together to start self-replicating molecules and the spark of life? Once abundant oceans were in place on Earth, on organics in the ocean, a conference speaker proclaimed, life came about on our planet very quickly. I was a young kid from Ohio at the time, uh, reeling with the possibilities. How could this possibly be? I actually blurted out loud after that line. <laughs> Sitting next to me, Carl Sagan slowly turned and uttered a single word chemicals. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like uh, the, 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 the line in uh, um, The Graduate where the guy says plastics. <laughs> your, your future? I'm just going to tell you one thing, David. <laughs> chemicals, okay? <laughs> there it is, okay? <laughs> That's career advice. <laughs> That's your career advice right there. That's awesome. Wow, what a rich, wonderful, <laughs> amazing time. I mean, that's so cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's Thank amazing. You. Well, uh, gosh, uh, now you, you mentioned, David, that you are you writing a book about these experiences or? You know, maybe I shouldn't talk a whole lot about it yet, but it's going to okay. be a book about all sorts of what the universe is made up of and yeah. kind of why how we got here and include not just a lot of hard science I think in this one but a lot of stories about the people who I've uh, had the great privilege of being around Clyde Tombaugh, Bart Bach, David Levy, uh, yeah. Brian May, Richard Dawkins, uh, 
Buzz Aldrin, uh, Charlie Duke, Jim Lovell, you know, lots of people. Stephen Hawking. And stories hanging out and doing things with them that have all been a part of the story of kind of the realization of what the universe is all about and why we're here on this little planet. That's right. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Okay, well, thank you so much, David. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a real gift. Thank you. Um, okay, so up next, um, we uh, have Terry Mann, uh, former two-term president of the Astronomical League and um, uh, currently secretary of the Astronomical League. She just can't get away from the League. She's been there for a while. She's a force in amateur astronomy and um, you know uh, really honored to have her on our program it's been a while though terry since you've been on you you've, you've uh, been cycling through with uh, chuck allen and um, uh, carol orge and and uh, 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 another, another name is escaping Maynard me right now john, yeah yeah john john goss and and uh, right so yeah yeah so very cool very cool uh, doing al live once a month i'm always there yeah. Uh, so yeah we just kind of cycle through and rotate uh, it just makes it easier especially with vacations coming up yeah uh, so we, we were well, this way too they everybody uh you know gets to personally yeah. get to know uh all of you so and uh you guys are certainly uh leaders in in um uh you know taking care of so many members uh, you know have what over 20,000 members. Is that right? We're getting there. Yeah. We're, we're getting there. It's actually been a good year, even considering COVID, because so many people are really into astronomy. Uh, yes. So we, we've really had some nice growth in the league with membership. I had a conversation uh, just, um, just a few days ago with one of the really large telescope retailers that's been into it for a while. And we talked about... Uh, and the kind of volatility, you know, in the amateur telescope manufacturing world, it's a very volatile business. I mean, you'll have, you know, you can have a comet or you can have a special opposition or something very special that's going to happen in the sky. And sales will spike like crazy and then fall like crazy on the other side of, of the event. And, and um, you know, so all the things I've been through, like, uh, Halley's Comet, Hale Bop, Hayakataki, the Mars opposition, you know, the great, um, the great eclipse, the 2017 eclipse. Uh, these are just some of the things that punctuated uh, the uh, amazing rise and fall of interest in astronomy. I think each time, you know, you get a, a bigger audience that as it goes along, but there was for a long time, and a lot of people talked about it, uh, both at, in the magazines and in clubs and all the rest of it, is that uh, they called it the graying, you know, I got gray hair right now, the graying of the hobby. And they talked about also uh, the fact that fewer and fewer young people were getting into it, you know, and, uh, you know, so we, we have some young people, you know, Connell will be on here, and uh, Libby will be on, and, and we, we bring these people on, but, you uh, um, the thing that's different about the rise of interest in amateur astronomy, at least, and probably even in professional astronomy, is that um, uh, this, this pandemic, as horrible as it is, you know, has made people focus on the universe right from their backyard. And, um, uh, you know, and, and all the good things that can come from it, you know, so I, I, I've been writing bits and pieces, I've been creating a PowerPoint, I, I really want to write a book, but I don't know how so uh, maybe I got some pals that can teach me a little bit but, uh, <laughs> but the, the thing is, is that uh, I like to say that astronomy is good for you. And the reason why it's good for you is it allows you, it gives you a way to reframe your whole worldview, you know, and, uh, you know, you go out to your backyard and you look up at the stars and your blood pressure comes down, you know, and if you spend enough time, you you can feel this kind of tranquility. A lot of astronomers don't talk about this too much because they don't know how to really describe it. They know that it's enjoyable, it's fun, and after a while they need it, okay, but, um, but this is the thing that I, I find most important. I know that 
well, I know that everybody on this program that presents gets it, okay? Uh, and uh, I've been out under the stars with many of you. And, uh, um, you know, I think that, um, I think that it is uh, something that is uh, really special, uh, really is a great antidote to anxiety, stress, all the bad things that, you know, that, that worry can bring to you. Um, but uh, uh, I think that um, uh, the point I was getting to with this rise and fall and the volatility of, of, uh, of the amateur astronomy world is uh, this is different. These are people that are choosing not only to see one object, you know, and get that, yeah, I saw Halley's Comet, or yeah, I saw the eclipse, or yeah, I saw Mars. Uh, they are getting to be involved in amateur astronomy and exploring, you know, as, as part, of their, part of their life, you know. And so I see a, a much more sustainable uh, kind of rise at this point. So, um, and, uh, you know, so for all of you that have chosen to become amateur astronomers with us, you know, it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, there's uh, more resources than there's ever been ever. And um, so you're going to want to do things like join the Astronomical League. You're going to want to get involved in their observing programs. You're going to want to subscribe to Astronomy Magazine. You're going to want to go to star parties with us, you know. Uh, and really experience what all this can possibly be because the stories that David told you, um, you know, you're going to have your own experiences. You're going to meet astronauts. You're going to meet discoverers, you know, and, and that's, that's the thing that uh, amateur astronomy can do for you that you can't just do with any, almost any other thing. You know, you can't become an amateur brain surgeon, for example, okay? Well, I guess you could, but <laughs> they'll catch you, okay? So... <laughs> Anyways, Terry, I'm going to, I, I had a long winded conversation, but I'm going to turn this over to you. I enjoyed it. You know, you, Did you, you enjoy that. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You talk about being, you know, interested in astronomy and yeah. you enjoy being out under that night sky so much. There is yeah. such a peaceful feeling when you're out there, but I'm going to tell you the flip side of that. When you live in Ohio, you have a lot of clouds <laughs> and oh, if you true. don't see the stars for two weeks, you begin thinking you get anxiety. <laughs> yeah, where is everything? Uh, it's like, I have to have my star fix. You know, I need to see those stars. And when I do, it's like, wow, at least they're still there. <laughs> you know? Still there. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Terry, the school up north does some of that, but but uh, yeah, the school up north has the same problem you do in Ohio, <laughs> just to let you know. Yeah. So, yeah, carry carry on. But yeah, it, the Midwest in particular and even East Coast um, weather patterns and uh, the why, especially this year, it's been a challenge. Yeah, I was just up at Headlands Dark Sky Park last week. And uh, it was one of the first times I was out at the park and you could actually see the Southern Milky Way. And somebody out there said, we haven't seen the Southern Milky Way in two weeks. You know, and it's been the smoke has been an issue down here, too. Everything's yeah. just really been an issue. But anyway, yeah, once you get used to seeing the stars, you don't like to be without them. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah, true. You need definitely. Them. So, all right. I will get ready to ask the questions. Okay. Uh, and get back to the beginning here. It always takes my computer a little, there we go, to go back to the beginning here. As you know, we have got um, Alcon Virtual coming up shortly. It'll be from the 19th through the 21st of August. We have got a full speaker schedule that is online and being updated somewhat. Um, we have added some speakers that aren't on here. Um, uh, as we've got Alan Dyer on here, uh, my friend, oh, Larry Crumpler from Perseverance uh, will oh, be wow. one of our speakers too. And we've just added quite a few. So if you would check on our website, uh, right now we have over $8,000 in door prizes, which is incredible because all of the leagues, the leagues clubs have donated these door prizes. And it is amazing what they have done. 
and what it will mean, you know, for our first and hopefully only online conference. Uh, I hope we will always have an online presence for all of our Alcons after this. Um, and it will be nice next year. We will be back. Our plan is to be back in Albuquerque, which we should have been for the last two years. Um, next year, we hope to see everybody out there. Uh, and there's Larry Crumpler. He'll be talking about Perseverance mission, what we have seen, what we are doing now, and what we are and where we are going, which I look forward to that talk. Um, and thanks, Scott Roberts and Explore Scientific for the grand prize. We have a 127 millimeter Matt Cassegrain telescope with the Twilight One mount. That will be the grand prize that will be given away on Saturday night. And as you can see, we have quite a few other door prizes. The one thing I do want to point out is the gift certificates that are on here are actually gift cards. You don't have to spend 500 to get 200 off. These are actually gift cards that you will be able to use at various um, dealers. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, 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 think that, I think that the outpouring of the astronomy clubs that are part of the Astronomical League uh, to give door prizes. This is really kind of a first. I don't know who came up with the idea. Probably Terry did. But, uh, you know, it's I think it's an amazing thing uh, because you said over seventy five hundred dollars. I think it's over eight thousand dollars. Yes, it's over eight thousand dollars from the club. Eighty two hundred so, right now. Yeah, yeah that, that's amazing. That's amazing. And that's because of all of the leagues club that came forward and helped to do that. And to me, that's amazing. They deserve a yes. big round of applause. It's uh, inspiring. It's, yeah, it is. It's very inspiring for what the clubs do. Um, you know, and it, it's just great for the whole community. And just to be clear, Chuck Allen came up with that idea. That wasn't me. Oh, okay. That was, <laughs> Allen did this. Yes. I know uh, Chuck's watching right now. Said, Scott. Uh, yes. I know Chuck is on his way to observe tonight. I already okay. know. I talked to him earlier. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, as you know, you see this every time. We always talk about never looking at the sun without proper filtration, That's how right. important that is. To make sure when you look at the sun, you do it safely with a proper solar filter. So what I want to start with is the answers from GSP 56 from July 27th, which for some reason to me seems like that was forever ago. I can't believe summer's almost over. Right. Yeah. So first question was, there is a lizard in the sky. What constellation is it? That's Lacerta. The constellation lies between... Northern Andromeda and Cygnus. Second question, within the last decade, this world was found to have a reddish North Pole. Mm. What world is it? This is Pluto's moon or co-dwarf planet Charon. It is truly not a moon of Pluto since the center of gravity of the two worlds lies outside of Pluto's surface. Wow. Last question, the Apollo 12 mission landed so close to the spot of an earlier unmanned spacecraft landing, the astronauts were able to walk to it. What was the name of the unmanned spacecraft? And that would be Apollo 12 landed just 200 meters from the survey, Surveyor 3 spacecraft that landed in a shallow crater two and a half years earlier, which I thought that was amazing. That's amazing. That, that's, that's like something out of 2001, a space odyssey. And it's just sci-fi to me. It's incredible. Yeah, it, just to be that close, to be able to do what they do nowadays just amazes me. Yes. All right. These are the people that answered all of those questions correctly. And they are added to a door prize list. And the beginning of every month, we announce the winners from the last month. So the winners for July... Beatrice Hines, Book Davies, and Adrian. <laughs> so had you known that I went to school at the University of Michigan, would I still have been a door prize winner? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, I, I'm not, I hate to say it in front of all you guys. I'm not a sports fan. It's, you know. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. That's, uh, that's very good to know. Yeah. But, well, um, I went to Mackinac Island. And they asked where you're from, and I said Ohio, and I thought they were going to throw me off the ferry. <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh, geez. There's, it's, it's, the rivalry is still there. It's for the last 15 years. And Conal at Penn State, um, even you all have had some fun beating on the uh, 
University of Michigan team. But when it comes to, <laughs> but to bring the focus back to astronomy, when it comes to astronomy, um, we all do tend to get along okay. We we put the differences aside in sports and we look up. So, yes. so it's always, you know, that that one, one thing with astronomy you were talking about, Scott, and that, you know, bringing different communities together. And yep. that, this is truly one thing that helps us do that regardless of our background so that's right that's right so yeah we're definitely oh. a family definitely definitely all right questions for today uh whoops and that's a bad slide there don't look at the dates <laughs> questions for today <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here of course yeah. so close uh right. send, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org yeah and the first question how long does it take for Jupiter to orbit the sun? Hmm. And I had someone comment that I went through the slides too fast last time. They didn't have time to understand the question. So how long does it take for Jupiter to orbit the sun? Or in other words, how long does it take for Jupiter to orbit the sun? <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Second question, and I want to hear that echo again. What is the most common solid in the cosmos? Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> in other words, what is the most common solid in the cosmos? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Third question. Or maybe the, exactly those words. <laughs> <laughs> Why are Saturn's rings so bright right now? Hmm. Why? Are Saturn's rings so bright right now? Well, I hear an echo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that is the last question. I do want to remind you that Astronomical League Live will not be here in August because we will be at Halcon Virtual. So uh, we will be back on September 17th at 7 p.m. EDT. And we have Claude Plymate coming to speak about astronomical Oh. adaptive optics so Wonderful. he yeah he will be joining us i look forward to that yep. so scott that is it thank you very much but send all your answers to secretary at astroleague.org right and if you haven't joined the league do so right now there's still time so please do and register for alcon virtual it is free and we've got over eight thousand dollars in door prizes not that's to right me it's not chicken yeah. feed i mean this no. is and uh, we got serious Dave speaking too uh, about I, galaxies to be very honest terry i don't think that there's any other astronomical star party event going on this year where you can win i have the opportunity to win that many thousand dollars worth of of stuff. So that's, uh, that's a big deal. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know how many people have already signed up. I think it's in the hundreds, but, yes. uh, but yes, it uh, is. let's get it up to a thousand folks. I mean, come let's on, do that. you know, let's and, do that. and thank you again to all of the league clubs for all the support. We greatly appreciate it. That's awesome. Thanks, Thanks Terry. Thanks for coming on again. That's great. Okay. Uh, do we have, did David Levy already make it? Or am I still waiting? Uh, okay, we're still waiting for David, and that's fine. Um, up next is going to be Libby in the stars. Libby yeah. has, uh, uh, she came back and gave us a nice presentation about her space camp experience. Uh, Libby, I, from what I understand, you're starting to go back to school like in person again, right? Is that gonna happen this month? Yes, so they start back in school August 16th and um, Last year I was virtual, which wasn't the best because I was trapped inside a lot and I didn't really get to see a lot of nature. And I was glad that I did get to do a lot of um, the star parties, though, because I did have time to do that. But I'm just glad because I can finally actually have an organized schedule. But virtual school, you wake up at like 730 and within 20 minutes, you have to somehow pull yourself together to eat breakfast, get ready and be ready to school because it's it was very hard to do all that and especially just I mean it's like every single day the COVID just got worse and I wasn't sure if I was ever going to go back to school so hmm. I hope at least I get to go back now we didn't even get recess time and we only got 30 minutes to eat lunch and to remind you I had to cook my own lunch every single day 
Oh. And I wasn't a big fan of sandwich and I can't have peanut butter because I'm allergic. So I literally had to make, it took like 15 minutes to make my lunch and then I'd have to work during lunch too. So I'd like have five minutes to eat. So I'm finally glad I get to go back now, but. Well, we're glad too. I, I'm, you know, I think that this will probably be something that uh, you'll remember all your life, Libby, and uh, probably will be telling your grandkids about uh, what happened during this, uh, you know, this, this era. So, um, but uh, you have done some amazing stuff. You have, I, I was uh, uh, having some conversation with your mom about the presentations you've given. And I think, I think that you've given more presentations than a lot of adults that I know. Okay. I mean, like over their whole lifetime. So that's, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing what you've done. I know you have a lot more left in you. Okay. Um, you know, and, and I know too, that you have to limit your time now and you'll only be on with us maybe once a month, but, uh, we'll always look forward to it. And of course you are always welcome on global star party. So thank you, Libby. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you uh, get started with this presentation. Yeah, so I was actually thinking about maybe every once in a while I'll do the four o'clock shows because I mean I can't really stay up too late because I have to wake up at 6 30 in the morning because I'm riding my bike to school but I'm just glad I get to be back in nature because I love nature and I've actually started a school mountain biking team so I just love to get out in nature and I get to see all the stuff and I hope to start an astronomy club in my school and I'm not too busy with other stuff, but I hope to and get some a good group of kids together who are interested in space and even just science too. So I'm going to talk about weather and space today. And um, at the end, I'm going to talk about uh, Carl Sagan's pale, do, um, pale blue dot because um, I thought that was something super cool that we did at space camp. And um, I've been wanting to do something different. I know every once in a while I try to do something different than talking about astronomy and something that relates to astronomy. I know I did um, rockets once, so I thought weather would be a good idea because I love weather. I'm always in the good mood for a storm. So I want to talk about what, why weather is important. Now, here on Earth, weather is important for a good million reasons because it depends on life. It depends on death. It depends on um, if you're going to get food or not. It just depends on a lot of things. But another thing it depends on is if NASA can even launch a rocket. Or even if we're looking at another planet, the weather can even be important on another planet. If a rover was going to land, they would have to make sure the rover would be able to go or, and the weather wouldn't be bad. And so, um, not only is it important, like, I know a lot of people in the star party, they come and say, well, dang it, here comes a cloud to cover my sky while I'm trying to do astronomy. And I totally agree about that. But I have, I always tell my mom, I said, you know, I will, I will like accept the fact that a cloud came over while I was trying to observe the sky, as long as it's a good storm. Because I've always been, I've always loved storms. I've always wanted to be a storm chaser. Mm. And I at least tried a storm chase. I mean, it's nothing, you know, severe. Literally, I'm like, ooh, there's a cloud. It looks like it's about to rain. Let's go, just go north, mom. <laughs> go north, go south, take a right turn, turn around, take a U turn. <laughs> <laughs> and so I try to um, do as much storm chasing as possible, but you know, it's never really professional stuff that I do. It's just mostly just telling my mom, go south. <laughs> and just telling her like, go south, go north now. And then I'm like, oh snap, the radar says it's gonna rain. And my mom's like, oh Lord, let's just, it's time to go back home now. So that's as far as I get. And right before, um, right before quarantine started, my mom, she works at a college as a teacher and they were um, having the National Weather Service come and do a talk for storm chasers. So I really wanted to go and my mom let me go. And it was really fun. And I do have to say, I was the youngest kid in there. I was the only kid in there. It was just all like adults, probably over 50. And so I didn't really see a lot of kids. 
my age at all, but I was still excited to go. And I wanted to get more kids interested in weather because I know weather can be very important. And just as astronomy is important as carrying the torch, I think weather is too. So um, there's a new, numerous reasons why weather is important. So I wanna talk about how this really connects to space. So while we were at Space Camp, we got a presentation on how does, um, how to determine what the natural disaster is from a satellite. So the whole time at Space Camp, we usually just talk about the International Space Station, the James Webb Telescope and stuff like that when we're talking about spacecrafts. So we have one talk about NASA satellites. And they showed us a bunch of images on, on the screen and we had our journals out and we were supposed to write down what we think it was. Because it what that's um, what the satellite saw from space, if it was a volcano, a flood. And you know, it was so cool to see those images because you know, you can't really, I mean, another thing is that um, uh, you can also create radars, satellites create radars too. And so I know um, during springtime, I check the radar every single day, make sure there isn't any storms or something. And like, if I look on the radar right now, I would see what the satellites were detecting. And so um, a while ago, while I was at Kennedy, <clears throat> this is a couple years ago, 2018, but um, we were going to go see Falcon 9 launch and it was a satellite. And so just as we um, got to Kennedy Space Center, we were about to en enter the museum, a huge dark towering cloud just covers all of the sky. And I was just crying because I was like, oh Lord, I won't be able to see the rocket launch, right? Because the rocket can't launch if there's bad weather. And I was just crying my heart out. I was like, I live in Northwest Arkansas. I flew all the way down to Florida for a rocket launch. Please <laughs> let me go in. Please. And so um, we got on the last bus all the way to the rocket, to the launch pad. We got on the last bus and everybody was sitting down and they were like, this is the last bus. We hurry. NASA, we got to do this before the storm gets even worse. And um, it was about 6 p.m. And I was like, oh, Lord please say this goes. And then they're like, okay, launch continued. And then they just start the countdown. I'm like, yay. Oh my gosh. I just felt so lucky. The wall behind me right there, I have um, a collage of photos of just me doing space stuff. And um, I know somewhere I have my um, ticket to the rocket launch. It's all the way on the top, but it was my ticket to the rocket launch. And I, and, um, I know on the film, when you take pictures, it'll give you a live version of it. So if you click on it, it'll give you a live version. And my mom took a picture of me in front of the Atlantis, the Atlantis shuttle inside. Well, it was a model of it outside. And I was right by the sign. And when I clicked on the photo, you could just hear lightning strike. And I just ran. And that's what the live photo looked like. And I just think about every single time I think about the launch that I saw, but it was just amazing how it went. And so I wanted to talk about weather on other planets because this depends on a lot of stuff too. I mean, we know there's no weather on Jupiter, but we still want to know we're going to, I mean, like even on Mars, Mars doesn't really have weather. But if we were going to put a rover to go collect samples from the planet, we need to make sure the weather's okay. So one of the things that really fascinates me about weather on other planets is Jupiter, because that's what I've always heard about the most, and Jupiter's red spot. I researched this a lot and tried to figure out what is Jupiter's red spot, and I always like to ask my friends, and I say, name the worst tornado in all history, and they go, the Joplin tornado, and then I'm like, nope, the big red spot on Jupiter. And they're like, I thought you meant on Earth. And I said, we're not the only people with storms out there. And so um, Jupiter's red spot is a very powerful storm. It is like a tornado that has lasted a couple hundred years. And it's so powerful 
But the thing is, there's nothing on Jupiter to destroy. I mean, except it's rocks. I mean, you can move the rocks around, just scoot the rocks around, but it won't do much. So NASA has observed this for a while by looking at um, stuff for the satellites. And um, I know on my first star party, we met um, a NASA jet propulsion scientist who discovered, um, who discovered space volcanoes. And I know you can either discover space volcanoes by either observing from Earth with a telescope, which is why I think is really cool. Um, when I look at Jupiter from my Dobsonian, I could just see a little red dot on its surface and it's almost, it's like I can see it very faintly, just a red dot. And um, I think that's so cool that you can see weather on other planets from Earth with a telescope. And that's why I think it's cool about it. I mean, the clouds might ruin your night of astronomy, but if you just research on the other planets, I mean, you can look at all this other stuff on planets another day. So you can discover the weather on planets by not only just satellites, but also by telescopes. So I wanted to talk about hurricanes and just the weather on Earth and talk a little bit about different stuff on Earth. So hurricanes um, are, are um, basically just very powerful storms that they, they go around like this. Tornadoes, they kind of have a cone and they go down like that too, but hurricanes swirl around and they have a, um, in the picture you can see this is from space. In the middle, you can see there's an area of relief, which is called the eye of the storm. And so hurricane season starts about September and goes into October and even into November. But um, the storm stops in the middle of nowhere in the eye of the storm, which I mean, if you were in the middle of a tornado, that's probably where it's gonna be most powerful. But if you were um, in the middle of a hurricane, you would just feel relief. And um, I've always been one to watch those weather channel shows, people telling themselves, like storm chasers talking about hurricanes and stuff. I always love watching those. And I remember, they showed a video on the screen of them just walking outside and there was just damage everywhere. And hurricanes last eight days. So this is just in the middle of it all and you could see all this damage. And just, if you look in the sky, you could just see all of it around you. And it was so cool just to see that and how like there's an eye in the middle of it. So I wanted to talk about tornadoes. So, um, a very funny, funny story about space camp. So my space camp is in Huntsville, Alabama. And so um, it's always raining in Huntsville, Alabama. And I remember, well, the first, when you first get to space camp, you go to your room and you kind of set up where you're gonna stay first, you get settled in. And then you go to a little, um, they have little tiny buildings, like mostly just, trailers to the side and there's like four, four or five of them and so um there's just a hu huge group of kids and this guy looked a little bit cloudy so once I got dropped off of my group they were like some there was only one tiny little window in the room probably about two feet long and a foot wide and this kid looks over and he's like, oh my gosh, it's really dark outside. And I wasn't able to see for the window. And then next thing you know, I was trying to look for the window and this sky was gray. And we didn't get a tornado that day, but next thing you know, some kid goes over to the door of the trailer, opens it up without adult permission. <laughs> and all of our papers and notes just go flying everywhere. And so our counselor was like, oh my gosh. She was like, okay guys, calm down, put on your ponchos. We're gonna make a run for it. So we ran all the way to the habitats and it was just pouring out rain. And that was just one thing I really remember about space camp because it was a really bad storm. We had to stay in for about two hours. You didn't have a tornado, but it was, I knew it was part of just part of being in Huntsville because the day that I got there we had to um we were trying to wait outside 
and uh, we were outside somewhere and it just started pouring everywhere. And it was crazy how that weather could just build up, rain, and then go away for the day. And that happened every single day. So um, tornadoes can be very dangerous. They pick up debris. And so that's what you kind of see at the bottom of a tornado. That's all debris. And that's what is being flown around. And um, while I was in preschool, we did um, training for tornadoes. You know, you do a route every single day. And I always thought to myself, I always thought they said, potato instead of tornado and so I always get that confusion <laughs> very mixed up and I always like to tell my friends about it I'm like you know when I was in preschool I used to think tornadoes were potatoes and I always <laughs> thought it and I was I always like when the tornado hit or a bad storm I always thought that the hail was potatoes and to remind you I was only two or three years old so it seemed right in my mind <laughs> And so um, I want to talk about NASA satellites because I know a lot of people on the International Space Station. Um, we saw we're, we were shown a video of you know lightning from space, and it looks so cool. Um, the astronauts said that's their favorite part about seeing a hurricane or a tornado or just even just thunderstorms, which they just see all these lights spark around, and it's just beautiful seeing it from space. And so NASA will send up satellites to create radars, stuff like that. And so um, it was so cool to see that because, I mean, not NASA satellites help to report natural disasters. The radars, we can report natural disasters before they happen. I know um, on, um, if you just look at the radar, if you just, you can speed it up to see what time really a storm's going to hit. And so it lets us know we're going to be like in storms or not. So that's really helpful technology. So I want to change topics because I wanted to talk about Carl Sagan's pale, um, pale blue dot because I didn't get to talk about it in space camp. And I know I'll only be doing this stuff um, once a month. So I really wanted to talk about it instead of, you know, I wanted to try to get another topic in. Because um, I'll only be doing this once a month. I won't have time to do this a lot. So I wanted to get another topic in that. I know I won't be able to do as much next month. And so um, while I was at space camp, we went to the planetarium. And so last year while I was at space camp, the planetarium was closed because of COVID. And I was so sad. So what we had to resort to was just watching it on the projector. And you know, that compares, I mean, it's still, you still get knowledge, but it's nothing compared to what the real planetarium was like this year. And um, I remember me and um, my friend were just sitting there and we had a um, host teaching us and she was like, so all these images are shown from what satellites collected the data in their solar system and what scientists guess. And I was just amazed. And it just showed us um, at the end of the talk, she was giving us a tour around Mars from satellite data. And I was just amazed by that. But at the end of the um, planetarium, she showed us Earth. Like just what you're seeing right there in the picture, she showed us Earth. And then she started zooming out and zooming out even further from our solar system. So the Milky Way, to, to our whole entire galaxy. And everybody in the whole entire planetarium was just like, oh my gosh, we are so tiny. And so they were also teaching us about how big our solar system is. Um, while we're at space camp, we did a practice outside and um, every, kid every kid held up a planet card and they just spaced us apart to show how far away we are. And so um, our solar system is trillions of miles long. It is so big and it's so wide. And the fact that we don't even take up 1% of our universe is crazy. So, I mean, it's crazy to think about that we don't even take up 1% of our universe and we're trillions of miles long and our whole entire solar system 
And Earth is literally like 1% of what the sun is. And now the sun takes up like a lot of our solar system, mostly the sun. And so it's just crazy to see all that and be like, you know, something that might be big here on Earth, like COVID-19 right now, I know that's big because um, a lot of health stuff. And uh, honestly, we need to know history so we don't repeat it. And so um, just COVID-19, I mean, that's what, big news for us. Everybody on Earth knows what COVID-19 is, but thinking the whole entire universe, they don't even know. I mean, if Earth exploded right now, nobody else and the universe would really care too much or know. I mean, they cared, but they wouldn't really know as much because there's so many other planets out there in the solar system that, I mean, like we don't even take up 1%, which just shows how small we are and how tiny we are. So mm -hmm. I wanted to um, show the Carl Sagan's Pelju um, video. And so I never, I've always heard of it on the star party, but I never really looked into it. Because I always thought, you know, oh, I'll like look into it one day. I'll do a presentation on it one day because this sounds actually really interesting. And because um, I know I was researching um, Voyager 1 and I just saw this image while I was researching. And I think that's uh, that's us like right there. You're there and you can barely even see the content the continents and all the countries and stuff like that there's no borders i mean look at earth you don't even see that many borders just looking far away you don't even see anything and so it's crazy to think that that we're that small and the you can't even see another planet in view right now you can barely even see another planet in view and that's how far stretched out our solar system in is and we don't even take up 1%. And so I wanted to show the um, Carl Sagan's pale, do, uh, pale blue dot video. Let's see, it will go. This is a, um, it's the same audio, but it is from the 2014 um, remaster of the show. That's home. That's us. On it. Everyone you love. Everyone you know. Everyone you've ever heard of. Every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager. Every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, live there. Of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings. Our imagined self-importance. The delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale white. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. We are obscurity. In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere. Save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is 
nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species can migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humble and character-building experience. It is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility and to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the big dot, the only home we've ever known. But I never knew this video existed. And for a long time, I was doing astronomy for three years, and I never knew this video existed. And it was just crazy that every single kid at space camp never knew this video existed. And I sh they showed it to us at the astronomy talk, and everybody was just amazed. And when I got home, I showed it to all my friends. And I told them, I said, you know, this talk's just not about astronomy. It's about all of humanity. It just, it just doesn't show what astronomy does. It shows, you know, it just shows what humanity has accomplished from the wheel all the way to cars that drive themselves and space vehicles that are going to take people to another planet and to our own moon. And it just shows how advanced we are in human technology and how big this news is for us. And I know in the video, he says the uh, delusion that we think, the delusion that uh, we have that we think that we have a privileged spot in the universe, hmm. but we really, we don't really take up a lot. So there's so much more to be accomplished. And I thought this video was so cool. And, and um, I hope to start a club this year in my school for astronomy, if they let a club do it. And I know I've been talking with my science teacher because um, we had to go to school for two days to do um, testing. And while my dad was out in the parking lot trying to pick me up, my science teacher goes over to my dad and goes, you know, Libby, she's going to have a job in astronomy one day. And then I goes, I believe in her. And then my, uh, my dad said that my teacher went, to be honest, I don't think she'll have a job in science, but I'll think she'll have a job in astronomy. She, and she was like, every single time I try to host a class, she always brings up astronomy in the chat. And it, and I've been emailing my teacher. We've been trying to email her, trying to get her to um, be the teacher who um, helps me do the astronomy group in my school because I want to carry the torch. And there's not a lot of kids who are interested. Mm. And I just love to get more kids interested because, I mean, it's crazy that I was doing astronomy for four years of my life before I ever knew this video existed. And back a while ago, um, in March, when I was at Disney with my friend, um, we split up for a while because she didn't want to. Um, she didn't, there was this one ride called Mission Space, and it basically sim simulates what it's like to launch and to a rocket, and it simulates G-force and stuff like that. And so um, I remember I was on the outside of the building, and there was these glass little plates on the side of the building and I was looking at them because I never really paid attention. It was just me and my mom. And I saw Carl Sagan, um, his quote up there and I uh, saw his name and I was just amazed. Cause you know, I mean, uh, not a lot of people know who Carl Sagan is, but to think that his quote was up on a glass plate and it was just amazing quote. I took my picture by it and I thought that it was so cool that I saw somebody and I showed the video to my dad. I showed the video to my mom on the way home. I showed the video to my friends. I even, I was just, this would be amazing video to inspire anybody. Yeah. Libby, I think you've uh, stumbled upon something that's very important and, um, and it's wonderful that you get it, you know? So um, uh, I think, I think that's great. I think that's great. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. It's Thank wonderful. you for having me. It's funny because it's like so many people think that 
we are the biggest thing in the universe and that uh, everything that's we the do, problem <laughs> yeah everything we do matters but nothing really does it's just self-improvement for ourselves and discovering what else we can do in the universe and how tiny we are yeah i think it does matter but innovation it, it's it's good to have the perspective that uh um you know the um you know, the pale blue dot can help remind us of, you know, so that's right. All right, Libby, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. for having me on. Yeah, thank you. And David Levy is back in the house. So David, how are you? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm fine. I just came back from my appointment with my nephrologist. And he says, with a little bit of luck, I might be able to keep my one remaining kidney. And, um, He's not, I mean, I was worried he was going to just take, take a gun and shoot me right on the spot. Just right there. Okay. Just right there. But uh, I'm still here, and he says everything's fine, and uh, we just have to watch it. <clears throat> anyway, Scotty and everybody else, um, I think it's really quite something how Carl Sagan's wisdom and advice and words are now transversing the generations so that Libby and her generation are now getting a dose of Sagan. But for my quote tonight, I would like to uh, go back to a late 19th, early 20th century writer, Oscar Wilde. And he was pretty shy and um, he actually wrote these words while he was in prison. It's from the book, De Profundis. Society as we, as we have constituted it will have no place for me has none to offer but nature whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike will have clefts in the rocks where i may hide and secret valleys in whose silence i may weep undisturbed she will hang the night with stars so that i may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling hmm. and send the wind over my footprints so that none may track me to my hurt she will cleanse me in great waters and with bitter herbs make me whole. Thank you, Scotty. Thank it looks you, like it's going to be a clear night and hoping to get some observing it. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for joining us and, yeah. and for making the sacrifice to um, be here on Global Star Party. Thanks, man. No sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, it's wonderful. Well, up next is uh, Connell Richards. Connell was brought to us, uh, first introduced to us by um, Chuck Allen of the Astronomical League. Um, and uh, we've really enjoyed uh, having Connell on our programs. His presentations are very professional. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, Connell has a bright future ahead of him. I think a lot of people think that. And, uh, you know, so Connell, thanks for, you know, uh, spending your time with us here on Global Star Party. And, you uh, you know, being one of the uh, uh, younger uh, astronomers that uh, present here. So thanks very much, man. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. It's always good to be here. Global Star Party is always so much fun. And I really do love sharing the cosmos with other people. So I'll get going here. I'll, I'm just going to share my screen once I get things set up. And... Uh, Let me know if you can see this okay. Sure. Yep. I can see it. Okay. Wonderful. Now, when I first saw the theme uh, for this week, Falling Stars and Fireballs, I was reminded, like many of us, of uh, some very memorable meteor showers or bolides that we've seen. Uh, Scott, you talked earlier about some of them leaving smoke trails behind. I've seen some of the different colors, greens and blues. Some are more of an orange or yellow. So there really is a, a rich, uh, a lot of rich opportunity in watching meteors and just sitting back and taking in all of the sky and not fussing with any equipment or any particular goal that you might have. And because it's so simple to go out there and simply enjoy a meteor shower and soak up the night sky, I've always viewed them as great opportunities for astronomical outreach, especially for younger people. So, you know, um, binoculars, as easy as they are to use, are one step above the naked eye and, and, and telescopes might be the next iteration after that. Um, I found that when you can find astronomical phenomena that people can take in and enjoy from their homes without any equipment 
or a lot of preparation, that's a really good way of getting people involved in the hobby. And I'm taking an opportunity to do just that uh, in about a week or so. So the local library is having a program uh, where they're talking about summer and nature and reading and, and of course all of that. And I've been a member of the library's team leadership committee for, for some time. I've enjoyed a lot of time there. And I'm doing uh, sort of an outreach event there. This is on August 13th, where I'll be talking about meteor showers. So I'll go to the first slide here. Um, I was looking for some materials that I could easily use online, things that were free, things that were easy to print or purchase online, and things that were very easy to get into the hands of people. So I have four different items, plus uh, some planet spheres, uh, some small cardboard ones I bought from the Astronomical League. And uh, I'll, I'll get to meteor showers at the end, but starting off here, we have something called a dark sky wheel. I found this from Night Sky Network. And I figured that if we're giving materials to children, it's especially important that they understand the importance of keeping a dark night sky and uh, shielding your lights and taking in um, the dark sky from, from the best place that you can. So this chart that I found, it has two wheel components that are uh, kind of held together. One shows the constellation of Scorpius, and they have an Orion version of this as well for winter. Um, it's centered on Antares, and of course, that's a very easy star to find in the sky because of its deep red color. And this wheel here shows what that constellation would look like from different skies and different light polluted levels. Hmm. So you can see just one here. You can only see the bright first magnitude star, Antares, in the middle. And as we go around the wheel and get darker, you can eventually see more in the sky. And uh, though it's not really drawn on here, I suspect you might even be able to see some of the Milky Way in that constellation because it is so close to Sagittarius where the Southern Milky Way and the center is. Now that wheel goes into here and you can slide each slot in as you turn it for the different pollution levels. And then you can also see some information they have on the back. This is again from Night Sky Network about um, what you can see in different light polluted levels, how to stop light pollution, and how to understand what you're seeing and the factors that change that. Now, moving on, I have another object here um, that we're all quite familiar with. We've been talking about this at some of the past couple of GSPs would be the moon. Now it's bright in our sky, very easy for everybody to see. There's so much to take in with binoculars or even the naked eye. And because you can see some of the outlines of the seas and even some of the craters, I can say I've seen Tycho and Copernicus during a full moon because of their bright ray systems. That's a really fun project to, to share with people, this Sky Watcher's Guide to the Moon, because uh, many of them grew up with the Apollo missions or many of them read about the, the missions to the moon in, in books as kids. So that's a great way to get people tied up in observing the moon and then observing the rest of the night sky by extension. In fact, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15. I think that was just a couple of days ago where I saw that it was the uh, 50th anniversary of their launch back to orbit to dock with the command module. So this is all quite relevant and all very interesting to capture people's interest. Now, a third item here I found from NASA, they have a series of charts online, uh, 12 of them, one for each uh, month of the year and they show you where the constellations are in the sky. And then they have some dotted lines here to show where the ecliptic is. And I suspect that's for the uh, celestial equator as well. And at the bottom here, this is really great for kids where I'm, I'm focusing my library program. You have these little planets all kind of cut to scale and you can kind of cut off that bottom and, and move them around in the sky and see where they are based on different charts, whether you find them online or in an astronomical periodical. But this is again, a really fun way to get people looking up with no equipment, with no binoculars or anything like that. Now, lastly here, we have the meteor showers. Uh, of course, the subject of tonight's global star party and really fun to share with people because they're always talking about these in the weather, in the newspaper, uh, in a lot of major news outlets. If there is one aspect of astronomy that makes its way to the mainstream the most, I would say it's meteor showers. Yeah. So this is a chart in the bottom here, and they talk about uh, the different showers. The Pierced's probably my favorite and one of the brightest and most frequent. Mm -hmm. um, they show you when that peaks. And in fact, I do have um, a binder with some sheet protectors in the backpack I take out observing, uh, just with some information on each of the meteor showers if I happen to be out observing one. 
uh, even though it's just with the naked eye. It's really a useful tool to have. Now this handout I found from Night Sky Network that I'll be handing out right at the peak of the Pierceds tells you how to observe a meteor shower because I've had many people ask me who knew that I was interested in astronomy and, and a regular observer, they'd say, well, I'm going out. Do I just look straight up? Is there a certain time? And they have a lot of questions like that. So it really is important when you're telling people how to observe a meteor shower, that the meteors come from a radiant, that being a particular point in the sky. And this one, um, this one is the uh, image for the radiant of the Pierceds. It shows you have this kind of point in the center and all these arrows coming out showing you where the, the meteors come from. There are many meteors in our night sky, but you can usually tell what their origin is based on the radiant, especially if it's during a meteor shower. And then by extension, it's even more fun to learn that when certain meteors come from a certain meteor shower, they come from a specific parent object. And you know that you saw a piece of that object burning up in our atmosphere. So it's really a special way to, to connect with objects in the night sky that we cannot see when you're using the naked eye. So this handout I found, it has some other charts there as well, showing how comets orbit the Earth and they scatter their debris across the, the Earth's plane. And then it also tells you um, how the objects come by and how the Earth is kind of plowing through this field of tiny objects that we see burning up in the atmosphere. And then, like I said, most important towards the bottom would be the descriptions of meteor showers. Now, I'd like to conclude, I'll go back to an image I had uh, at the beginning here. I think I can zoom in a little bit. This meteor is what I believe to be a Pierced. I captured this image in August of last year, around the time the Pierced peaked. And you can see it has a bit of an orange or yellow color. I think this was a 20 or 30 second exposure I took. Um, but then again, you can find out where the object came from by tracing the radiant back. So I was looking at some star atlases. I found some of these field stars and traced it back. And sure enough, it went right about to where the Pierced radiant was in the sky uh, for that particular day. Now this image I took, it was a little before or after, so it might've been a straggler, but still really special to see a, an image of that object. I'm not sure, but I think it was Swift Tuttle um, that is the parent object for this, this meteor shower. So thank you very much, Scott, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to share meteor showers and some of the work I'm doing with the library and reflect on some of the things I did in school as well. Meteor showers for everybody, for all of us doing outreach, are a really special opportunity to share, especially the Pierceds, which are unforgettable in their brightness and their frequency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connell. Okay, so up next is going to be uh, Adrian Bradley. Um, Adrian has been on many of our programs. Uh, he loves to photograph the night sky uh, and has shown us many beautiful examples of that. Uh, his specialty is the Milky Way, but to all kinds of views of our night sky, um, uh, where he's always including, you know, some amazing foreground uh, and landscape that really captures the imagination. So, Adrian, turn it over to you, dude. Yep. So, um, thank you, Scott, for your introduction. Thank you, all of you that have uh, presented. David, it is always nice to see you, my friend. Uh, don't let them take your kidney just yet. Not until I come and visit. And mm -hmm. Molly, it's good to see you on. You're in Ohio as well. Um, I've joked about uh, being from Michigan and attending the University of Michigan. So I will not hold your new location against you. Um, I personally have no um, fandom with with the Ohio State University. Uh, and you've all, <laughs> But the fact that you've already heard of it. And Ohio State University, the <laughs> Ohio State University, yeah, the school down <laughs> south, um, I do believe has some, um, yeah, as far as their science, they, I mean, they're a Big Ten school for a reason. It's, you know, yeah, we, they got some stuff. Yep. So we won't, we won't go into okay, Ohio yeah, State so much. Say, interrupt for a second. To go, say that, Dave. Uh, with all due respect for saying negative things about Ohio, Molly is from the state that also sired Leslie Pelcher, and he was born in Ohio in 1900. He died okay. in 1980, and he discovered each of his 12 comets from Delphos, Ohio. We have, so. we have his uh, merry-go-round telescope out at the uh, uh, John Bryan Observatory out here. Nice. It's really cool. 
so, anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so that's okay. There, the place that I'm going to show most of my images is actually about 30 minutes from Ohio in a place called Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve. And um, I've dared yell at the night sky for not providing something. And I've dared ask the night sky to produce something. And sometimes the night sky actually responds. And you're going to see with, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen of images. And as I do, um, I wanted to, I wanted to start by just acknowledging that in astronomy, we often, you know, we, I, we go banter back and forth about our schools. Astronomy has been a Geneva of sorts for all things. And one of the biggest things that, um, like Libby even talked about was COVID and we're seeing mask mandates go up. We're seeing different things in the news now about the possibilities of, um, even if you're vaccinated, being asked to um, mask again. And, and for many of us, it may spell, you know, some doom for possible get togethers and things like that. One thing that isn't offered as much are ways to address the um, sting of having to deal with the possibility of catching COVID-19. And the backdrop of my sky here is one thing that we offer from this star party and all, all of us who like astronomy, from amateurs to professionals. We encourage you, if this sort of news gets you down like it gets me down, Go outside when it is clear and look up in the sky and you you may find that you suddenly feel a little bit better mm -hmm. and um, the, the, the power that just looking at the universe from your backyard has now whether you if you're Catholic like I am or you know you have a religion or for the atheists that may be out there we agree on one thing looking up you know the universe itself is awesome. And that is, if anything, that is, should be the takeaway every time you come to a global star party. So I will go ahead and launch into a story, some of the images that you see here. Um, and you may notice the Milky Way being at a very similar orientation in a lot of them. Um, I'll start with just getting this image out of the way, which is the latest one that I tried to take. I like baseball and I found a field in a northern part of Michigan and smoke is still wafting over us. So not much Milky Way here, but it's still part of why I do my night photography. Um, not too many other people do it. And I find it's a way to combine my passion of um, things like old ball fields or other quiet wooded areas and a beautiful night sky above them. And even if I can't quite get a perfect night sky, I'll still see what colors I get. You know, I like shooting over water as well. Um, the theme is um, meteors and fireballs from the sky. So at one point when I started trying to image the Milky Way, I, um, I'd go to this park and I'd take shots. This is me learning how to shoot at the Milky Way a couple of years ago. This is Jupiter and this is Saturn. As we know now, Saturn is more over here. Jupiter rises a little later. Milky Way looks the same, but the planets do move around. And that's how you can tell what year i believe this is 20 I believe this is 20 uh 18 or 2019 i'll have to look at the uh dates for it um so here's how the story goes i decided to try and image the area of cygnus there's a little meteor there or at least i would think it's a meteor because of how it you know starts it's light and then gets heavy uh, the, this was around this, uh, what was it, July 24th, time of the Perseids. So I'm thinking this might be a Perseid right here. Now, at the time I took this photo, I didn't look at it this close and realize I did have a little meteor. 
because there was a fireball. If you can imagine being below this frame, a big streak goes right below this frame. And when I look at the picture, I go, I didn't get it. So saying a few choice words that uh, I wouldn't want to say because Libby's here and many of you have children. Um, I did not slam my camera onto the ground, but I felt like doing that. You know, it's early on and I'm a hothead, as you can tell, just just upset that I didn't get a fireball in my picture. And <laughs> hey, uh, man, go for it. <laughs> so, well, so the story, it, it's the story gets better. I decided to turn around and aim at this area in the park and just take some Milky Way shots because I was thinking I'll stack a few of them and see if I can get a better looking image. So I turn around, I look back up at the Cygnus region, shaking my fist in the air. And the um, guy next to me says, did you see that meteor? What meteor? And he points in the direction that my camera was aiming. And this was the very next frame. And look what I caught. Possible Perseid. And I go, wow, I actually caught one. And that was despite the fact that I wanted to cuss out the universe for not giving me a shot like that <laughs> the early. Whole universe. Um, the whole I cussed out the whole universe. And then here we go. That was a, that was the same size as the um, meteor that I saw going under the Cygnus region. Mm. And I, I think this was a 20 second exposure. And the um, as soon as someone said, did you see the meteor? And I heard a click. Um, barely caught that one. I tried a couple ways to process this one. I did it this way with the. Uh, you know, the air glow and the tungsten and look at all the grain. I didn't have my noise um, denoiser. Later in life, I would try to put the denoiser on and it didn't help. I made a mess of this photo, but it still wound up in a calendar at my job because I didn't know where else to send it. And um, this was probably the best that I could do. And, you know, I still have these stars. Um, yeah, you know, my love of shooting the Milky Way and then this one fireball made this perhaps one of the most unique pictures that I've ever shot and made me want to continue and keep going. Um, just as easily could have been this shot, which is the same area, but no, no uh, meteor. I've returned to try and capture lightning in the bottle a couple of times other in a different part of the park i caught a fireball over this milky way shot or well i call it a fireball i think the rest of you might not it was just this thin little line here um shooting over over the core and i remember seeing that meteor as i was acquiring the photo haven't done it much since um I've gone back. I tried to do this. I think this is that same shot again. I've gone back. I think this is a year later using different techniques. And so you see Jupiter and Saturn have moved. And I tried lightning in a bottle again, but I think uh, the universe said I gave well. So there's this little line right here, but I'm not so sure whether it's a meteor or not. But it was always a thrill to see if see if a streak of light goes across my image just like it did that fateful day in and I'm going to figure out what year the year was uh, not 2019. So this is back in 2019 when that happened. So that's 2020, and this is 2021, another anniversary. But there's smoke in the air and. I, the best I could do was try and tease the Milky Way and some stars out of all of the smoke that was going on. But there's Saturn. This is uh, Saturn and there's, so I better be careful. I'm thinking that this is Saturn and this is Jupiter. I will have to plate solve that to make sure that's true. Uh, but that's the, that's the way that Saturn and Jupiter look. So you can see over time with these uh, photos, 
how the planets move and why they would be considered they were considered the wanderers or named for being wanderers in the sky because they were never in the same place year to year so to finish the story i went out to um image at a slightly lesser dark um, area nature preserve we had lost one of the members in our uh we'd lost one of the members in uh, one of the clubs i'm in john coslin and um i we on the anniversary of his death i went out observed did some imaging it wasn't quite nightfall but i could see enough of the milky way to um try and get an image of it and a couple of things happened that night that um i'll always remember one i once again go and yell at the universe and say you know john if you're up there why don't you shoot me a meteor you know i dare to ask for something and then i look away as i'm taking an image and i look back at the image and this is what i saw going through the milky way the trail of yet what I believe to be another person because it was around a similar time. Um, and also what you don't see in this image is later on an even larger meteor streaks to the north above my head. I see the entire thing streaking over and I decided I wasn't gonna be upset this time because I didn't get a chance to image it. I figured that one was for me. And I'll always take that you know, as a uh, as a reminder that regardless of belief, the universe can show you a number of things, even if the only way you can see it is from your uh, from your own vantage point. Um, whatever park you go to or if it's just outside of your house. Um, dare to ask and you may receive so with that i will end my presentation rest in peace to john coslin and if you manage to get clear skies and there isn't much smoke from wildfires i encourage you to go and look up and count as many persons as you can and enjoy the night sky um, as long as we have it and, um, and with that, I'll stop sharing. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to take those. David. Yeah, thank you. That, uh, as always, your photographs are really just so inspiring. And as I said the other day to you, um, when I look at your pictures, I think of Mozart. I have a picture here that I'm going to show. It's, you're not gonna see it very well, it's in one of the books that I wrote, a book about Bart Bach, who loved the Milky Way. And in this picture, here in the top left, you can see Vega, and down the bottom right, you see Altair. And it's just a picture of the Milky Way. It's nothing so terrific, nothing so wonderful, except the date that I took it. It was March 19, 1993. That was the night before I left to join Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker at Baltimore Observatory. And um, a few nights later, while I was at the observatory with them, we discovered Comet Shoemaker 3D9. And so that's why this picture is so important to me. I just wanted to say that. Good spread. That, that fits in perfectly. It's, you never know what's going to happen. You go out um, and look at the night sky and then any any picture that you take before or after serves as a reminder of you know of that fleeting moment that you know you you capture you see something out there and you go oh, wow look what i caught but a moment you, in time frozen yes absolutely all right scott back to you great adrian thank you so much okay so at this point what we're going to do is we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll be back with more Global Star Party. Hey, Adrian. Yeah. 
If you're still here, do you have time for a quick technical question? Sure. No charge, though. Oh, no charge. <laughs> no charge. No charge. Well, if this leads to the image, I'm hoping then I'm, I'm sure it'll be worth it. So I'll try and share my screen here uh, oh, while the other participant is sharing. Well, I'll do the best yeah, I can. Scott's so a couple doing, nights, showing. yeah, a couple nights ago, I was out imaging, and I got a series of a bunch of exposures and put them all in Lightroom. They were all the same ISO and time and everything like that. But I was trying to stack them into an image, and I couldn't really figure out how to do that. Do you know how to do that? In in both Lightroom CC and Lightroom Classic, they now have a um, an option, and I'll look forward in. Uh, CC, I think. So you can try a photo merge and you can try HDR, but I, I don't know that photo merge itself works. I know in Photoshop, there is a direct stack, stacking that you can do. Um, but you can try photo merge. The one, pro the one problem with photo merge, though, is if you take, unless you took images directly in the night sky and you don't have anything in earth as a reference um photo merge you can actually try hdr will will merge or stack your images together for astro stuff i've always used deep sky stack it deep sky stacker which is one of the many programs you can use to get the same thing going but um yeah if you're using lightroom try photo merge you can try HDR. I've done that with a, a few series of shots lately. Um, the one that I showed at a baseball field was a merge of three different images taken at like different, uh, I believe taken at different um, apertures so that they were different levels of bright or dark. And it was able to stack those into a, you know, to an image, to a, a final image. So give that a shot. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise there's free deep sky stacker is free. If you've got room to download that, you can throw all your images into there and just stack the images. You don't have to stack them with any, you know, you've got like darks or flats and things. You don't have to use any additional um, files. You can just stack them there and see what you get. I think right. Lightroom will do it for you as well. I'm trying that now, the uh, photo merge for HDR. I was yeah. Doing, I, well, I was going for a star trail, so I had 118 images. They were 20-second exposures at ISO 1600, I think. Ah, okay. Yeah, that that should work. Um, yeah, just try it. You can try the photo merge. You can... I know in Photoshop, you group into stack, and... Um, then that works and what else um layers in photoshop where you take every single image and you make it you basically make it as you you import it as a layer and after you've imported all 118 of it you flatten the image and you have your um you have your star field but I think the photo merge will also do it. Okay. I'm trying that now. It's taking its time because I had. Yeah, you had 118 guess, images. 118 high res, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you had the patience to do it. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that'll work for you. Or at least if it does work for you, let me know. Because, yeah, that's those are the other ways I'd have. I'd forgotten that I wanted to do star trails, but I've gotten into just getting, doing the nightscape. So I haven't done star trail. I haven't tried star trails again in a while. Right, right. I did, um, um, I guess, what I could call my old fashioned way, where I do like one exposure for 15 minutes with the lowest ISO I could, maybe a little longer. Yeah. But they were all kind of noise and, and things like that. So there, it, that's going to happen. You can. You'll you'll get rid of the noise after you, um, you'll get rid of the noise after you get the image stacked. What are the signs of spring? They are as familiar as a blooming Thank daffodil, you. a songbird at dawn, a surprising shaft of warmth from the afternoon sun, and oh yes, don't forget the meteors.
Spring is fireball season, says Bill Cook of NASA's Meteoroid Environment Office. For reasons we don't fully understand, the rate of bright meteors climbs during the weeks around the vernal equinox. In other seasons, a person willing to watch the sky from dusk to dawn could expect to see around 10 random or sporadic fireballs. A fireball is a meteor brighter than the planet Venus. Earth is bombarded by them as our planet plows through the flotsam and jetsam of space. For example, fragments of broken asteroids and decaying comets that litter the inner solar system. In spring, fireballs are more abundant. Their nightly rate mysteriously climbs 10 to 30 percent. We've known about this phenomenon for more than 30 years, says Cook. It's not only fireballs that are affected. Meteorite falls, space rocks that actually hit the ground, are more common in spring as well. Meteor expert Peter Brown of the University of Western Ontario notes that some researchers think there might be an intrinsic variation in the meteoroid population along Earth's orbit, with a peak in big fireball producing debris around spring and early summer. We probably won't know the answer until we learn more about their orbits. To solve this and other puzzles, Cook is setting up a network of smart meteor cameras around the country to photograph fireballs and automatically triangulate their orbits. Networked observations of spring fireballs could ultimately reveal their origin. It might take a few years to collect enough data, he cautions. Until then, it's a beautiful mystery. Go out and enjoy the night sky. It is spring after all. <laughs> Well, we're back, everybody. This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And up next is uh, Molly Wakeling. Uh, Molly has been on many of our programs, uh, both our day programs and, of course, many global star parties. And uh, one of the things I love about uh, Molly is her ability to present the really kind of technical side of uh, of astronomy, but also the love and uh, the the beauty of uh, the things that she looks at and photographs. And so, um, Molly, I'm going to turn this program over to you. Uh, but I really love having you on the show. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad to be back again. Um, can't be on every week anymore since I'm working on my PhD and things are a little crazy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I try to come on sometimes. Um, I have a new webcam that is saturating my face. So I'm still kind of working on getting the light levels figured out for some reason. So apologies in advance, but don't worry, you don't have to see my face for, my, my face for much longer because I'm about to share my slides. <laughs> um, let me get this rolling. I think you have a cool haircut, Molly. So <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I, I just got that haircut. I'm uh, really excited about it. I, <laughs> loving, loving the short hair. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say yeah. something and decided I'd leave that alone. <laughs> I think haircut's a pretty safe thing to generally comment on. <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, that's nice. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I figured there'd be um, plenty of, of talk tonight about what uh, fireballs and, and meteors are, and um, there's not really a specific one to really talk about uh, that I've imaged at least. So I decided to just talk about yet another astronomical object of interest. And tonight I decided to talk about Messier 82, also known as the Cigar Galaxy. And this is uh, an action-packed talk. So it'll be a little on the long side, but I think it'll be, it'll be fun and entertaining and educational. Um, all right, so uh, what is the Cigar Galaxy? So uh, it is a starburst galaxy. It's actually it's it's class. Um, <clears throat> it's um, uh, uh, shape class is is usually considered to be irregular, although some spiral structure has been found, some barred structure uh, in the infrared. But it's a pretty chaotic galaxy, so um, it's usually just referred to as an irregular galaxy. It is also known as Messier 82, or if you like the new general catalog, number 3034. And we are seeing this galaxy from an edge on view, which is one of the things that makes it so cool is that we're able to see the really awesome uh, gas outflows that I'm going to talk about here in a sec. All right, so first, where is the uh, where is the cigar galaxy? So it is a pretty northerly target. I think it's probably, uh, well, there might be some parts of the year where some southern hemisphere observers can see it, um, but uh, largely it's a northern hemisphere target. 
if uh, so, I've got some screenshots from Stellarium here. We've got the Big Dipper over here, and it's uh, not too far off the kind of the the bowl of the Big Dipper here. I'm not going to give a detailed finder chart because you. If you're going to go hunting for it, you probably know how to do that yourself. But here's the kind of general region of, of where it's at in the constellation Ursa Major. And when you do look at it, particularly with binoculars or uh, a small, like a refractor or a short focal length telescope, you can see both M82 and its partner M81 over here, usually in the same field of view. So uh, it, they make a nice pair together up in the sky. So some fast facts, I mentioned it's in the constellation of Ursa Major. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, post pandemic, I've been, I've been talking to, well, post lockdown part of pandemic, I suppose I should say, we're still inside the pandemic. I've been talking a lot more to my classmates than I have before. So I keep losing my voice because I'm talking during the day where I didn't used to talk during the day for the last year. Um, so it's about 12 million light years away, so relatively close as far as galaxies go, which is part of what makes it so bright and so large on our sky. It was discovered by Johann Alert Bode in 1774. He's a German astronomer and uh, later was rediscovered by Pierre Machin, however you say that in French, who told Charles Messier about it and then Messier included it in his catalog has an apparent magnitude of 8.4, which is pretty bright and puts it nicely inside of binocular range for uh, even fairly light polluted locations. And it's about 37,000 light years in diameter, which makes it a little more than a third of the diameter of the Milky Way, but it's actually about five times more luminous than the Milky Way. It just puts out an insane amount of light. And that's because of all the new stars that are being formed in it since it is a starburst galaxy. So what is a starburst galaxy? So in the case of M82, uh, intense star formation has been triggered by tidal interactions with M81, which is physically about 300,000 light years away from M82. So they're, they're physically gravitationally interacting. About 100 million years ago, tidal forces from M81 started to deform M82, kind of giving it its irregular shape. Previous tidal encounters are responsible for funneling all like a huge amount of gas into M82 with uh, that happening a couple of times between 200 million years ago and four to six million years ago. And it's this inflow of gas and dust that, that sparked all the star formation because suddenly there was all this gas available to form stars and stars were, as, as these hot young stars were emitting tons of radiation and stellar wind that compresses the interstellar gas to make even more stars. So it's kind of this, this self-feeding process. And to compare just how much star formation is going on in M82 versus normal galaxies, uh, in the galactic center of M82, new stars are born about 10 times more often, 10 times faster than within the entire Milky Way. Not that a single star is born faster, but that the rate of star formation is about 10 times higher than the rate of star formation in the Milky Way galaxy and, and most other galaxies. So just a furious star formation rate. And their radiation and energetic particles that are coming off of the new stars are creating that that red glow that's coming off of M82, which is actually a lot of gas and dust kind of being thrown out by the stellar winds. And it's got a kind of a sci-fi name of the bipolar super wind, which I think is kind of fun, the super wind. Yeah. Now uh, the Starburst will eventually consume enough material to kind of put itself out. So when there's not really any more gas and dust around to turn into stars, then the rate of star formation will decrease. And that's estimated to happen in a few tens of millions of years. But for now, we have quite the light show from M82. So there's a lot of other interesting stuff going on in this galaxy as well, as one can imagine. Uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory has discovered a fluctuating X-ray source about 600 light years away from the core of the Cigar Galaxy. And while we have observed 
a lot of supermassive black holes and um, have been sometimes able to infer the locations of stellar mass black holes. We haven't really observed much in the way of, of a class of black holes called intermediate mass black holes, which are in between stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. So um, this one, based on its X-ray emission, is estimated to be between 200 to 5,000 solar masses, which is a lot but a lot less than the supermassive black holes that lie at the cores of most galaxies. The one at the core of M82 is 30 million solar masses, to put that in perspective. And we, we measure things, in astronomy we tend to measure the masses of things in the universe in terms of solar masses, instead of saying like kilograms or something like that, just because it would be huge kind of like the numbers that are difficult to work with and putting things in units of solar masses just makes things pretty convenient for us humans here. Another interesting thing from, that's uh, shown up in M82 is a supernova that, that was discovered in January 2014. The supernova, of course, happens 12 million years ago, but the light has had just now reached us back in January 2014. It was magnitude 11.7 at discovery and brightened to 10.5. So certainly within, within visual range with a, a larger instrument, um, and the fact that you can see a single star in a galaxy 12 million light years away when it goes supernova, I think is pretty darn cool. <laughs> and uh, so it, it was de definitely within the range of being able to see visibly with a telescope. Uh, I was not observing yet at that time, so I uh, I didn't see, I don't know if any of you got the chance to observe that. Uh, there's probably a, a uh, astronomy news kind of push out about that because whenever there is a supernova in a nearby galaxy you can go observe it you, most of the time and it's pretty cool to see this this these transient phenomena in the relatively unchanging universe as it appears to us so i'd like to also show in this segment what some of these astronomical objects look like in other wavelengths we deal with the optical part of the spectrum in in visual and photographic astronomy most of the time but there's a lot of stuff going on in other wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum that can tell us even more about what's happening inside of these astronomical objects like the cigar galaxy. So this is a, a radio image from uh, the Very Large Array and I guess another uh, radio telescope called Merlin at 5 gigahertz, which, by the way, is about the wavelength of um, your uh, 5 gig of your 5 uh, not your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, but your 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which um, some of you may have in your houses. Um, and an unknown object emitting in the in a radio frequency was discovered at the John Rell Bank Observatory at the University of Manchester in the UK. And it's an interesting radio emission. Uh, it's, it's very powerful to be able to see it from here, but also it was kind of transient. It wasn't there and then it appeared quite brightly, but it doesn't match the rise and fall times of supernovae. And it also doesn't have any, any X-ray light at all, which is usually a company's radio light when you have a, a type of phenomenon called a microquasar. So, and it doesn't really match anything else ast astrophysically known yet either. So people are still trying to figure out uh, at least as far as I could tell, what, uh, what this object might be. Uh, and it's also a little bit too far from the central black hole in the galaxy to be affiliated with that black hole. So uh, whenever there's new stuff discovered out in space, and uh, there's lots of, lots of stuff that we don't know yet, but yet we can probe with the electromagnetic spectrum, which is always really cool to, to think about. On some other wavelengths, we have uh, infrared from Spitzer, which, which highlights that outflow, that super wind, the, the dust cloud. And uh, so in that infrared image, yeah, the, the red are uh, dust particles that emit on a, um, on a longer infrared wavelength, and the blue are hot stars that emit on a shorter infrared wavelength. So they, they false color, so you can see the different infrared wavelengths that are being shown. Over on the right is an ultraviolet image. Uh, there's, I think there's some optical in this one as well, but largely ultraviolet image from uh, the SWIFT telescope up in space. And uh, the, 
um, actually, so sorry, this, this note that I have here is back for the infrared image. Um, the, the dust in, in that outflow, which you can also see some, some glow from in the UV image as well, is actually uh, the, one, of the th one of the elements that has been detected in that dust is a carbon compound called a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, which is the smelly stuff in tailpipes and barbecue pits and other <laughs> places of combustion. So, um, you know, because we tend to think about, especially as uh, visual astronomers and astrophotographers, we tend to think about elemental things in space, like uh, hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, sulfur gas. Um, then we think about what's in stars like helium and and these other elements, but there's actually a lot of molecules in space as well. And that's a lot of what those dark nebulae are that you can see on a dark night in the Milky Way uh, and are scattered throughout our sky is there's a lot of, of space chemistry happening that is both reminiscent of, of hydrocarbon chemistry that we see here on Earth, but also some chemistry that we don't see here on Earth because the densities of the molecules are so sparse that reactions that happen very quickly here happen very, very slowly in space. And you can get molecules that don't exist here on Earth because of the different conditions that are in space. So uh, a lot of radio astronomy probes into the uh, molecular compounds that are out there in space. And it's really cool to think about, like, I mean, it wasn't just carbon and hydrogen and oxygen elements that were on earth to form the basis of life, but there was actual molecules out in space that kind of build these building blocks of life. So super cool to think about. And finally, uh, moving up the magnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, the X-ray, this is an X-ray image of M82, or at least the, the blue and the pink parts are. The other colors uh, come from some optical data put into this image as well, so you can kind of see what you're looking at. But uh, again, that gas and dust outflow glows on multiple wavelengths. And as you can see, that includes X-ray here from the Chandra Space Telescope. The image on the right isn't, uh, isn't a wavelength of light, but um, the magnetic field lines that are associated with the outflow of gas and dust uh, overlaid over an optical or uh, an infrared image of, of a MIDI 2 taken by the SOFIA instrument, which is that telescope that flies on an airplane that NASA flies up in the upper atmosphere or not the upper atmosphere, but as far as airplanes fly. <laughs> right. Um, and I, and there's kind of some, some interesting questions about if the magnetic field lines loop back in, which would pull the dust back into the galaxy to form new stars, or if the magnetic field lines break open and continue to push the gas and dust out into the intergalactic medium, providing material, seeding it with material that may eventually become future stars or maybe even future galaxies. Uh, so dumping material into the intergalactic medium. And uh, from what I could find, that was a, an open question still as to what the shape of these magnetic field lines and how they're affecting the, those, uh, the bipolar superwind. Uh, yeah, so observing the cigar galaxy, uh, it is quite bright. So you can act, you can see it with small instruments to include binoculars, even in relative uh, relatively high amounts of light pollution. It'll be kind of a dimish smudge, as most things in visual astronomy are. But you can snag M81 and M82 together with binoculars or small telescopes, and that makes for a nice view and and uh, uh, a decent outreach target if you want to show people a galaxy that's bright enough to kind of see the shape of, uh, although it's not as impressive as the pictures on the box of, <laughs> of telescopes. Um, the cigar shape is more obvious with larger scopes where you have a, a smaller field of view and to be able to kind of make out some of that cigar shape. On the photographic side, it's really excellent both at large fields of view, so you can, where you can capture both galaxies mm -hmm. together, and small fields of view, where you can get a lot more detail just on M82. So it's it's really great for, for a wide variety of, of telescope focal lengths and apertures. The red superwind is difficult to catch wide band. Uh, I'm about to show a picture here where I captured some of it, 
but um, it's it's a lot more easily captured if you do some narrow band imaging with it, either using like a, a duo or, or just multi narrow band filter, the color camera, or using a hydrogen alpha filter with your monochrome camera. And if you go under dark skies to image it, there's a lot of integrated flux nebula in that region. You probably have seen a lot of pictures of M81 and M82 with this white glowy dust in the background. And what that is, is that's so cool. It is the, it's, it's dust that is around the Milky Way, around our galaxy, that is not being eliminated by one star or one cluster of stars, but just by the total light being emitted by the Milky Way writ large. <laughs> so it's kind of this grayish white reflecting off of, off of uh, intergalactic dust surrounding our galaxy that you can pick up in image in some places in the sky. And uh, particularly, it seems to congregate around our North Pole. So uh, up around where, where M81 and M82 are. So this is uh, one of my favorite images I've, I've gotten of M82 so far. This was actually over a single night up at our dark sky site, about Bortle three and a half up in the Tahoe National Forest out in California before I moved out to Ohio. It was done with my ZWO color camera, my ASI 294MC Pro, mm. just with the astronomic luminance filter. It's beautiful. It's on my, I, thank you. It's on my Ioptron 740, and it's uh, just under five hours total exposure time for this one. And got uh, was able to get some of the uh, not a lot of it, but some of that uh, super wind coming off of here, you can see some of the red uh, and the dust overlaying the, the edge on view of the core of the galaxy here. Got a really cool nebula in M81 here. And of course, all this background smoke, <laughs> if you will, it kind of looks like of the, uh, of the IFN, the integrated flux nebula, which was super exciting to have come out in my image and me knowing it's not some weird camera phenomenon, but that it's an actual real phenomenon. Yeah, I learned about the fact that the um, that uh, flux or whatever you were talking about, folks would try, thought that it was some sort of noise and try and get it out of there. And it turns out that it belongs there. It's a, that it's a part of it. That was that was news to me when I learned it. So it was cool. It's cool to see that. And I guess there's something similar to that around uh, Polaris as well. Yes. Yes, so it's more of the same up around uh, Polaris. Although I think Polaris also has some nebulosity around it locally, from what I understand. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of, of this nebulosity kind of up around the, the North Pole region in general. Um, I don't know a whole lot about whether it's kind of evenly distributed around the Milky Way and we can just see it up at up in the northern part of the sky because we're looking um, above the galactic plane. Or, or whether it's kind of concentrated in specific areas, I'm not sure. But it does tend to show up most often in images of M81 and M82 and sometimes Polaris. Now that I think of it, I mean, M81 and 82 are, they, they are north, you know, they're circumpolar for us in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. So it makes sense that that medium would be in that area. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. But yeah, that's what I got on M82. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Molly, that's, that's great. I've learned more about M82 than I think I ever knew. So uh, thank you so much. It's yeah, so cool and, to, to see it also in all those different wavelengths and, you know, and knowing that we have all these, um, these telescopes to, you know, to study it in this way and, uh, you know, all the researchers to, uh, to uh, pick it apart and, um, you know, to teach us what's going on inside of that amazing galaxy. So I've got a quick cool. view, a quick live view of the ring nebula. If you want me to show that real quick. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, while I've been talking, my, I've been, do, I've been live stacking some frames on the ring nebula. Now I'm having some guiding issues. So my stars uh, look a little funny. Oh, I also forgot to refocus. 
<laughs> so we'll go on. That's what this is. I, I, I focus. You were too excited to show us and then things got out of whack. That's yeah, I like it still. So. I set the it's focus for what's best for my guide camera, which is in between the focus points for my chroma filters and my astronomic filters for when I was calibrating guiding. And I forgot to go back to <laughs> the uh, the focus point for um uh, for my hydrogen filter. So it's a lot of focus, but this is a hydrogen alpha image and you can see uh, some of the, you can kind of see some of the structure here, this little blip that comes off and you can see the central star, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm imaging this object all night tonight in focus <laughs> after this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm just live stacking this in SharpCap and I've got about 18 minutes total on it. It's such a series of 30 second exposures. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, up next uh, is Maxi Filaris. Uh, Maxi is, uh, is uh, one of our favorite astrophotographers from the Southern Hemisphere in Argentina. And uh, he has uh, inspired a lot of people to get involved in astrophotography uh really on a shoestring you know and he's shown us how to take some of the simplest equipment and do some of the most amazing astrophotography you can possibly imagine with it so maxi i'm going to turn it over to you hey scott hey everyone how is it going it's going great what well, good to see you it. again my friend <laughs> good to see you too so good night everyone tonight uh, basically like the topic is the the the, the, the what we call in here the the uh, special fugaz the uh, the quickly star practically fireball exactly thanks nico um <laughs> i I only have the chance to capture some quick pictures of uh, that uh, fireballs because uh, I only uh, did some pictures in uh, through a telescope that is very difficult to capture. So uh, the last summer, when I did uh, some pictures of the southern sky, I I could take some one in in particularly in one. A picture. Let me show you my screen. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. Oh, As okay. usual, we that's see a, a beautiful uh, eclipse shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a gorgeous eclipse shot. <laughs> Every shot you show us, Maxi, it, it but, has to compete with this. I think this is a, a, a huge fireball behind the moon, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we could call it that. <laughs> well, this is, was last December. Uh, well, this is the 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 only single picture that I took uh -huh. in, in PG back above the, the telescope because uh, that night was very windy, and I, I put it uh, in uh, above the, the telescope with the uh, eighteen uh, millimeters. Uh, lens and start to take six minute picture pictures and when i realized in the another day this was i remember almost uh, 4 a.m and i was very tired but uh, you can see the the southern cross omega centauri mm -hmm. uh, alpha centauri Hadar, but in this case it's a little fireball yes beautiful i in that night i didn't see it you know i th th this was very quickly and they they are very uh, often uh, i don't know if it, if it says right uh, when it, it, it's yep. very continuing because uh, there's a lot of things uh, uh, surrounding on space uh, maybe a little rocks or maybe a medium or, or huge rocks that that call asteroids and in this case is a meteor so 
uh, talking about asteroids uh, in Argentina, we have a place that we uh, it's called the Campo del Cielo, the the I don't know how to say in English uh, the the field of the sky or the yeah that's uh, right. <laughs> Uh, this is the thank you, Molly. Uh, this is the the region where they they are a lot of uh, impacts that uh, 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 was uh, almost uh, for millennia uh, millenn millenniums uh, uh, in the past, uh, and this was. Uh, uh, th th there was a lot of uh, uh, native uh, cultures that had some different stories like Wichi and Kuong, but uh, in, in this uh, particular region, it's in the northern of, uh, of Argentina, uh, it's in the, in the border of the uh, province of Del Chaco and the province of Santiago del Estero, and there's a lot of impacts that uh, we have in a, in America the second uh, at the at the most time the the, the second uh, asteroid uh, on the world and in America it's the only one that uh, and that is the the Gancedo uh, uh, asteroid. Uh, let me show you some pictures of and that I was searching. Uh, well, this is the, the Chaco asteroid. Is uh, everyone can visit it? Uh, is uh, almost uh, twenty eight uh, uh, tons, so it's very very huge. But the Gancedo is almost uh, thirty one tons. Uh, this is a, a I think national park. Uh, going the the, the, the the field of sky. This is an excavation where uh, were found the Gancedo meteor uh, uh, asteroid. In this case, a meteorite. Uh, you know, it's enormous. <laughs> Find this in I, I think I, and I think maybe it will be more because uh, it's a very rich region. Uh, to to find a lot of uh, meteorites and of course uh, they won't dis uh, disappear of uh, our atmosphere but uh, so they they only impact in this place and i th i remember the the first uh, the, the most uh, white uh, meteorite is in namibia uh, i don't know if it's okay but uh, that's it. I think it was uh, 16 tons. Yeah, that's big. It's very, very huge. So, uh, well, uh, this is a very briefing of, uh, of some place in Argentina that everyone, well, obviously, when the pandemic situation goes by, and of course, everyone can, can, can come come to come to here uh, to my country and visit this region because it's a very a uh, scientific region and also a very uh, culture region because of the na natives and, and all the story that that has it so of course everyone is invited um well uh, in, in this uh, another days I I was trying to do some planetary pictures because obviously we are uh, well in, in this la last night was the the opposition of Saturn and of course I wanted to try to to take that capture and and take uh, uh, some videos uh, also of Jupiter the thing was very very uh, fine. I have some issues, of course, obviously with my collimation. I was yelling with myself, uh, but uh, I I can do some. Well, this afternoon uh, afternoon I was stacking and process some images, and this is what I what I get. Uh, well, this is a, let me show you. Uh, 
this was last night. I put my computer in my backyard, the telescope. Uh, I I have a lot of time to to try to to put a, a go again, but <laughs> I I was uh, fighting a lot. So this is a, mm. a, a they rotated a picture of Jupiter that I took almost uh, in a half an hour, uh, tried to <clears> capture <throat> the, the gray red spot, but it was passing by to the another side. Mm. So, and, and the scene in this case, I think it, it wasn't very good because uh, I have a, a very windy uh, weather. Uh, oh, that's still time. a fine image. Well, I, I'm very, uh, I'm trying to to get more of what I get every time. You know, it's uh, I think it's an issue of mine because I'm over um, over expected. I, I don't know if I if say okay. Um, when I I. I could do some other pictures of Jupiter and try to, uh, when, I, when I did in that time, uh, I only did with some simple grabs and very quickly stuck, but very, it was okay and have a very good picture. Then in this case, I, do, I did a lot of things uh, <laughs> and it don't convince me, of course. It's an issue of mine. Maybe when some people uh, do about the first time, they say, oh my God, it's in the big giant planet of, of our solar system. But uh, it's, a, it's a little blur. I think I overexposed the time of a recording to, to take some pictures, but I have this weekend, uh, of course, uh, um, fortunately, uh, we have a good uh, weather, a good scene. I was in Meteo Blue, uh, and tomorrow will be a, a good night. Of, I, I hope so. So I will give you another, another picture. And of course, this is a, a picture of Saturn in the opposition. The, the nice. Two. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, I finished it al al almost two hours ago <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, I can. It's fresh. <laughs> it's very, very fresh. I didn't post it yet. Um, uh, I try to, 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 to process very, very fine, uh, uh, very detailed and step by step. Uh, not doing very quickly or something because uh, the, the the videos it wasn't very very good, but sometimes uh, some frames was was okay, so I can start. Um, well, I think this is a a little resume of this uh, of this last uh, week. Uh, I maybe in the, in the proximate days, in, in the next days, I will try to, to, to go uh, to a, a farm road, uh, almost uh, 20 or 30 kilometers from my city, uh, to, uh, to do some, again, of Milky Way pictures. Uh, but I had to to do it when I go out of work, uh, I have to get the, the equipment on my car and then I will go because when I uh, go out of work, uh, the sun goes by very qu quickly here and hmm. uh, I would like to, to put the, the equipment in light day. So uh, in the weekend, the, the, the weather will say that it's going to be rainy, so I have to some opportunity this week, this a few days. So I hope that, that that could work. So this is my little presentation. Of course, a, a, 
a, a really short briefing of and resume of uh, what I did, and uh, I hope to to enjoy it. So I leave you with this picture. Of <laughs> <laughs> Great image, though, Maxi. All, all of your astrophotography is such a treat to uh, to look at and to hear about your adventures in uh, astrophotography. It's it's really cool. So, well, thank you, thank you, Scott. Now, up next is uh, someone new to the Global Star Party. Uh, uh, his nickname is Nico the Hammer, and uh, uh, he was introduced to me by Maxi. So, Maxi, I'm going to let you introduce him. Because um, uh, you, you've known him for a while, you were talking about him um, uh, a little bit. So, uh, how about if I have you uh, give a proper introduction? Okay, it's it's a pleasure to to introduce my my astro friend or astro amigo, uh, Nico Arias. Uh, he's uh, well. He will now we we'll talk about him, but uh, he is a astronomer, uh, astrophotographer, uh, and his uh, work that he do is amazing. And I'm glad to to present you to all the audience, to uh, all the people that is here in, in the, this uh, session. And Nico, es todo tuyo, compa. Okay, thank you, Maxi. Hi, Scott. How you do, everyone? Oh. How are you? Uh, First of all, uh, thanks for the, the invitation. Uh, it's great to have you on. Um, I have to ask you though, Nico, how did you yeah. get the nickname Nico the Hammer? Oh, it's a, it's a long story. Um, I I'm a, I'm a, I play drums. And, okay. And when I, when I was young, they say I played too hard, like a hammer. Oh, okay. Uh, so the nickname is called like many years now <laughs> it's a cool name i like it uh, thanks okay um what i do i, I have a, a dobsonian uh, a 10 inch dot and and i do observations and i do a sketch and some time ago uh, i started to to hear or, or, or to try to to do some science uh, and I say, okay, I am in a uh, border nine, guys. What can I do? And I started to to research on double stars. Uh, I started with a simple webcam. Uh, now I have a QHI5. Uh, this a uh, um, it's a mono camera, and I started to do uh, work is, works. Uh, measuring double stars and then i say okay what else can i do yeah, and i started to try planetary imaging and some photos uh, and it's not easy with the top sun uh, but let me show you with my screen i have a, some things okay can you see it Yes. Okay. Uh, this is an example of what I did with my dog with a double stars. As can you see, the stars. Oh, this is moves. a Dobsonian. This is a Dobsonian and hand tracking. Hand so, tracking. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. So uh, I need to do it. the work very hard because I, I need to to use uh, software to calculate the the movement mm -hmm. to measuring the not not only the the the, the relative uh, separation of the stars in, in double stars we need a, a position angle so i need to do i need to know where the north is on the image so i play with the uh, with the movement and um, and make my measures. This is only an example, but uh, you see the, the, the movement. This is mm -hmm. what you see with a lot. Uh, it's amazing. I, I, amazing. I, I don't I, know of anyone that um, 
does astrophotography by hand tracking with the Dobsonian. I mean, it's amazing. Well, I, I started with this. You see, okay, I can measure, I can do the astrometry of the stars. But uh, I like to do when, when I read or hear, no, you can do it. You can't do it with, with adoption. I said, okay, let's try. Why not? So I started to try with a planetary machine. Let me show you Jupiter. This is what I see on my dubs, and I capture wow. a, I made videos like this with the planet moving. Yeah, the there's screen. the red spot. This is the red spot. This is uh, three nights ago. What? I love it. It's great. But you can see the chant because I need to pause and resume the recording <laughs> every time moving the, the dog with my hands. Right. And, uh, well, you have a steady like, hand, that's for sure. Like, as I have a mono camera, I have to do it three times with the filters to, to have a, a color picture. So this is what I stuck from that videos. And this is the, the process with the, the regis tags. Wow, excellent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice when you when you get the, the final image, but oh, wow. it takes a lot of work. <laughs> Just, uh, wow. This is Jupiter. And this is uh, then another another screen with uh, with two moons. Yeah, it's beautiful. And well, as Maxi shows the, the Jupiter last night in opposition, I have mine. And well, this is the, the panels. Yeah. The three, the three captures. This is when I stack before the wavelets. And I have this result. I'm really happy Holy with this. Smokes. Yes. That is really great. That is really, tracked. really my hurt back so bad. <laughs> right. Because I was moving it up like two oh, hours goodness. or more, trying to get the, the, the best moment. Uh, we have a good night last night. And this is, I love these images with, with the moons. This is a composition. I, I make a, a different exposure to get the, the moons. You can see That's Titan. A lot of moons for, for Saturn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I was uh, looking at the, the ephemerides two days ago, and say the night of the opposition, we have a lot of moons and so close. So this was uh, my shot. And I am I am really happy with this. Um, uh, it's and, really, it's it's stupendous. It's great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, okay, I have uh, also uh, try to do uh, photography. I say okay, I I am using a Dobson. I make a, a lot of tries because uh, my camera has a small sensor, so I I, I have like um, a magnification of two uh, hundred x. Uh, I'm on. Yeah. So I, I need to make calculus and, and they say, okay, I can do at most uh, 200 milliseconds. It's less, nothing because it's, it's like this, uh, a lucky imaging. And you can see uh, how, how I see the stars at, at that exposure time. Right. This is a, a global cluster in, in constellation of Pavo. It's, uh, I, I don't remember the last. Uh, NGC 6752. Uh, okay. It's a, a single feet uh, stretch. All right. And as um, planetary, I make the, the four captures. I, I make it with filters and without filter to make wow. a to try to get a, a color image. Yeah, I, um, I just want I just want everybody who is watching right now to really understand that you have no tracking 
with no, this no, 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 no. by That's it. <laughs> pushing a Dobsonian with your hand, right? I, I, I pushed my dog and wait and capture like 10 seconds okay. and then move again and continue. And then move it and then 10 more. Okay. And like, like I don't know, maybe I have an hour. Really, really short exposures, right? Really short, like 100 mile seconds. It's like a, a 0 0.2 seconds exposure. Okay. But, uh, this is, so look at the results. Uh, it's awesome. This is a, a real video in real time. This is what okay. I see on the dog. And so you just see the bright. I just see the bright star. You know, yes. Right? Yeah. And, and but, this is. But this is what's star. there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it's amazing because it's, uh, you know it's uh, the first time I, I I was making double stars and I stretch an image and they started appearing a lot. Yeah. Of first I say, okay, I need to try this. And, oh, that's great. That's and I great. have uh, some. Nebula also. So one of the, one of the uh, people in our audience, Nico, says, so that means I have no excuses now. <laughs> okay. This is what I, I, I say the same, the same thing, everything. You need to try. Yeah. I, I don't care what is your setup. Right. Is, uh, always uh, you can do something. This is the, the Omega Nebula. Obviously, it's, wow. it's, really, uh, it's really close. And I haven't, I haven't know the, the the great resolution, but you can do it with adoption and yeah, and that's inspiring. Uh, that is okay. Thank you. I, and I have some some more pictures to show. Uh, well, this this is an example in in, in mono with no filters. Mm -hmm. And I have another picture. Well, this is the. Uh, the, the nebulos, uh, the, the homunculus nebula in Eta Carinae. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, this, this, <laughs> this is, Think about it, Molly. It's a Dobsonian <laughs> and a, a small camera. You are killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Molly. And wow. This is a, a, a really difficult nebula because it's it's very bright the star, and if you are in a in a clear sky and vertical two or three, the the Carina Nebula cover it up. You you didn't see that. Uh, so uh, like I am in a vertical line sky, and the nebula is really hard to get. With a uh, short exposures, you can get the this uh, planetary nebula. Um, this is another planetary nebula, it's the, the, wow. the back nebula in Scorpio. Yeah. Beautiful. Holy cow. <laughs> That's an incredible <laughs> picture of the bug nebula. Oh my yeah, God. I, I love the planetary nebulas. <laughs> this is a NGC 6153. This is also. Blowing uh, my mind uh, right uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> the colors on these are amazing. I love the color. And this so is, Nicholas, yes, this is, are you using this? Are you using this? Hey, this is awesome. I'm, I'm literally speechless. That's why everyone else <laughs> is taking this. I just been blown away. This is awesome. Um, my question is, are you using yeah. the same camera for both uh, when you're pushing the dog for both planetary and the nebulae? Yeah, yes. I, I have the, uh, the Quich Fi camera. And yes. Um, oh, for, for planetary, I use a Barlow. To get more uh, more more focal length, but uh, when I do the, the photos, here one of the pillars of creation in wow. In the, never in never tell an amateur astronomer that he cannot do something. Okay? No, okay. Because... I, when I when I read, you can do it with Dobson. Well, okay, let's do it. It's amazing. Uh, and for the photograph. The colors use, are uh, awesome too. The star colors are amazing. Yes. I use a, a focal reducer that I, I, I made myself. I break a, let me show you. I broke made a, a focal reducer, okay. Yeah, an old uh, binocular <laughs> and retire the lens. <laughs> and because this, this is a, a lens of the N25 binocular. Okay. And I put it in front of the camera and reduce like, Zero point zero point seven uh, of magnification. So right, that helps, that helps because excellent, uh, excellent. Yes, flatten it out. That's awesome. 
Um, so, well, this is what I do. I, I do what they say you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> that I is try. Awesome. Okay. Yep. And whether the exposure is a lot like 30 second or, or, or what, what are you using? No, 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 because it, we, uh, oh, video? No, it, it, it shot in, in fit, uh, but using uh, 0.2 seconds because uh, the, the image is moving. Uh, so I make for this photograph of the pilots, it's like uh, in, in every channel, I have um, like 800 feet almost. So it's, it's a lot of, uh, of stacking information and to, to get the to nebula. It's a machine gun. <laughs> wow. a machine gun. So, so you, 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 get, you get all the data, pilot all, and, and then you post process uh, the hundreds of images, right? Afterwards? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I stick. And, and that is. I, I couldn't that, believe it. The first, time, awesome. the first time I couldn't believe it, but uh, it worked. <laughs> but, but, but your base frame is 0.2 obviously. seconds. So you just you just stack 0.2 seconds. Yeah. Wow. For both Nebula and Gal and and the uh, yeah yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I, I I use uh, uh, that configuration. It's the, it's the maximum time I can get uh, without making a, a trade. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful. So well, this is what I do and. Uh, uh, and what I mean, you do is great. I'm really, I'm really <laughs> happy to to be here with you. Uh, well, we're happy you're on the program, Nico. So a question you for yeah. you, Nico. Um, yeah, tell me. Do you is. use Unity Gain or a high gain value for your deep sky? Uh, no, I, I tried. I, I was a uh, a lot of research because if I use a lot of gain, I I may get some more info, but I, the stars uh, going to explode. Uh, I, I have a lot of noise because uh, yeah. I, I can do a long exposure, so I cannot compensate that. So I will start reading about the, the camera, how they used to guide. And I, I found that like uh, maybe a 25% of the game. Okay. I, I use it in, in, in 11 or six. Uh, so, so I cannot get the, the stars uh, burning. Okay. Awesome. But when you stack, you, you, you do more than stacking, right? You, because if it's only 0 0.2 second exposure, you must do some like uh, stacking I, I, in two dimensions, right? You, you stack not only for sharpness, but also to increase the signal somehow. Uh, of course, yes. Yes, this, that increases the, the signal. And then I, I stretch it uh, with a... With PT side uh, and, and look for a, a, a level of okay. I, I, I want to, to get more uh, more nebula, but not that noise. So it, it's a it's a try and test. You know. You do like a hybrid stacking approach, like where you where you stack batches and then you you make um, masters, submasters, and then stack those together. Uh, no, no, no. I I used to use a uh, a one night and and I stack, for example, five hundred uh, images of each channel, uh, and I make it in one hour, and then I stack the uh, and the every channel and put it together. But no, 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 no very complex process. Just uh, awesome. Uh, this is really cool, Miko. Really cool. Okay. Well, obviously we could talk for hours, but uh, this, this is great. The, the, the field rotation, right, Nico? Doing yeah, that. I, uh, that, that too, with, with adoption, with a, you had the field rotation, so I, I lost a lot of, of the picture. I need to crop because you, you have the, the four channels and you have the movement. Uh, and really funny. <laughs> but that's not bad because you know with you know even with a rectangular you can cut it off make a square and then circular you know so you you can you can yeah. crop it's, it's it, it will be fine and uh especially if you use a, a focal reducer or a bar load to get the field of view then even if it rotates you, you can take all that black space out so it's good it's awesome that's right, that's right. Yeah. very okay. cool okay so well this, this was my presentation uh, i'm happy you you enjoy it 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank Nico, thank you very much. I, I'll read uh, some of the comments here. Um, Chris Larson okay. says, well done, Nicholas. I use a five inch daub and got nowhere near the results. So really impressive. Um, Mike Overacker says, did I hear that right? Shot on a hand guided daub? <laughs> That's right. You saw it here first. Uh, Billy's Astro says, amazing work. Um, uh, Martin Eastburn says, I think the bar has just been raised. Uh, let's see. Jeff Wise says, the hammer has spoken. <laughs> there you're cool. Very cool. Uh, Jeff Wise, amazed at your handmade focal reducer. Um, so this uh, really amazing. I think you um, uh, gave everyone a, a great uh, amount of inspiration, Nico. Cesar Brolo is watching. He says, great work, Nico the Hammer. Um, okay, thanks so much. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, will, I will give in the, in the chat my, my Instagram. So if, if the, someone has any, yeah, please. Go any ahead question. Go ahead and I'll share it. Okay. okay. And so people can follow you. And uh, Nico, you are on the Global Star Party mailing list uh, right now. So um, we do them usually once a week. Uh, we will not be doing it next week because I'll be on a trip, uh, you know, for about a week myself. So, uh, but um, but uh, typically we have them on Tuesday nights, like like right now. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Glad to hear you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, let's see, where are we at this moment here? Um, I think we're perhaps up to camera at this point. Is that right? I can, uh, yeah, I can, I can go. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, awesome. Uh, another awesome Global Star Party. Great to be here. And um, good to see, uh, you know, we got uh, Connell and Maxi and, and Nico. That was great to see you, Nico. Hope to see you some more more often here. Um, great, great discussion. I don't have any pictures of um, of uh, bullets or, or anything because, uh, as you know, up until basically uh, last year, I've been a visual, 100% visual observer. Um, and so I, I haven't had the opportunity to to really kind of be equipped to be able to snap. So I've just been looking up at the sky and what I, I can just share with you some of my experience on that. Um, I mean, uh, a couple of star parties I've had, uh, you know, many years ago, I was uh, looking up at the sky and I remember seeing in two opposite sides of the sky. Uh, one was a, a really bright green, uh, you know, green uh, trail with a smoke oh, yeah. trail behind it. That was awesome. Yeah, that was yeah. just awesome. And you can see the smoke trail, like at, almost like, uh, you know, out, out of a jet or, or, you know, it was just like, wow. And uh, and then so it had that lingering effect. And then it, it literally went right across the whole sky. And then and then literally about an hour later in the opposite direction, uh, there was a bright reddish, rusty red orange um, one. Hmm. Same thing, just right across the whole sky. And that smoke uh, trail behind that, that was incredible. I forgot, it was many years ago, I forgot exactly which uh, meteor shower it was, but um, that stuck in my mind. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you just have to get yeah. out there and look up, yeah. you know, and uh, I just haven't had that opportunity. Uh, you know, I've been very busy with my work and all that, but I, those images stick, stuck in my mind and I'm looking forward to looking up some more in the future here. <laughs> oh yeah. So. Uh, I can just encourage that because you, if you look up, you will find them, and, uh, and you will and find them. They're great. really beautiful. They're really something to see. And um, so, I might, just a quick update on the camp astronomy. We let me just uh, do it this way. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to just uh, actually use. I'm on my phone right now. Uh, let's see it there outside. So let me just do this. I'm going to see to share my screen. Uh, actually, you know what? what did, maybe do it this way. Instead of sharing my screen, 
I can uh, flip the camera around and then I turn off the uh, turn off the virtual background. There we go. Yeah, sorry, I'm just outside. <laughs> uh, if you remember where we were uh, last um, camp astronomy session last week, we were in Lyra. So if I go look at my sky safari here, um, we had just finished uh, Lyra and uh, we are now going to go into Aquila. So Aquila has, uh, it's rich in planetary nebula and uh, lots of juicy ones. And I was actually just look at 6807, highly recommended. It's, uh, I would, I remember the first time I saw that one, pretty darn good. And let me just show you some images uh, that we'll go through more tomorrow, but um, I was just processing them right now. Let me just put this in presentation mode. Sorry, forgive me. I'm just, yeah, I'm using a screen on a screen and there's a big reflection here. Let's, how, how, how can I do this here? <laughs> okay, let me um, go back here. Okay, so if we go. This, this was done with a smartphone. Um, so that's, uh, you can actually see the central star and then, oh, there we go. And if I go to uh, my latest astro imager, see, so this is um, with my ASI uh, 294 and uh, you can see a couple more stars. But what's interesting is when you see those two stars on the Southern part and you see this bright crescent, it's a really nice uh, nebula right. to, to look at. If I go back, to the uh, smartphone image. Um, all right, zoom. I don't know if you can see that now. There's lots of interlacing, sorry. But basically what it looks like visually is imagine uh, this shape, except more like a gray patch. You can actually see the outer annular uh, arc there visually uh, with even a smaller scope. So it's a nice little, looks like a nice little puff and it's a very rich star field. So um, anyhow, that's, that's just a little preview. And we're going to look at uh, nine objects, and that will bring us up to 100 objects explored. Uh, oops, let me just uh, flip it around here. That brings us to 100 objects uh, uh, to, to date that we've explored together. So I'm um, sorry for the background and all the flipping around here, but <laughs> I'm just on the road right now. So, so anyhow, so I look okay, forward to... You uh, made it. <laughs> you made it. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> you bet. I am dedicated. I'll tell you. <laughs> so That's very true. I will, um, I will look. Yeah, and I will uh, look forward to sharing and exploring more with you uh, tomorrow on in Aquila. So okay. thanks. Okay. So at at this point, uh, we're going to take another short break, and then we'll come back for the after party. And uh, any of you that are still on with us, presenters, uh, you know, uh, we can have uh, we can share our conversations and and um, maybe some more stories about uh, meteors, falling stars, and bolides. I have a few of them that I can share myself, so I'd love to tell them. <laughs> so, all right, so uh, give us a few minutes here, and, um, and we'll be right back. Hey, Nico, that was awesome. Uh, the uh, I love that, and you know what? You're you're a pioneer. Uh, I think uh, Dobsonians need uh, imaging. Uh, <laughs> they need a, 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 a. Cameron. I think you have so, some issues with your connection. Yes, I I it's like. <laughs> Uh, the the Wi-Fi is going. That capability is fantastic. There's so much I've wanted to, uh, you know, cap. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, give me a second. Okay. Well, it, it was fine. I, I was shaking. <laughs> it was great. Right, huh? Congratulations and welcome to the GSP. Ah, oh, thanks. Uh, like it's not the same uh, to to think what you will to say in English that 
I, I didn't talk in English and for three years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very difficult. But you... Thank you so much. Can you hear me, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, hear you. Yes, we can hear you, camera. Is that, is that better? Yes. Okay, yeah. No, I was just gonna, I was just saying, uh, I, sorry, I was broken up there, but um, I basically, Nico, I tell you, you're a real pioneer. Uh, the Dobsonians really need, uh, you know, this astro, astro imaging and EAA capability. And what you're doing there is, is fantastic. I mean, there's so many times I had, I used to have an 18 inch Dobsonian and, and uh, you know, there was so many times I've wanted to kind of share what I've seen. And uh, now you, you, with what you're doing, that's kind of the, you know, you're, you're really pushing the envelope to be able to do that. So this is awesome. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. And it's, it's a reality that uh, with a with a dog, Sonia, you have more aperture. So uh, I repeat, uh, when I the, when I saw the first time with a uh, stretch an image and and see all that stars, I said, now I can believe it. <laughs> but uh, it's it's really nice. Uh, it's a lot of work to, to get a, a a nice photo, but 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 it's great. Yeah, but you know what you're doing, right? I mean, I mean, I'm I'm maybe getting ahead of ourselves, but guess what? With imagine a tracking mount uh, with dual axis motor and with real time image plate solving or or pu uh, push here a PhD guiding. Uh, that can do what you do without breaking your back. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. So, so you just basically, you, you can just do that. It, it, it's not a very complicated thing to do. You've built the, the pieces to do that. You're doing human, human uh, engine right now. But if you, you know, <laughs> uh, I think we, 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 should, we, should, we, should, we should work on a, on a motor drive system that can do yeah. PhD on a DOB. Yes, I, I, I was uh, reading about that, but uh, I, I do enjoy the, the, the observation. So I am trying to get a, another equipment, uh, a small equipment to, to, to make the, the photos and, and the work with the doubles and variable stars and, and maintain my, my dots. And I, I like to observe and, and hand moving. So I will try to do it both. <laughs> But yes. also, yes. also draw the stars. It, 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 I, I do uh, uh, astronomical sketching. I, I do register the, the observations. And I, maybe I, I will I will prepare a presentation of that and, and to talk with, with, yes. tips, with tips. So uh, about how you can observe on, on a on a city sky and and how to find some objects. Uh, I, I will prepare a presentation for another night. That would be awesome, Nico. That, you're right down the same path that I, I enjoy very much. I, I want to be able to do the same thing. So, uh, in, in it, you know, with, and I, I think with, with the capability of kind of a hybrid where you can do go to and also star hopping, you, do, you know, to override with clutch. Uh, you know, to be, to be able to do that and then do astro imaging to enhance combination, right? You can make it really a very enjoyable experience. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and I, I try Children to do really both. Made a big to enjoy. I, I try to enjoy and I try uh, to, to make uh, contributions. Uh, well, I, I publish my double star measures and I start to try to do uh, an eclipse in binaries uh, but it's a it's a hard work. I I, I get an, an eclipsing variable a, a few weeks ago, but it was three hours taking snap uh, in pictures, moving the dots, on, and it was really complicated. <laughs> so that that is why I, I, I want to get another uh, another telescope to put it to work and and keep enjoying with the dot. Yeah, you you yeah. kind of need. You know, this, this is why you need to try different things because um, what I found, I kind of went through this Nico in the last couple of years here. I used to have, like I say, the large telescope and uh, I, I really, uh, I do like it. Uh, you cannot beat the aperture, there's no question. But, 
but to be able to grab and move uh, a small telescope to the front yard, to the backyard, based on where the planets are or where the comet is, uh, you can't be that, right? I mean, uh, and to be able to quickly uh, deploy it and have a, a go-to system uh, to be able to track, and then also to be able to disengage that go-to system and just do some star hopping. Uh, you need kind of a mix of different things to get the maximum enjoyment, because sometimes you just don't have much time uh, sometimes you want to just relax and have very little technology. Other times you want the technology to be seamless, so it just works, right? So it's uh, yeah. it, totally. it's yeah. it's it's nice to have all these different options available to us now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That, that that's why I do double stars. I just observe. I make a photo. I try to what, what enjoy everything great. and yeah. and and not not center in something. How long have you been doing this? Uh, um, I have my end up and with this camera and making the doubles and photos like, I don't know, maybe uh, less than a year. And before I have another oh. son handmade and I have a, a, another small equipment, but, but uh, you, you enjoy it with different uh, setups, but this dog is, I love it. The, as you say, yes. the, the, upper, the apertures rules. The <laughs> and oh yeah, I, yeah, you know. I, I can observe with the with the ten inch in the city some bright uh, galaxies or some nebulas with using filters. It's, it's really really nice. Yes, yes, that's nice. And then that explains uh, how you can get to, like uh, you can do point two second exposures because uh, with the aperture you get that light you get that signal to noise very quickly yeah that's right yeah thanks camera yeah I, 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 that's why you know you 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 but you all on the flip side you want a wide field as well you want to be able to do that with a wide field so i think um you know, I, I yeah. wonder uh, i'm going to be doing ed80 work uh, you can't beat that with a wide field but from an aperture perspective, that that would be good for uh, for some. But but to be able to do, for example, a hyperstar a system, uh, you know, on a, on an, an eight inch Macassa green or something to get that larger. <laughs> oh, here we go. Sorry. And we're back. Um, so what you've been hearing is. Uh, our, uh, <laughs> our astronomers uh, chattering back and forth about uh, astrophotography. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, Nico, uh, Nico, we're really happy that you came onto the program and shared your work and everything. Maxi, thank you for, um, you know, uh, presenting him to us. So it's really wonderful. Pekka, it's nice to see you on. Uh, how, how's well. it in, in Good morning, Stockholm? Pekka. Good morning, Maxi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Becca, right, sure. Hello, Cameron. Well, this part of our program is Nicholas. the after party. Uh, it's coming on earlier than it has before, uh, which is yeah. which is not not so terrible, you know. So. It's good. We have we have more time. You got a little bit more time. That's right. <laughs> last, yeah. last night I slept three hours again oh, <laughs> because oh, I was planetary oh, imaging, oh, and God. then I was processing. So. Uh, this time it's okay. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 I can handle it. You will, you will handle it. Okay, that's good. That's good. Nice. Nico, I mean, this is just the kind of, this is the, um, you know, we call this the after party because it's it's kind of like you've gone to a star party and, uh, you know, everybody's now hanging out getting a cup of coffee or, you know, uh, you know, it's something something uh, nice to drink and uh he's taking and right talking now. with friends you know so <laughs> and and we are getting you know people chatting with us as well so uh, yeah, that's great that's great mm. wanted yeah. to i wanted to mention something on august 25th uh dr linda spilker uh who was part of the original voyager mission team okay when they <laughs> sent the voyager spacecraft up uh, she she had gone straight from from graduating university to being uh, to working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is the only job she's ever had. Okay, 
So she went to go to work at the Jeff Paulson Laboratory. She gets put on the Voyager team, okay, uh, right away, okay, and uh, and then from uh, you know through her experiences with Voyager, she she then became one of the uh, principal scientists of the Cassini space mission. Whoa, okay? <laughs> right? And so this this woman knows more about Saturn's rings than any person ever, any human in history, okay. <laughs> She had like, uh -huh. I don't know, 200 scientists working under her. Okay. She is now, now that, uh, of course, Cassini had uh, culminated in the, uh, you know, the, them crashing the spacecraft into, into Saturn. Um, you know, it's timely to talk about it right now because the opposition of Saturn and all, but uh, uh, she uh, is now back on the Voyager mission. This is still an active live again still it never stopped it never stopped, oh, it never stopped. okay that's so amazing voyager one and two are now in interstellar space they're out of yes. the solar system okay they're still communicating with with the spacecraft i heard that i don't know it was the voyager one i uh, they lost the signal that's why uh it's a it surprised me, or maybe I, I heard still, wrong. You're still communicating and it, and with spacecraft, yeah. and uh, uh, it's back. you're still getting data. They're still learning about the, you know, beyond the solar system now, you know, and what that that environment's like. And um, so, uh, you know, earlier uh, Libby talked about the pale blue dot. The pale blue dot image was taken by Voyager, and so and Carl Sagan took a lot of uh, he took a lot of criticism from his peers about wanting to turn a spacecraft around and shoot a picture of Earth because they said it had no scientific value okay hmm. yet yeah but, but it's, it's probably one of the most it's important more, it's, it's more it's yeah great. it's probably it's one beyond, of the most important beyond the science of, of yes that beyond. that's right humanity so it's uh Right. So that's uh, so Linda will be on. Uh, she can she worked with Carl Sagan. She she worked with all these people. And uh, so it's um, uh, I am so I just got the email this afternoon, you know, that she's going to come on to our program on the on August 25th, which is a, I think a Wednesday, something like that. So uh, okay. but that is the day. <laughs> that's the anniversary of I think Voyager 2's flyby of Saturn. So oh. she'll, she'll be talking about, I'm gonna to try to get her to talk about the Voyager mission as it is, as it was, and as it is today, and, and you know, some emphasis also on Saturn. So I'm excited about it. I've yeah, seen that, <laughs> Scott, I have seen that Cassini documentary. And uh, in, on she, she, she oh, says- yeah. so, so Linda is on that documentary, she is. Yeah, and she told that every time she looks at Saturn, a part of her is there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's an amazing uh, documentary, and uh, everybody should uh, see that. Yes. They yeah. decided on the last moment that they will crash it. It was not planned from the beginning, mm. but they wanted to uh, to Cassini to uh, deliver the most the last second the information uh, everything to the last breath take so that's yeah, uh, really cool really yeah. cool so yes. if you have questions you, you have any question about saturn or voyager or you know outer planets uh, you know planetary missions these kinds of things oh well uh, probably I, 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 uh, <laughs> you're going to want to send in those questions I imagine there'll be a lot of them. So we'll have everybody send in their questions to um, uh, to Annie and then, um, you know, she can we can prepare those questions for uh, Linda so she can answer them. But uh, it's a rare experience. I mean, this is, uh, uh, you know, to to um, uh, be able to interact with uh, one of these, uh, you know, top uh, scientists in her field. So in their field. 24th or 25th? 25th. 25th. Yeah. I August 25th. Put it on yeah. your calendar. Yeah, I, I'm just opening my calendar. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yes. So what's happening in in um, Stockholm? In Becca? Stockholm, it's uh, quite quiet on Astronomy Front, but uh, I did some solar imaging and mm -hmm. uh, took 
actually one picture of uh, with my iPhone and uh, look at that and, and uh, I have uh, looked sun before as a star but when I uh, took this picture I got really that okay uh, if we just look it a little bit more as a nice. star and this is with my iPhone and with app and this is one twelve thousand of a second and when you get those uh, like you see the sky you see the trees and so on but if you look the sun you can see it is a star and it's so close to us that it's our mind maybe selects it from a star to mm -hmm. sun but if yeah. you begin to look our sun as a star you i think you get closer to the space that i am looking after mm. the totally space but sun is there mm. like something other than a star it don't be belong to the category of star but when you take uh, shots like this you maybe begin to think okay <laughs> we have a star very close star and uh, that could help uh, uh, you do the beginning of uh, of the vastness and uh, how huge the only the our solar system is and we are actually so close to the star yes. as we can and moon <laughs> at the daytime if you want if you look at uh, as different eyes you do at the evening or uh, night you begin to realize that it is something that floating floating there in the emptiness without mm. no trees no sticks holding it so uh, <laughs> it's there and uh, it uh, by 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 himself or herself and um, that's kind of uh, stuff stuff i do yeah when it's not just a photography or something else but uh, that picture of a sun uh, made a huge it not a huge impact but uh, it it uh, touched me and yeah. it's really a star and we why can't we see it at it as a star but the sun Yes, Peck, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because, uh, you know, people, they, you know, they 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 wake up, uh, you know, maybe they wake up before even the sun rises. But, uh, you know, when they see the sun start to rise, they go, OK, it's getting daylight. I got to do yeah. this. I can see that I can do this. Exactly. You know, and uh, and they're they're thinking about about the sun more maybe like as a timepiece or something you know yeah. uh, to source calculate. of light source of, source time. of light uh, 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 what time it might be okay yeah. there, a lot of and people getting, are pretty, pretty getting good. tan making sun uh, trips and so on so it's right. like it's like more that uh, more uh, uh, something that gives us warm uh, health and tan fun yeah. things play around outside right those things but i think that it's rare that you think it's a, like a star yeah, you don't take the leap uh, immediately that this is a no yeah celestial object you know yeah, exactly, and, exactly. And it's, it's a star right they that's that just doesn't that's not your first impression you know and no so, and it's hard to take that step that uh, it's really are a white the fourth star. Uh, you know, Peck, I think this has to do with conditioning. You know, yeah. you talk about people, people uh, often t talk about conditioning and, you know, what our parents teach us, teaches us, what society teaches us, you know, and all the exactly. rest of this. And exactly. um, uh, I think to the important lesson of looking at the sun, uh, one, you know, maybe being grateful to the sun for yeah. all the things that it's giving us because, you know, the earth is a, 
I mean, you can think of it as a child of, 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 of this star. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, just, because, just to take a few minutes and think about you're flying around this, this star at the perfect distance that su- this star is flying through space through the arm of the Milky Way and the Milky yeah. Way is flying through space to a, you exactly. know, yeah. the Andromeda galaxy and stuff, you know, all this, this, uh, this. Because there could be a civilization and one, let's say any one uh, thing is looking our sun yeah. our star as we look their sun exactly right, right? so they, they, there is yes. that, co- that connection it's hard to think but when you get that you've realized that the, the distances and and the whole whole mechanism in that the vastness and and it it, it it's more fun to, to do astronomy when you realize that uh, we have a connection and we have a really near connection that the star, uh, our sun probably uh, needs a little bit more attention. Yes. Like it is you as know, a star. The, the, the ancient uh, people, uh, like natives uh, in, in America, uh, um, they uh, believed that the, the sun was a god, like the Egyptian, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they uh, adore and, um, and do, uh, you know, what the Inca culture, uh, they didn't sacrifice people and, and something like that, but <laughs> they, um, uh, they follow uh, the, 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 the was the, their religion. But today, uh, the sun the, that uh, uh, everyone see uh, around the world, uh, they they say, okay, like you say, it, it's okay. It's now time to wake up. Now time to uh, go to work yeah. to to go dinner, and it's like more a clock, like. Uh, yeah, yeah, you might even it, hate when you first wake up that ah, oh, you know the sun, yeah. <laughs> in my eyes and, right? You know this kind of feeling. But yeah, uh, I w- I like right. when I when I go to work. Uh, uh, I go in almost uh, eight uh, a.m. and now I see that the sun rises uh, when I uh, passing by through. Uh, uh, um, a yard where I do people sports, the yeah. the sun comes up. But uh, in these days, the the, lo- the the moon, la luna, uh, is very uh, romantic moon mm. because yeah. uh, uh, contrast with the di- deepest blue sky, no darkness, and uh, when the sun comes up. They uh, put that uh, little uh, pink uh, uh, color and that briny white uh, light uh, reflecting of the surface of the moon uh, gives a, a, a perspective that you you know um, you don't you don't hope to see it at the morning. Yeah, you you, you relation the, the moon in the night. Uh, yeah. and and the, of course the sun on the day but uh, it's not like a star it's a moon it's a satellite so yeah, max you have a point there because when you see moon at the daytime at the blue sky it's something that not belong there mm-hmm. it's something something my mind is telling that okay there that shouldn't be there <laughs> that round thing floating in the blue sky. Yes. It should, it should it be there? The only sun should be there. So that's why I, feel, I when I look moon at the daytime, I usually then only do visual between my eyes because it's so magnifying uh, feeling. Or binoculars, not often with scope, but it gives different content to how can it float there with no visible sticks or treats or something it is only there mm-hmm. at daytime 
Yeah. And there should I, that be. <laughs> I think if we I, saw I, like I, some sort of structure holding up the moon, yes, we would yeah. be yes. far more surprised. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really love to, to observe the, the moon uh, on the day. And according to that you said before, uh, I think that we we used to, to look uh, beyond and we forgot about the sun and about the moon. Yes. And and when you see it uh, on the sunset or, or or a sunrise, and and you keep uh, thinking that, whoa, that's the moon and that's the sun, and and you you know that we forget it. Why we forget that we, yeah. we look at beyond, but this yeah. is incredible. They are too often I, there. They are I, too often I, I, we see them. <laughs> yes, I like to use the moon like a perspective way to see another planets and you know uh, i remember the star wars movie and star trek movie and when you see uh, the planets and everything you know, you know oh look at those planets. well you have it in the sky in the night and or yes. the evening or the afternoon and when you have the moon you see the moon but the more beyond is maybe venus for example and you with your mind you can do a three-dimensional yeah solar system yeah. Uh, yeah and but in a realistic way not in a program or a software or something like that no 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 uh, and that's uh well i i love it when i do that <laughs> yeah because that it's the that you leave you on the earth on mm -hmm. your balcony or on your where you are but you let your imagination just fly there and look it from the thing from different uh, angel uh, uh, from direction and that is what I just like need <laughs> mm -hmm. and that feeling is something I just work on all the time to get that feeling more clear more yeah. more powerful for me and just to realize that the sun I begin to uh, like uh, pull myself all the time that sun is the star it nothing that gives me tan or that I, I do have to avoid it now but uh, yeah uh, yeah it's a really star that somebody else look at that star from their perspective but we are taking that for anything but not star Right. You know, the idea that the sun was a star is only about uh, 2,500 years old. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, um, some of the earliest uh, ideas put forward was um, there was a Greek astronomer or maybe thinker. His name was Anaxa Anaxagoras. Uh, Anaxagoras. Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, he, he, he first proposed that the sun was uh, like a fiery stone and that, uh, you know, and that it was only, you know, it wasn't very big, like a, maybe a few hundred miles in, in diameter, okay? Uh, and that the other, the other suns, okay, uh, were also the same thing, but they were too far away, so we couldn't feel the heat from them. You know, how, how correct he was, okay? Yeah, he was wrong exactly. about the size, wrong about the distance. You yeah. know, but he had he had basically the idea, you know, um, you know, not not a stone, but, uh, you know, the, again, there was a lot to be still worked out. Uh, and then it was like, uh, what, 700 years, no, about 200 years ago or 200 years past that, uh, Aristarchus comes up with a similar, um, you know, proposal. And then it's Ptolemy, okay. So like, you know, 200 years goes by and another couple of hundred years goes by and then hundreds of years more go by. Okay. A lot of, a lot of war happened in that time. <laughs> Today we have a solar probe. Yeah. Close so between system. Ptolemy and a guy named Copernic, okay, no, Copernic yeah. lives in the 1400s, okay. Uh, but in 1543, he... Just before he dies, he he publishes a book called uh, uh, De Re Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, in which he proposed, you know, sun-centered solar system, 
And then you have Giordano Bruno, Italian uh, philosopher, and then, and then comes Galileo, okay, uh, and Kepler and Huygens. And, and now, you know, and now we, we go all the way up to the Parker Solar Probe, okay? Yeah. We're going, we're flying to the sun, all right? Yes. <laughs> and it made, it's, I think it made already the speed record, by, uh, or it's going to be, like 520 kilometers per hour. Wow. Whoa. The solar probe. <laughs> Going crazy fast. Yes, it right. has already gone for 365,000 kilometers per hour, but it's, it want to speed up more. And it, it is so close, son, that... <laughs> so you're going to burn your fingers if you go <laughs> there and touch it. <laughs> <laughs> And do you think that those the, the sensors? Other, yes. Let's go ahead, Maxi. No, I, I will uh, do a question of um, of what we're talking about to, tonight. Uh, if anyone saw a fire fireball uh, at the uh, daylight, I haven't seen. I have seen a uh, lightning. I ball. have not. I've seen video. I've seen video of it in daylight, you know, yes. but I've not myself seen uh, my my. Uh, uh, I don't know anyone else here see see a, a meteor. I have seen a light, light, I, I have I did, lightning ball. I okay. I, I, see, I saw it too, but at the night, no, at the at the daylight. I yes. think that that uh, we are watching up on night. <laughs> yes. maybe we didn't well, see another day. about the Chelyabinsk uh, 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 meteor that that uh, you know it was a small asteroid that fell uh, in Russia. And, yes, uh, that was definitely seen in the daytime, and we got lots of video of that. You know, so um, it got brighter than the sun. So it was uh, uh, you know an amazing uh, experience. I think. Um, it was pretty cool too because David Eicher showed us some uh, when he was showing his meteorite samples. He has a sample of this meteorite. So, Whoa. yeah, that's very, a That's a satellite. You, you showed uh, Scott this. Um, uh, it's a Finnish satellite that hmm. uh, recorded that uh, transit that you have in the uh, opening uh, scene. Ah, you know very the cool. Su Su Suomi. Uh, satellite. Right. It's a Finnish satellite. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh. So we are up there. <laughs> yes, you guys are up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. But uh, the Perverance has a uh, Finnish humidity sensor on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are also in Mars. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so next time, so, guys, uh, you've gotten Mike Overacker has been uh, uh, chatting uh, in here, and I think you've been talking to him. But uh, he says you fired up my interest in using my big scope. He's got a big Dobsonian for more than just astronomy outreach. I never thought I could get images like you, like you get. Now I know better. Yeah, so, no, uh, he said that he has a, a fifteen-inch uh, dub. Yeah, and Big no one. I, I I didn't think that before. Also, I, I what, just. What size is oh, your Dobsonian? Yeah. What? What size is your telescope? What's it's your... A, a a ten inch. Ten inch? You say? Yes. Ten inch. Wow, spectacular! I don't know when you. You want to go do it too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if he has a bag. Uh, hurts uh, the back when he's uh, moving the Dobson with the 10 inch. I don't know if you have a 16 inch or something like that to move it, but no, that's uh, <laughs> that's very difficult because the, um, they have a, a a long focal too. So yes, if you if you are looking at the the ocular, you you need to move. Uh, I I think that 10 inch is is in the on the limit that that you can handle with, uh, while you are observing or, or mm -hmm. trying to make a capture. Maybe a, maybe a 12, but it's bigger, the complicated. A bigger aperture oh, always makes it more complicated. 
also, and also, more, also more also more light. Mm. <laughs> I'm curious. Do you have any issues with coma or anything like that with a shorter focal length? Because you said you were going for wider fields. Um, I have a. I have a little coma when I, I, I'm observing, or if I put a, a, a reflex camera, you can see the coma on the borders. But I, as I work with a, with a small size uh, sensor, uh, it's imperceptible. Uh, mm. you, you cannot see that. that that's, uh, that's good uh, and bad because I, you have uh, too much magnification. So there is, they are nebulous that, that can fit on the screen. But, for the other hand, I have no decoma effect, and, and that's great because I, I don't have to buy a, a coma reducer. <laughs> I see, yeah. <laughs> so you just go in towards the middle, right? Yes. All right. Hmm. Hmm. So maybe next Global Star Party, we all show our Dobsonian astrophotographs. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That would be good. Uh, one, one night, I, I couldn't, I could, I will be with my dog on the, on my backyard, and I yeah. show you a live. <laughs> that would be great. That'd be great. Yeah. So, Nico, tell us more about yourself. You, um, uh, you're a musician. Are you still performing now? Um, I now I'm performing, but with my friends. That's uh -huh. uh, to play because uh, now I'm married, I have two childs, and uh, not that easy. Mm -hmm. So now, now I, I do it uh, for the pleasure of play. Yeah, sure. Right. Oh, that's great. And uh, and how do you know Maxi? Well, I know Maxi um, because a, a Facebook uh, group. Of, okay. He calls uh, the Astro Amigos in because we live uh, really far uh, what are maxi uh, 150 kilometers maybe more uh, maybe. maybe more yes so yeah. we, we meet in person a few times just uh, one or two nights uh, mm -hmm. with the scopes and we travel together to the to the last uh, sun eclipse uh, that was really fun that was great. two days, two days uh, driving <laughs> with no sleeping, and yeah. was, was amazing. We, like you know, uh, a thousand and forty four hundred kilometers in two days. <laughs> and also with the walkie-talkie. Uh, we we both we both uh, we walkie-talkies to talk in the cars. That uh, was really funny. Really, I imagine. That's great. Yeah, uh, Nick, you, uh, Maxi, you, you have to show me then uh, Brazil a little bit more. No, Argentina, when uh, it's allowed to travel as uh, normal. Maybe uh, I come to Argentina also. Yeah, yes, <laughs> when, when it comes to get normally, of course, you are invited, like everyone. Uh, Today, flights is uh, like, uh, it's hard to find any flights to states. Okay, there are flights, but uh, it's uh, very. Is very it hard difficult to right now, Pekka, to get a flight to the United I, States? Yeah, I just uh, look for a flight, and uh, uh, SAS one fly, uh, those biggest are flying, but it's like 19 hours flight. You have uh, three or three ah. changes, and yeah. uh, and so okay. uh, it. it like if you want to fly from Stockholm to Springdale, Fayetteville, it's yes. first it's a change in Miami, then change in Charlotte, oh. and uh, it's like wait, waiting five or six hours, <laughs> so a 19 hours flight. So just fly <laughs> to Dallas and I'll come and pick you up. Okay. Yeah, this, we have a we have Finnair, I think, flies from Stockholm direct to Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dallas yeah. is about a five hour drive from here. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can could maybe rent a car. I not, I, I like to have oh, yeah. an American car under <laughs> and drive <laughs> and see some uh, American views also. So that's my target. So uh, let's awesome. see. Yeah. Awesome. I, 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 I need to come to the States very soon. <laughs> very soon. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, 
Fanal, uh, you have um, you've given some really great presentations. Uh, what what was you know what was your original inspiration? I mean, you you know, a lot of young people might be interested in something, you know, but not very many people that are interested in something go and give presentations on something. Okay, so how did you get started with uh, presenting your material? Uh, you know, I, I can get why you were interested in astronomy. And, you know, I can really see you've really taken off and run with it. But uh, when did you first start giving presentations? And why? Why do you like to do it? So I first started in April. Of course, I'd been in, in, excuse me, into amateur astronomy for some time by then. And it was in January of this year that I joined the Astronomical League. And, you know, it was over Christmas break. I'm looking at uh, things to do and things to grow in the hobby. Mm -hmm. um, the way I'd typically done my observing before is it was mostly visual. And I find a list of objects in a planetarium program that I just thought were interesting. And I'd go out and observe those. And, and it got a little boring for me after a while. I found I was burning out. I wanted some goal. So I looked into the league and I see the, one of the first programs that they had, the observing programs, was the lunar program. And I thought, well, I've already got the observations for that. I'd gotten plenty of pictures, plenty of notes and sketches. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to the program director, who was Chuck Allen, yeah, and, and submitted things. And we went back and forth. He said, you know, I'm here if you need anything, if you have any questions about astronomy or, or things you're interested in. And I said, yeah, actually, I am. So I'm interested in sharing this message of, of getting youth into astronomy. This was about maybe 18 months after I'd started the club at the high school. Yeah. And he said, um, oh, I, I have so much to tell you here. And he told me about uh, growing up in Louisville and the presentations he gave there and uh, some of the connections he had. Yeah. And through there, I came to uh, speak at Astronomical League Live. Uh, that was their April edition. Right. And then uh, GSP after that, he he invited me on and uh, you were gracious enough to host me. And and, and, and since then, oh, sure. so I found it's been really fun to to speak about it, not only about the outreach, but I found with uh, the themes that we do, like comets or meteors, I get to look into my images and share them with people or mm -hmm. I get to learn about a subject in order to teach about it. I think that's a really good way to learn uh, just on my own. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, especially since you sent that email earlier this week about how wide our reach has been with, with so many viewers and so many shares and all of that, right? Uh, that really makes it worth worth doing. And, and uh, that's Social media me has really been a great platform to do astronomy outreach on, you know, so especially during this pandemic, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, every once in a while, as I'm putting together the programs and everything, I think about all the people that are still stuck at home, okay, still, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's still the, you know, the danger of going out into uh, the world and, and, you know, perhaps contracting uh, COVID-19. And so it's, uh, mm -hmm. um, it's something that uh, you know I'm 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 concerned about. Uh, I'm not as freaked out about as when it first happened. You know, uh, we've I think a lot of us have learned to live with this uh, deal. And I you know I, I went and got I couldn't wait to get vaccinated, so I did. Um, but uh, you know, still there's uh, you know with the variations of the the you know the virus and all the rest of it it's it's something that uh, we're still dealing with you know so um but i'm glad i'm really glad that you guys come together uh with us and and uh and make what global star party is you know because it's it's nothing without all the presenters you know so you know scott i i thought today already uh what you have built it's not just a, a show or or a global star party. I think it's more like an almost an institution. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's I a, think it's more a international community of astronomy. I yeah, think. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's it's, that's what I'm trying to. It's something uh, huge. It doesn't it doesn't take a lot. I mean, it, there's of course work and in, in doing all of this, but but. Uh, uh you know it it doesn't take a lot of convincing to get amateur astronomers who 
love to do outreach to, yeah. you know, to come out and share their passion, their love for the sky, their knowledge, you know, and all the rest of it. I mean, I, I wish I could, I could be putting people to the eyepiece, you know, and letting them, uh, you know, look through my telescope too. But, uh, um, but this is for me, the next best thing. Actually, it's not even, it's, it's its own thing now, you know, when I used to think it was really kind of second to doing, um, you know, in-person astronomy, but now it, it really has become, uh, you know, something quite on its own because, I mean, we have people around the world right here, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're on That's one right. side of the planet, Maxi and Nicholas are on the other, I'm on this side with uh, Connell and, and Cameron's on the, on the um, West Coast over there. So, you know, I, I think we it's... have, we have, uh, an audience that watches from around the world so it's it's really cool you know that's and that's right impact. that's right i think that that it's uh it's really cool to as you say that we we met people that we will not see in a in a presidential cell party and we share different experiences and yep you, you are talking to to Connell, uh, and i really like the his presentation because uh it inspires uh, another to, to take a look and observe things that people maybe doesn't know. And there is some, uh, uh, always, always is someone that say, hey, I can do that with, because yeah. I can do it with my eyes, I can do it with a binocular and maybe with a telescope. And I think that that's great. I think so too. I think so yeah. too. It's gonna be like uh, 20 centuries Dallas or bold and beautiful show that's going on and uh, the, only the actresses and actresses changes but the, <laughs> but the, the story goes on that's on true and on. Yeah, true. that's mm -hmm. true so uh, you have built something very huge and very good scott this is uh, like a, well, uh, a gift okay. for yeah, you, for amateur astronomers. Thank you. You're very kind, Pekka. Yeah, but no, that comes from heart. And I, this I, is, uh... I think in the maybe last year or, or in the beginning of this, I never thought I would be talking in English to other another persons in oh, the world. Right. <laughs> and now I'm sitting in my house talking with Pika in Stockholm. Uh, you yeah, yeah, you know, when I was first time, I was like uh, walking on the uh, hot stones, you know, nervous as a... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and Patrick, like, you said that you told me that you really did not speak very much English until you no, no. started coming had, into the Global Star Party. So. I had a post almost 20 years. I listen, I read, but yeah. not spoken for 20 yeah. years. It's a long time. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, if you play up this first, <laughs> you can see how nervous I was. It was like a oh, for me. Like I, a, I understand you. <laughs> were you nervous? <laughs> Nico, we were, you didn't seem to be nervous at all. So no, I was. I was uh, made shaking because uh, it, yeah, it, I, I, I will know typically speaking English. So you oh, think yeah. about, you hear about, and you think of what you are going to say. But when you tell, when you need to speak, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I know when you're speaking in a different language, many people first off think in their own language and then they think about how they're going to say it. Exactly. Way. exactly. Way. It's like you yeah, can't just part. come out yeah. and say it, right? So, yeah. Right. It's, and uh, it's, it's so, easier to, to start talking and to correct because if you think too much, uh, it's confusing. Right. <laughs> I, have, I have worked in other countries before and uh, uh, mostly in Asia, you know, China, uh, Taiwan, uh, some a little bit in Japan. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that for anyone to speak more than one language, you know, m most people in the United States, honestly, most of us only speak one language, you know, you go to other countries, though, and you have people speaking two, three, four, sometimes five languages, you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, I was always really impressed with that. Um, 
And I always tried to, uh, when people wanted to speak English with me, I always tried to make them feel comfortable because I can't speak their language, right? I could yeah. speak some words or something, but so I'm always really grateful that uh, people want to uh, try their English and, and speak with me, you know, so I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's right. It, it's cool to try to speak because we share a different countries, cultures, experiences, yes. everything. And so it, it, it's really nice. Yeah, and that makes it really interesting. You know, the fr the fraternity or this, this, I think we all feel it, you know, that uh, all of us that are involved in astronomy, we know that we have this common thread. We have this bond, okay? And this yeah. bond is not only between us that are living, but this bond goes back a long, long ways, you know, to all these astronomers that we read about and stuff. And, and um, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that first thought of this, the sun being a star, can you imagine Pekka, that, that guy must have been thinking just like you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, this is not just something for me to tell what time it is or yeah. that it's time for me to go to work or this, but this is like you, this fiery thing in the sky, you know? Yeah, yeah. And those other things are also fiery things out there too, far yeah. away. Far you know? away, so yes. he, he, His mind must have just been blown, I mean, yeah. you know, at that time, so. Uh, that's so cool and the cool thing is that, that we speak the common language yes. when we discuss and we have, we realize that somebody says one word and we are there Even instantly if somebody says orion nebula we are there <laughs> instantly mm -hmm. and uh, that's so wonderful to share the feelings not just the me mechanical and the results and so on but the feeling, how do you feel when you look at that and how do you make up in your mind the scenarios about Saturn rings and so on, that we feel differently, but uh, we are looking for the same feeling in the, in the last point that we really feel that. Yes, right. Something I yes. do wonder sometimes. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Talk, talk, talk. Oh, all right. Go ahead. Uh, well, well, something I do wonder sometimes is we, we were talking about the Greek astronomer who first uh, theorized that the sun was its own body and, and it gives us all the things that it does, just like the other stars in the universe do. But I wonder if, if we're doing our own version of that continually, because when we look in our eyepieces, uh, we might say, well, that's a gray fuzz in the shape of a circle, or this one's an oval, this one's a stick. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, there is that. And it would be pretty boring if that were the case. But when you understand that you're looking at a galaxy or a planetary nebula and you look longer and you sketch and you write and you tease out these details, that becomes something really special because you're uncovering the nature of the object and That's not right. just looking at it for the, the pure photons that are hitting your eye and just saying, well, that's what I'm seeing uh, without understanding. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's I think, like I think the same. In, uh, sorry, Pekka. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and and I, I love to to learn uh, and research of uh, what uh, what the object I am observing, because I think that we observe the time. It, it's a time machine. The ocular is a time machine, and that's great. And that uh, there is there is not just point just dots uh, on the telescope. Uh, is uh, you are looking a million years ago. It, that's that's blow my mind. Yeah, yeah. it's like a, a, it's like a, trying to find a tree in the forest. When I when looking for galaxies or so on, uh, if you think that uh, okay, that's a forest, but where is the trees? Yeah, and and you just like th go in deep in that. That there is our suns. Our sun is one of those hundred billions of suns there in that forest. When you think the galaxy, that there is 250 billion trees. <laughs> so that makes wow, <laughs> like spin in your head. 
right? In, tr in trillions of forests. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. So that's make uh, the vastness uh, of the space. A, a question, somebody's watching here, his name is uh, Reza uh, Matori. And the question was, is with which telescope, he wants to know the brand and the model, can a beginner never go wrong? Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Nico, Nico's answer is pretty good. Uh, he says, I think there is not wrong equipment. And the best is the one that you can use every day. That is actually the, uh, an excellent answer, you know, because yeah. uh, it, you start somewhere. You, you think, Risa, think of, of uh, you're about to embark on a journey. You know, like uh, like you're going to go hiking or you're going to go uh, on a big adventure and you need gear, you need some equipment to go along with you. All right. Uh, and so uh, uh, the thing that you're going to be going after because you want to see. You want to see distance, you want to see detail. OK. Um, and there may be many things that you want to do, but I think that you know, Nico and Maxi and several others have been on this program have shown that you can take very basic equipment and do all kinds of things with it. You know, like the, I mean, Nico showed us beautiful images of planets, uh, deep sky objects and all the rest of it done with, you know, his camera, a, a modest camera and his 10 inch Dobsonian. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. But, um, I'm, go ahead. Uh, I remember and say uh, everyone every time someone asks that you know, or use that question. It's that a common question. I, yeah. I started with a very small scope, and if you go to a dark sky, there is no bigger or smaller scope. The, the important is you can bring it that scope, and you can. That's right. It's portable or, enough that you can take yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, it's it's more useful a small car than a big plane. So. Right. <laughs> That's right, you know. And I, I think also that uh, uh, that begin with something that leaves you something to reach to. That you there is that uh, small spark all the time. That can I reach more? Can I can I reach more? A little bit more. Hmm. And how far <laughs> can I go? with this equipment so yeah. there is all, always that spark that that fuzzy thing on the sky i need to see more and detailed but I, I i keep this one because it has to be something that you can use quite fast that it's not taking you half an hour to set up and begin to observe that it's ready in quite a few minutes let's, let's let's take you as an example pekka you have your observatory set up on your patio okay it's yeah it's right there okay and it's yeah, always it's, set up it's always yes. set up it's always ready to go yes right yes and that, uh, that, that is uh that's another aspect of uh i need it about astronomy do astronomy where you are okay exactly exactly because you have to I, wait for a perfect night and you have to travel far distances and you have to carry a big telescope okay uh that that experience on that one weekend on a moonless night in some super dark area might be amazing and you may never forget it but yeah. exactly. you're only doing it <laughs> one or two nights a month exactly best okay yeah that, so that's why we talk, always really is how often you do it right so. i i saw when i had to make everything all set up every night when i wanted to or photography or visual then i decided after i got this msro time with cherry mm -hmm. i decided no more no more th things to put up and so on so i did a remotely observatory now i just have to attach my scope push the on off pattern uh, connect my cameras that's it i can do visual i can do astrophotography from my room from your that's room right that that's why we talk uh, sometimes with nico because he has a Dobsonian and he always said to me hey okay I'm, I'm going outside and in maybe five minutes he 
put <laughs> his, his grab <laughs> and start to watch and everything. And yeah. I have to design the equipment, put it on the backyard, put it on uh, alignment, uh, the, 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 the weights and everything, uh, calibrate uh, the focus, calibrate the... Ah, I have maybe one hour, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And the collimation, the, the focus, uh, see if, if everything okay. And then I will start to do some pictures. He even, <laughs> no, he, when I start, he says, okay, I finished the list of double stars that I have to do. Now I'm going to watch. Oh, you, you need a dog. You need a dog. <laughs> you know, I would also suggest to anyone looking to get a telescope would be, I'd actually say, uh, get binoculars first. Because it is very exactly. hard to tell someone. They are telescopes. It's two telescopes. Yeah. You know? Two, two, two right. together. Right. Hmm. Because, you know, um, when someone asks me, I want to get a telescope, which one should I get? You know, I always follow up with, well, well what are you trying to do? Because it really depends. But binoculars um, do suit themselves more to a, a good blanket answer. They're great tools for um, building up foundational skills. If you want to do planets and watch conjunctions, you can see some deep sky objects. You can watch satellites. There's really a lot you can do. And then they're also small enough and, and portable enough. You can put them in an overnight bag. Uh, you can take them camping. You can walk right outside if you have school or work in the morning or whatever, in my experience. Um, they're great on a tripod. You can use the same tripod for a camera. But they're a very basic element that I, I think everyone here would say is, is like a Swiss Army knife in the astronomer's toolkit. It, it is. It, 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 binoculars right. are something that every astronomer should own. You know, so I have always my binoculars, even if I do something, I have it always be, uh, beside my telescope, just while I'm imaging, just looking. Or with uh, if I don't use binoculars, I have always I can watch uh, the imaging from my uh, from my screen. So I do same time I do a little bit visual and uh, photographing. But mostly today I do visual only from hmm. my remote comp uh, from my uh, remote. I just I watch the sky, moon. Sometimes I take some pictures, but uh, it's so fun when we done, did that with Cherry MSRO uh, uh, telescope. Yes, the visual is it's so amazing because you can just just wherever you go, want to go, there is no just the target, just point it somewhere and just uh, look at that and enjoy. Right. And use the amplification of the, yeah. the optics and the camera to let you visually see, right? Yes, yes. That's right. right. That's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, guys. And I, I'm going to bed because I need All right, Nico. <laughs> Okay, you take care. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nico. Thanks for everyone. You're welcome. You're welcome to come back on Global Star Party anytime, every time, if you like. Yeah, and, I love it. I will love it. Thanks, Nico. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, Nico. Thanks, Nico. Have a night. Good night. Nico, Nico, un so. Great meeting you. Un so. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Wise uh, says, my advice is not to get a giant SCT on a poor tripod for the first scope. I did. Oh. And it sent me back a year as far as, as a enjoyment of my equipment in the night sky. It was the exact opposite. It was the exact opposite way to start, you know? So um, I've seen that many times, Jeff, where people bought uh, it maybe too much telescope to begin with, you know, uh, cause they're so enthusiastic. Um, you know, but, um, uh, and I've, I've seen them go all the way from, you know, maybe having, you know, a 20 inch or 25 inch telescope, you know, they get aperture fever, they want more and more. Yeah. But then, you know, that heavy, big telescope becomes too much of a labor, you know, Excellent. and they stop using it. And, uh, you know, they maybe only go out a few times a year, you know, and then maybe only a couple of times a year, and then maybe not at all uh, for a year, you know, and it's sitting in the garage or whatever. So it's important to have something that is portable enough for you to really do, use all the time. I mostly use my ED80. <laughs> I have I have scopes, but 
that little uh, you like that one huh yes <laughs> it's something between everything it's like a, it's uh, it's just uh, fits for everything to mm-hmm. have a wide field it has a good quality of glass you can do full fo- uh, moon photography solar everything deep it's sky just, yeah, yeah deep sky so it's it's most used scope in my park. So I would so say it's it's in the, it's like binoculars. It's like the next, yeah. the next essential uh, gear. Yeah, an ED eighty. Yes, or something like it. You know, so right. There's there's many small telescopes out there that you can look at, um, and uh, you know the. Uh, the ED80 uh, for me is something I, I also like to to have in my my arsenal, you know. So yeah. I think that for me personally, what I like to have is um, uh, you know an astrograph that's all set up, you know, with yeah. uh, cameras and everything. And then I like a Dobsonian, you know, because I like to I like to push a telescope and uh, and just find stuff, you know. And then, uh, and a pair of binoculars and that yeah. with those three pieces of equipment, that's, that's, that's everything for me, you know? Yeah. So, but, uh, the other essential piece of equipment for me is the community of, uh, of astronomers. I love going out with, uh, groups of people and, uh, observing the sky. And so, uh, it's for that reason that I like to put together events and, um, um, so, you know, I, I am really looking forward to, uh, uh, next year's events. When I take people to Mount Wilson observatory, we'll use a really big telescope. You don't need to bring yeah. one. A 60 inch telescope will be enough. Just to <laughs> see the do. telescope is enough for, for someone. Like, but make sure you bring your camera, make sure you yeah. bring binoculars, you know, yeah. a red flashlight. You're going to need all that stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, you'll you'll get to experience what it was like, uh, what it is like, to be one of the Mount Wilson astronomers. You know, so and at the end of it, we give you a certificate. You know that you are uh, a Mount Wilson astronomer. We have part of the observing staff sign it. Okay, so it's it's authenticated, and uh, uh, so it's. Um, you know, you get to you get to join the legions of uh, astronomers that included Hubble. Uh, Shapley, uh, you know, Bada, uh, you know, all the great astronomers you can think of uh, from that era, you know, also shared that, uh, that glass. So, you know, and, and that sky. So, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to do it again. It's going to be must see event. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Just That's to see right. the scopes. Yes. It's, in, it's enough. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it is wonderful just to see them, but uh, to actually observe with them is is even better, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. And come home to eight inch and uh, ed eighty can be a little bit frustrating. <laughs> well, you'll be amazed how well a small telescope performs after using a yeah, telescope like exactly. that. You know? so, yeah. Um, uh, on one such occasion, we were using the 60 inch at Palomar Observatory, the, the Oscar Mayer 60 inch. And I had my 13 inch Dobsonian just outside, just outside the dome. And uh, we were looking at all kinds of stuff. And part of the ob- observation was to look at uh, the Andromeda galaxy with the 60 inch telescope. Now, the field of view is so tiny, very small, you know. Yeah. And so when we looked at Andromeda, it just looked like we were looking into a fog bank. It looked like fog. It didn't look, you know, you couldn't see spiral structures or anything like that. When I got back out with my 13 inch, of course, there was Andromeda with spiral arms, you know, looking spectacular. So there are times when uh, smaller telescopes uh, can give you a view that's far more satisfying than a big scope. Less is more. Less is more. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Hmm. Yeah. So let's see. Do we have any more um, comments, questions? Martin Eastburn wanted to caution you about those long flights. They're really hard on you. I used to fly to southern France or Italy from California. 
then to Korea and Japan. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Flown 23 hours from California to home in mid-Pacific using four, uh, four props. So Jeez. four props. Wow. Okay. That, that was some hard flying. Um, yeah, you want to try to keep those, uh, those stretches as short as you can. Um, and I know what you're talking about, too. I used to fly every two weeks from Los Angeles to Taiwan and back, you know, so <laughs> two weeks there, two weeks back, two weeks there, two weeks back, you know, and so a lot of miles. Um, and the jet lag to fly to oh, and the US. constant jet lag. Yes, that's right. From Sweden to US, it's it's worse than back. Yes, then coming back. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a one day you have to struggle You're messed up <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least one day at yeah least one day. yeah mm -hmm. well great so guys uh do we have any other anything else that you'd like to cover here tonight i don't know <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, okay well i i hope tomorrow uh, well the, the scene was uh five and four and the chess stream was we're going to be three or two is it's very for a, a a planetary season it's very good you know i remember two years ago uh when i <laughs> oh, uh, in, uh, in the winter i think it's better sky than the the summer sky because um the, the cold weather uh, in here in Argentina, we have um, too much uh, wet weather, and sometimes uh, in the in the in the highest uh, um, um, I, I I don't know how to say it in the highest uh, place of chest stream is very mm -hmm. very turbulent. So it's not like in uh, cent Central America. Uh, is they they have a very good thing in Central get, America to, mm -hmm. to get a more uh, um, uh, pictures uh, of planetary images uh, mm. to get more resolution or more details. Mm. So uh, in this weekend uh, uh, and in this week uh, we we are having a very good uh, weather. Uh, very very I, I don't know if it's too much dry but uh, the uh, yesterday I was uh, almost um, 3 a.m and and the scope was uh, dry it, it, it wasn't wet oh, and, and and almost uh, one or zero de degrees <laughs> outside I have my <laughs> my my hand I don't know if you see it's uh, oh, like yeah. injured. It's the cold weather. I I, ha I was uh, outside uh, with my jacket, my hat, and a uh, scarf, but my in my my hand was outside with the mouse because oh. I was seeing the, the the computer and moving the the, the mount uh, <laughs> because uh, I. Uh, I have the the monochrome uh, camera like like Nico. I have to change filter in the wheel uh, uh, in the wheel uh, filter wheel, wheel filter yeah. uh, exactly, and uh, I have to do manually. So oh man, <laughs> I, I had to be there. I, I couldn't be out inside. You can't go so. inside. Okay, uh, to do, to do. Uh, one minute uh, video of, uh, and a half uh, per channel. So yeah. <laughs> I had to change that and start to 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 record. So uh, it's so you had to suffer. <laughs> it it's worth it. It's worth it. It's now, worth you, it. Okay. So do you wear gloves? Do you wear gloves on your hands? I forgot. To, to oh, you wear. forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was very concentrating, concentrating so to, yeah. to say videos that I forgot to wear. <laughs> so, oh no! And, yeah. and also, I forgot to dinner. <laughs> you forgot dinner. Wow! Yes. 
She worked on the day, uh, and when I put my grub uh, outside, uh, maybe it was uh, 10 p.m., and she screamed, Maxi, the dinner! <laughs> because right. I, I was forgotten that I have to dinner. I, I was concentrating, taking pictures, uh, and <laughs> when I come inside, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, uh, I had to hear it. She... <laughs> Oh, it's <laughs> worse. It's worse. Uh, every every time I, I had to wait. Uh, okay, so <laughs> in this night it doesn't happen, but I forgot. I last night I forgot to dinner. Um, so, oh. well. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And she well, didn't have dinner waiting for you, of course. So you know you have to make your own dinner. No, no. She in that time she she waits for me, and that's oh, why she that's was very kind. upset. That's yes. very fine. Yeah. But uh, sometimes, maybe now, I, you have been at eight and she went to bed. And yeah. When she went to bed, uh, don't do noise. Don't, don't, oh, don't make any noise. Don't make any noise. <laughs> don't make any noise. <laughs> because she's, she hears something and, okay, that's uh, maybe Krakatoa, the volcano, it's smaller <laughs> than. <laughs> So yeah. now, now uh, I I love her and uh, oh I know you uh, do uh, I know you uh, do she's a uh, very well yesterday I was yelling with myself with everything and when she went to work uh, she she said to me why well, you have that face uh, mm. and I saw her and I said uh, because I I can. Uh, put it uh, the the collimation uh, okay and she, uh, th she doesn't understand that you have frustrations I, yeah i i was almost three hours outside trying to <laughs> collimate <laughs> no, no. Re really I, I i was very frustrated because uh, i put it uh, all good the, the amount was uh, aligned uh, yeah. uh, very weighted but uh, the pictures uh, I, I I didn't start with Saturn because I have uh, behind the tree, so I I prefer to start to 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 get very very detailed the the the, 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 the equipment. So hmm. <laughs> I. I I don't know. I'm I'm still remembering and I'm still frustrating. <laughs> Even now. <laughs> Even now. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I you know I say okay, that's it. Uh, let's go to take pictures of Saturn. Let's see how it's going. Uh, I don't know. This is a, an astrograph telescope. Mm. It's a short telescope. It, yeah. it, 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 is not prepared to do planetary pictures and maybe that's it that's why i have some pictures very i, I remember the, the the rings of saturn it was over uh, over uh, um, like it was three uh, rings you know three uh, rings. The, the okay three rings above and you know what is going on oh, uh, no. but i figured out that Maybe the scene, and uh, maybe also the aperture. Maybe we'll. Uh, yeah. Maxi, I, I think I think what you need to do is you need to build a permanent setup. Okay, <laughs> you need to have something whether it's on the patio of your house or something, so that you can leave it set up. You can tweak it, get it yeah. better, 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 and then and, and you don't it. have to mess with it. You just go out and turn things on and you enjoy it and then work work around the problems you know if you have light pollution you know get get creative like pekka did you know he was making things to cover lights and <laughs> and shields and these kinds of things to, to so that you know because if you're if you are uh, fighting the equipment mm -hmm. uh, this this takes a lot of the joy 
you guys yeah. are listening in the it, audience who gets very this, angry. this takes a lot of the joy out of of the astronomy you don't you, enjoy it exactly uh i tomorrow you want i will the equipment come. to disappear you want the yeah. you want to know the equipment so well you want it so set up you know and if you're having to bring it out set it up you know it, it, no matter if you're living in an apartment a condo whatever your situation is you can set it up permanently you can yeah you know you may I, not initially think that that's the right way to go but i forbid forbid then everybody nobody had access to balcony and <laughs> i i was almost getting and changed the uh the hand handle when you open the door yeah to code lock so no <laughs> no one can go there <laughs> nobody can so get no one in. can touch your equipment right? yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i I imagine to Pika uh, when invite someone to the balcony, he was covering the, the code. That's got balcony. <laughs> <laughs> so Pekka, can you show? I think you have some photographs of your your setup outside. Yeah, let's can you see. Show uh, some. You can absolutely. you show share some images here? Absolutely. Let's yeah. see where I can find them. Well, you know, also when the 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 difficult part of all of this uh, is when I have to go to bed, I have to disarm everything that I was fighting a lot to put it out together. <laughs> oh, look at that yeah. now. That's a scope, uh, not that one. There's the myastograph. And um, I have uh, uh, an... Uh, Let's see if I can find that uh, with my computer room. <laughs> I have also that one, but uh, let's see where that is. Oh, here we are. Can go through whole thing, so. It's the build of the uh, PC that is the ready setup for my observatory uh, PC. Oh, so, so there is uh, uh, a, a three, mini PC. Yes, three gigahertz hey. mini PC with two hundred fifty-six gigabytes hard disk, and there is a two terabytes hard disk, and this is the five hundred gigs. Uh, uh, dragon traveler <laughs> mm -hmm. so this flies between my main computer in my room and between uh, the setup and there is shuttle with smaller bigger bigger yeah. uh, in all that e equipment we have the same pen drive <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah but i this is the setup for sun uh, oh cool uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, covered with uh, you know with you have you know windshield in a uh, wind uh, we, uh, the car window the windshield for the solar uh, the sun when you park in the, the sunny day you just put it uh, uh, oh that's a very good idea fully very uh, very, uh, very cheaper and a very yes. good idea. But I found that the problem with that was that I lost my uh, connection for everything wi that was Wi-Fi and so on. Ah, uh -huh. because the, the it's like a paradise case. Yes. So uh, let's see. Bring, bring the carton. <laughs> bring the carton. This is the computer room where I have this uh, that uh, so I'm making the cabling. Uh, uh, for uh, that's the final cabling for the computer. So it's fanned for the humidity. That's my 
Uh, like mission control. Look mission at control, yes. <laughs> that is we mission got, control. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to observatories that do not have as many monitors as that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is an iPad also for this, uh, for my uh, sky cams. I have two uh, cameras outside, and it's all controlled by game pad also. That's the cool. Mount. Yeah, the mount. That's very cool. So that's the setup. Oh, you're decked out, Pekka. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's my my observatory that I have built up after I... Cherry's uh, MSRO moment. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I wanted to have something that I, I can do very quickly and because I was starting to avoid to making visual because it takes too long time to make uh, polar alignment and taking mount inside and out. So I needed a, a very uh, fast things that I can just like it takes less than five minutes and, and I'm up and run, running with my mm -hmm. my stuff. So uh, I needed that so I can just, uh, if I see that uh, it's a cloudy night and I see in my uh, forecast and so on that there will be, a, let's say 40 minutes gap, I will take the chance. If there is something I can, uh, mm -hmm. I think visually or photograph, I, it's the only take five minutes to I am up and running that's with cool. everything. See, that's yeah. what you need, Maxi. Yeah, I, I, need. I, I have a question, Scott. I don't know if you, uh, well, maybe of course uh, you know the, the 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 dome of the observatories. Yes, uh, they are uh, semicircular, but also I saw some. Another observatory that the the rooftop moves outside. Yeah. I, uh, I've used both. I've used uh -huh. both. And the advantages of the rooftop, first off, it's a lot less money. Okay, much uh -huh. less money, uh, and you get to see the whole sky. So you yes. can have uh, you can be with your telescope. You see, you know, if a bolide goes overhead, you're going to see it. If you're in an observatory dome, you've got a little slit. Okay, now the the dome makes it is more comfortable, especially when it's cold. Okay, uh -huh. because it keeps wind off of you and that kind of thing. You know, um, but it, it, the dome the, don't produce uh, this. Um, um, of course, uh, if you have a a, a very um, hot uh, weather uh, of, of, uh, for example in summer uh, when you go tonight you have to put uh, that observatory uh, cooled because the the images will be uh, blowed with the heat of the yeah of the of the in, uh, the, the air uh, hot inside of the of the observatory right yes yes yeah. that's right and so um, a roll-off roof observatory cools off faster. Much exactly. Faster, you know, so... Uh, and you can do it with more... Um, you can have material. more telescopes in there. You can have, uh, you know, you can make it very comfortable. You can put a couch, yeah. you can have your stereo yeah. system, your microwave, your little refrigerator, your... Uh, you, you can live there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You Maxi, Maxi, you can also have your stationery with the, I did this from uh, tarpaulin. It's just like uh, 10 bucks tarpaulin that I yes. uh, just uh, folded and uh, taped. So now it's uh, like uh, moisture, rain, solar uh, protection. Uh -huh. And I have a small window. I have a fan also. Uh, on the floor that's uh, get out the, and makes this uh, the air circulation so uh, the moisture is much lower than uh, outside so i keep the electronical uh, out of uh, oh. moisture so. well uh, here in my backyard i have three dogs 
I don't think it's <laughs> it's they are protecting your scope. <laughs> yes, of course. I have my German Shepherd Luna. You know, every time I go outside, she with this cold weather, they sleep with above the the parrilla, the the the, the barbecue place. Yeah. And uh, they have the, they they some um, they couch to to get some rest, but she wasn't outside beside of the telescope yeah. because I was there and she was yeah. freezing, but she was there. I, she doesn't, doesn't mind. <laughs> but yeah, but the are doing your company. I am yes. uh, I am thinking about the dog, but uh, let's see. I want to see somebody sit, sit down and listen to me when I'm doing <laughs> reading something. <laughs> David yes. Levy uses a roll-off roof observatory, and he has two domes on his property. So he's got two observatory oh. domes and the roll-off oh. roof observatory. He uses, he uses the roll-off roof observatory more than the other telescopes, um, but he does use all of them, you know? Uh -huh. But uh, if you want to, you know, if you were to go observing with David, uh, you would definitely see him spending a lot of time in there. When we do the uh, Arizona Dark Sky Star Party, uh, uh, you know, I will talk to David about having, you know, a group of people come and see his setup, you know, because it's it's pretty cool, you know, so. Um, and uh, you know he's uh, he's discovered a comet from this location, and uh, so it's it's a uh, it's a special place, I think. But I think you'll see the advantages of a roll-off roof. Uh, uh, you know that that uh, uh, solves many problems. You know, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I will I will take the, that uh, that advice. And plus, it does not look like an observatory. That's, no, yes. that's another big one, you know. Yes. Sometimes people see an observatory, they go, "Oh my God, there's that guy's got to have a lot of money, and uh, you know, there's got something very valuable inside." Right. Exactly. Right? Uh, this is like more a uh, place like you put your um, uh, tools of the garden or something like that, and no, this is scope. Uh, this is my place. Right. <laughs> yeah. Of course, uh, I, of course, uh, I spoke with my fiance of this in the, maybe in a few years uh, or some years when I have my 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 own house. Uh, I I say to her, uh, I will have my place to put my equipment. Yes, of course, you inside my house. In, no, no, not again. <laughs> you will be outside. <laughs> okay, no problem. Don't bother. All right. That's so right. I have the okay, the uh, entire okay of she. Okay, so <laughs> probably you know, Maxi, you probably don't have to wait. Okay, if if you if you can set up a portable building, okay, mm. uh, and and build it out, and later when you buy a piece of property and you have a house and everything, then you can set a foundation, but. If you keep it portable so that you can take it apart and then move the walls mm. and you know this kind of thing then yeah if it's not too oh. big no yes i i will i will think about it yeah. i will think and you'll be much happier and much more productive you know so <laughs> or maybe a caravan and take the roof off and build a caravan where you have a you right. have everything. You have a small home with you. Just yeah. shield the, the half of the caravan. And <laughs> on the other side, you have a bed. You have a yeah. bathroom, water, hmm. and you can cook some food. But build just to the other side. Take off the roof and make some... I, I saw a I caravan. Have I have planned to, to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, Maxi... What what you and uh, Pekka? That's what, what you're doing right now, Pekka, is uh, is is really good because that system that you're setting up is kind of portable already, right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're you're building all the pieces and all the connections and everything, and then uh, once you do, I'm kind of trying to do the same thing with. I don't have as much gear as you have, but I'm 
starting to build up something so that ultimately, uh, you know, you could make an observatory out of that. So all yeah. the, you know, but but get the telescope, get the electronics, you know, all your cabling, uh, all that set Except- up, and then and then you're then you're good to go. Yeah. And look, yeah, at, yeah. look at this setup right here. This is uh, this is a very inexpensive one. Mm. Some plywood and looks like origami, you know. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, this this one is, uh, um, you know, if you want to get uh, very fancy, uh, you could. You know, people have built uh, small observatory domes like this. But this is uh, that one's a nice little roll off roof. Yeah, that could all be yes. something like that would be great, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Mm-hmm. And it's more cheaper, a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper. We sell uh, Explore Scientific sells domes, but the domes are like three thousand dollars, you know. Mm-hmm. And for a few hundred dollars, you could make, you could start to build a building, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would think about that. And it I, could be to start off just to have walls, you know, so that it, they're high enough to keep the, the wind off of you, okay? Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, you cover them do like Pekka does. You cover the, the, the mounts, you know, and then just bring your tube assembly in and out maybe, you know, something like that. And yes, then, so, some people say that it's better if you have a pier, uh, of concrete uh, or maybe of uh, iron uh, yes. to to put the the mount uh, and because if you is going to be there it's very very um, uh, hard to to move of course and uh, then the 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 tri- the tree part fact that this, this guy sells these observatory sheds on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. I have seen some designs of the roll-off roof, and I don't know how much cost this adds, but if it's not a lot, this could be cool, um, where they'll have the main part of the, the building dedicated to their telescopes and tools, and then there's a little bit kind of cut off with another wall and some insulation where they have a warm room. And I guess this applies more to people uh, maybe up in the north of the country, at, at least in the US. But then they can have all their computers and a couple of reference guides and, and things like that in there. And then everything is just run out to the telescopes for imaging. I've always thought that's, yeah. it, it just seems like the dream, the, the, yeah. you know, the way to go with that. It's like if you have your own place, you know, and of course, uh, I love to uh, to grab the, the equipment outside uh, and start to, to do the alignment, uh, to uh, the, to get focus and everything. But in this time, I think uh, I learned to to try to to get some more time to do some things that mm-hmm. uh, start to. When yes, I, I grab the, the, the equipment, takes me, and of course, I think I don't uh, enjoy it. Uh, and you know, maybe I can uh, very early uh, put uh, start to to make uh, some pictures and also put uh, another equipment very uh, common to do some observations because uh, sometimes I forget to do some observations. I, 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 I'm, uh, how can I say? I'm uh, o- very occupied with occupied. Ha- occupied, uh, taking pictures and see w- uh, what's going on, seeing the guiding, see, yeah. uh, you know, but uh, it's more like, uh, ha- hate and love. Yeah, <laughs> love you know. hate relationship. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But the, you know, Max, the journey to do everything and come to a point uh, 
because I think I did too fast. I didn't enjoy the journey to get them and remote uh. observatory. And uh, because the journey to, to get all done uh, must also be a, a something you should An experience. Enjoy. Yes, An experience. experience. And uh, I'm I'm a little bit packing down down back for the, now and uh, because I did everything too fast and make mistakes and now mm -hmm. I'm backing off and I'm doing my recabling my cabling redone so it uh, will be better and so on so so I think uh, the, uh, everybody do is at uh, own uh, how fast as you like but but I forgot to enjoy <laughs> so I, th therefore I go back a little bit and do it again so I enjoy the, the that's the fun. journey yeah that's you got the it Pekka. you got it you you got it that's exactly the formula yeah yeah you, go, you and there's so many times and you see it time and time again I mean we all do it uh, you, you just buy a, you, you kind of overdose on a whole bunch of stuff yes you you know you kind of overbuy and then you can't really enjoy it fully and then you get yeah. something then you get frustrated because it's not all working yes and uh, so so when you like you say take a take a take another deep breath and and back off a bit and then kind of Restart. re-put the pieces especially if you already have a lot of stuff that yeah. were maybe a mistake before but now you know how to use them more optimum Exactly. And then you can, and then you can say, "Hey, I got some. You got some real treasure, right? You got some really good stuff." Yes. And you yes. can get the max most out of it. It's uh, it's really fun. Yes, Cameron, you are totally right there, and you realize first then when you have everything set, how to use, what scope, when, uh, with what camera. So before I did that, it was totally chaos. I did. I had too many scopes and too many setups and now i began to realize that i can't use that scope with this and that moment you, you know that that happened to me in the solar eclipse in, in december because oh. i i grabbed my my f5 telescope and the max suit of and in my head it was planning all in all the the, the travel, the talking with Nico and, and two friends that uh, came with us. And I was uh, visualizing what I'm going to do. And I did the opposite, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know? And because I, I, no. I, of course, I want to take pictures with the, with the Newtonian, but also I want to take pictures and uh, with the cell phone and do it, do it uh, uh, at the same time, but uh, where the cell phone was remotely and the, the camera was uh, taking manually pictures. Uh, and I couldn't because the, the time runs out. Uh, I, the, the, it was very, very hot. It was in summer, but uh, the, the, the clouds, I remember was very, uh, very they, they were our enemy because yeah. we don't know if we are going to see it or not. And I remember I put the, the AQ5 with the Newtonian and this I say, OK, that's it. It's going. I start to grab the, the Star Adventure with the Maxuto. And when I realized someone sh uh, screamed, OK, it's coming, it's, it's starting right now. And I say, no, I don't. I I have to do something, and I start to do with the Newtonian, and that's it. I put, I leave the the Maxuto right there uh, because I, I don't have that time. And and that's that. And that's are the things when you say you don't enjoy it, and you are seeing a, a, something very unusual. And you have to to think very cold in that time. Yes, it's very difficult. The yes. all the, the things is happening because you know it's it's only almost one panic, time. almost yes. panic. <laughs> exactly. Uh, 
maybe it's like when in the International Space Station is going to, to grab the, I, I don't know, maybe another model, and it's, you, you don't have to do any mistakes. Maybe you don't have any possibility. <laughs> well, in this yeah. case, it's maybe you have someone, but maybe a few years. And uh, when happened the eclipse, you know, it was like put it out of your of your back a, a, a very huge bag of stones out because uh, I remember I uh, I started to cry and everything for some things in, in my family too and I remember uh, see Nico and we both we were crying because the prepar the preparation uh, because we don't know we didn't know if we are going to see it of uh, the pandemic situation uh, uh, we start to to take uh, make plans to say okay we are going yes we are going okay uh, we say some friends to if they can show us someone uh, cannot uh, see where it's going to be to, to rest, uh, see where uh, was the travel, see the places, see the, the permissions, because we have to pass uh, over another province. Mm. And, and we say, okay, if we are going to, to Rio Negro, it's another police department, uh, the, the, the police of uh, the, the road police, uh, the, the, the patrol police. Uh, Sometimes uh, um, makes uh, um, uh, ask you money to pass. Uh, oh, really? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Some corruption. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's in everywhere. But uh, they they say if you have some collaboration to. Uh, for some friends, something like that, you know, <laughs> and, and you say, yes, uh, I have, I don't know, a, a hundred bucks and take it. Okay, going, going. And, you know, it's really, really happened. If hmm. you don't pay me, okay, you have a flashlight uh, that not, uh, doesn't, uh, it, it's on, or you have, I don't know, some uh, problem, some they'll find uh, a problem. They will exactly. find a problem. Oh, the, the fire extinguish is a very a, almost a, a old, you know. Some I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> it's Argentina. <laughs> yeah. There's many countries. <laughs> so. Yeah, yes, but now it's Funny. of course. Uh, unfortunately, you, you know. <laughs> Maxi, I mean, I, I think uh, this is just a byproduct. There seems to be no way, no substitute to getting these experiences, right? You have to get the experience, these bad experiences, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to be able to really know what to do next time. It seems that's the way we learn, right? We have to have these, humans have to have these experiences, you know, to kind of overexert themselves, push themselves to the limit, get frustrated, so that we can learn, right? I mean, it, it would be, there is, there is very, uh, very, uh, and that's where this is, this community is really awesome for the young folks, uh, the young, they can learn from our experiences, uh, you know, and, and, and so the, when they go through the journey, uh, they'll be that much better equipped and, and reduce the frustrations as they go through. Because, you know, and they'll, they'll have their own set of frustrations pushing different envelopes. But, uh, but at least they can, we can get them past, you know, some of the basics, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to pass the torch. You know, sometimes when you say, okay, I, I don't enjoy it, I'm still angry and frustrated, but when the time pass, passing by and you know, oh, how stupid I was uh, and... I, I don't have to do problem with that. Of course, it's very difficult. But when you realize, it's like like you say, Cameron, it's a learning journey. Yes. Yeah. And I think also that uh, we, who has been around with astronomy, 
that uh, the mentorship, if we find somebody under our wings, yeah, um, be like a wingman that we let them do uh, as far as they can by themselves, but be there when it's needed and help them over the threshold, but not giving them too much like uh, hand giving so that uh, they have to experience it by themselves. And when the stop comes, then we are there when needed, like a mentor should be. But the, the only the knowledge that they have somebody to ask when things go not wrong, uh, right. So that would be uh, like a mentorship program that uh, the young ones can just uh, like ask, uh, I live there and there and I do this and this. And then somebody connects them that, okay, here we have one kind of mentor that you can contact. And I, I, I think uh, everyone uh, can grab some uh, uh, no, uh, acknowledge uh, conocimiento, uh, acknowledge, uh, I don't know if it's okay, and but also everyone is not that own uh, of acknowledge, you know, uh, because I give you some some tips, some uh, some steps to do something, but uh, maybe I don't know uh, it doesn't work but you realize that it doesn't work and you can share it. Uh, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to everyone who yeah. can um, uh, um, need it. So, uh, of course, uh, the, sometimes our people that say, no, no, I'm, I'm, pay me if you want to my knowledge. <laughs> uh, I, and I'm not that kind of person because uh, I don't think uh, the, the exploration and the the steps that you did uh, another person will be be doing and maybe is suffering with that and you can help that yeah that's right exactly it's, no, it's, oh, yeah, it's the spirit of amateur astronomers yeah. right there yeah Sharing. it is collaboration absolutely yeah exactly so i don't know it's my Humble opinion of all that. No. Well, there's another I thing can... too. I mean, in the, in this day and age, there there's so much information out there and so much access. I think uh, what's needed more than anything is is more of this type of community. What Scott has uh, created to to help clear to clear this clear the air and and give some guidance and give some direction because it it's a it's a very broad subject and a very broad thing and there's a lot of different directions you can take and and a lot of you know there's tons of information out there uh, good bad and indifferent but it's nice to be able to have this and have real time talking and 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 uh, and and coaching and sharing experiences and mm -hmm. you know uh, i'm sure if you know a lot of the stuff we talk about there there are, are you know there are groups out there if we can reach out and connect that have done some really advanced stuff but they're in an island right they, they haven't connected yeah. um you know and mm -hmm. and and i'm i'm i think i'm convinced that as we get this community we're getting a lot of excellent people with a, a broad range of, of of things that they're bringing to the table which is fantastic and it just gets better and better and that just helps everyone uh, enjoy it more and uh, yes. gives that mentorship at all different, uh, the full spectrum, which is yeah. great. And we can share and enjoy, uh, you know, it's really great. Anyhow, because, I love it. <laughs> because the leap of, from visual astronomy, I felt from visual astronomy to astrophotography, including astrophotography, it's totally new world. It's like gigantic, huge portion of, so high technology and, and stuff and what should go exactly right. It's like brain surgery from 
visual astronomy mm-hmm. when you get into uh, uh, photo- astrophotography. And I was all overwhelmed <clears> with <throat> all data and all stuff to read and all programs to handle and learn. And I almost felt on my knees to go back. But I decided that, okay, I start with my DSLR and only moon. Mm. And I just read about how to take moon photography with DSLR. And when I was like uh, warming clothes, then I took out my my AC120 camera and began to learn how it works. And I didn't know anything about stacking or or process, process HDR process and <laughs> GIMP Photoshop and wavelengths and all that you know levels and stretching and and <laughs> it was like science fiction for me. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. Like uh, you you get hit over the head with that stuff right, right away. That that was the barrier. That used to be uh, even even tougher with uh, with film, yeah. right? I mean, uh, it was it was it was it was too big of a hurdle. I I remember getting a, an astrophotography book and learning about all the ISO and but all that. But if I had somebody, it, it, it's, it's, it's someone then. If yeah. I had someone to tell me then that Pekka enjoy this. Even it hard, even yes. how hard it is, you punch your head uh, to the wall, and you swear that that mount will be on the trash very soon. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, enjoy, <laughs> because you will remember those t- those these days with enjoy and laugh for yourself and how fun it was to learn. And, and that's. And that's the yeah. travel that you, the amateur astronomer do, and has to do, and has to do because uh, yeah. I I think we talk about this another time. But some people, of course, they they offer when they going to grab some equipment, uh, they sell. Uh, okay, that you can. They sell a, a very huge telescope, a very huge mount. And they don't maybe realize how put on uh, alignment. I don't no. know. Uh, or uh, and that start with a, a simple equipment and trying to to get some perfection with a, a simple grab. And then when you say, okay, that's it. I, I this is all I can do with this. I have if I have to go more i will be more uh, if yeah. i'm not I'm, I'm okay with this and and that's it and uh, i remember a, a, and a it's friend. all it's all, yeah. no 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 continue, continue no it's okay it's okay no no I, i was just saying it's all about setting expectations yeah. right and how, <laughs> exactly. how many how many both an equatorial amount when covid came and thought that uh, okay let's let's look something like visual and uh, now when they got the equatorial mouth they didn't understand it how this works <laughs> i have to learn it too i i start with the alt azimuth uh, yeah. amount that has a go to but that go to uh, helps me to know more the 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 sky yeah Because uh, yeah. I re- I remember uh, 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 when I saw uh, I, I don't know a simple star uh, I don't know I even didn't know the name or in what constellation it is and and that equipment helps me to to understand in the passing by of the time uh, the the summer skies and the winter skies. And uh, then, when I say when when I realize that I have I I, I want to do astrophotography, uh, I realize that I have to change the the mount because uh, it. I mean, um, 
stop me is in some cases and I have to continue. So uh, every equipment uh, it's okay, but uh, if you can use it, that's your equipment and that's it. Yeah. I, I would certainly agree from my perspective that there's a lot to be said for, for some mentorship in amateur astronomy especially with equipment, because, you know, some people get in and like we were asked tonight, um, I'd like to get a telescope. What kind? <clears throat> well, it depends on what you'd like to observe and what your previous experience is. Um, there are a lot of um, what we call the department store telescopes, the dreaded toy telescopes that really get you nowhere. But then there is also the other way of, of, of getting all this expensive equipment and understanding how none of it works mm -hmm. or, or even how it right. goes together. So yeah. I, I think um, in my experience, I, I was, I kind of figured it out myself and it worked all right, but it is really useful to have people there to say, here's how you observe and here's how you do these objects and photography and- Or uh, maybe they, they even okay. don't know what they want. You know, they, yeah. you know, they see, oh, okay, I, I want to see maybe it should be that, okay. You can see with a, a, a too much telescope, but then they realize, oh, I have, I, I want to take the pictures. Uh, but I, I, I see a, a very shiny ball with the, the moons that they are very shiny too. And, mm -hmm. and they, they frustrate it, but yeah. they think that, no, no, this equipment, it, it doesn't help me. But you, it, because maybe some, some, uh, some people, they say, uh, no, uh, you can do it with with that graph. You have to buy this another, and that's the commercial part. And I I, I sell uh, I I work in a cell place of computers, and and like you say, Connor, I every time a, a customer come to to the to the store, I ask uh, for what they want that computer, that uh, printer, because uh, some people uh, goes to the, uh, how much cheaper is the computer or the printer. And, but I, I ask uh, for what do you want to do it uh, with your house or you need to do it for study or something like that because it, it's not the same. And they don't realize that because they think, oh, it's a printer. I use it when I want. And now, hmm. if, if you have an ink, uh, uh, an ink shape uh, printer, uh, you have maybe three weeks to do it, to use it, because the, the, the ink will be dry and yeah. you will not more uh, uh, able, capable to, to print. But with a laser print, you will be maybe month. Or more. Uh, okay, we're going another uh, term, but it's the same thing. Uh, I don't go to commercial, I go to results. Uh, and that's maybe what people uh, need to, to, to show them uh, what uh, yeah. they really want. You can do this, you can do this, you can observation, you can do photos you can uh, do i don't know uh, documentation you can do education and maybe has the the little spark that uh, turns on right right yeah it, I mean, it's about discovering that spark because it really has to come from within i mm -hmm. mean you you cannot make somebody enjoy something they have to they have to see that saturn's rings or 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 you know or the moon or or a comet or something, or, or even, uh, you know, uh, or, or bullets, you know, or, uh, you know, something that is, is the uh, kind of that spark, like you say, to really have them, once they have that, they're, they're going to go on that journey, right? That, that's the key, the key, and then we can help guide them. And, and it's about setting expectations, like you say, you know, what can you see now? Like if they start saying, you know, and, and make them happy about seeing, like I get a kick out of seeing faint galaxies, like little faint fuzzies, right? And that, that gives me gets me really excited. Yeah. I just love that. Yes. And, and 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 but most people, you know, 
you show people that and it's like what the heck is that a piece of fuzz on the on the eye piece uh, i don't see anything what, what? <laughs> yeah. and it's like <laughs> and uh, that, that's yeah. the context but but but, yeah. but, but in, what they're seeing <laughs> Exactly. So you, you kind of have, uh, but they have to be, uh, but when you, if you kind of set their expectations, say, hey, you're going to see a piece of fuzz here, but then you show them like M51 on an 18 inch daub, right? Uh, you see the spiral arms, it's like, whoa, you know, that's uh, pretty <clears> darn <throat> good, right? I mean, to be able to see that with your own eye and then, then you start to really appreciate, uh, you, know, you know, all the, those photons from millions of uh, hundreds of millions of light years away, right? Tens of light mm -hmm. have come to your eye, and that, and that, and that that connection when you get that, it's it's almost like Scott, you've you know the overview effect. You you, you know that that's just the start of, of that bug. You 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 gotta, but 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 that person it has to be within them, and they have to make sure that, and then just to help them, they they gotta have the right expectations on what they can can and cannot do. Yeah. With different equipment like me i'm still like more the fuzzy uh, not sharp pictures of galaxies where yeah. where it's it's like uh, it's long uh, very far from perfect picture but it leaves me to work with my imagination so there is something uh, yet to get oh, well it's the it's the heart and the mind of the astronomer really yeah it's not so, the equipment you so know. i right. uh, i looked my to example my first second picture of uh, jupiter i took first with my dslr and uh, very I, I saw the galilea moons but then i took the next uh, night i took my uh, eight inch and camera and uh, uh, it's very low it's on 18 degrees of altitude so it was uh, seeing was quite bad but then when after processing it's still fuzzy non-sharp but i think that this is better than i expected because i have something to play around this is not Hubble telescope photo. This is with my eight inch in balcony Shista. And my stuff has taken this picture. And that gives me so much joy that is like photons from star, our sun, first travels behind me with speed of light, hits the Jupiter, punches back, travels almost half away back and hits my small, small, small sensor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, is, that, makes, that makes the, the uh, party even more <laughs> party. You know, I have here the Cosmos of Carl Sagan. Ooh. Oh, yeah. This is the... Uh, I don't know the, the edition is in Spanish, of course, but uh, it's very old because my, my father about, uh, I don't know, I, I was very little boy and he has it. So I remember seeing the pictures of the uh, nebulas and galaxies. And, you know, this is a picture. I don't know. Uh, okay. Oh. oh, your background's toying around <laughs> with it. Let me oh, let me stop the the background. Yeah, that, that will work. Okay, so you see the Orion Nebula. Yeah, you know? this is was uh, well, that was a good picture back then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Exactly, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, this was uh, with the. Um, it was uh, set up by the Hale Observatories, you know, and that that M42 shot was, yeah. This is was mine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Exactly. So you got inspiration from a very young age. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Of, of course, uh, in that time, like. Uh, 
there was film pictures. Uh, you know a lot of that, Scott. We, we talk about this with Caesar, but um, well, let me put the, the, the score again. Okay. And now with the cell phone, you can do it. You oh, can do astronomy. Yes. Oh, look at that. Uh, yeah, so this is my telescope. That's nice. This yes. Is what I started out with yeah. when I was uh, nine and 10 years old. Okay. It's a 40 millimeter. 40 millimeter refractor oh and, my. Uh, had the push pull change for magnification. The finder scope had no adjustment at all. In fact, you can see it's not even aligned mm -hmm. and no <laughs> optics, no optics in the finder. It's just a tube oh. yes. on, on this, yes. this kind of tripod. <laughs> Final, yes. you know, the reason why I keep this telescope is because it's got I sentimental value now, doesn't it? I remind oh. myself that this is where it all started. This was yes. my first observation of the moon. And uh, it cost oh, my yeah. parents uh, in 1970, it cost them $17.50, which was at the time for them, it was, well, a, a, lot of money. It was a big gift. It was. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and you know, when you're when you're that age and you, you get something like that, that's like, what an what an instrument! I mean, what an instrument to have that oh, to play yeah. with. And I, I and, and I think Scott, you were saying you took that apart and <laughs> put it back together many times, right? Many times. The, the original, yeah. And, yeah, and including the eyepieces. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> and and who who knew that many years later, here you go, you're, you're now building them waterproof eyepiece. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. I thought so, yeah. you never know where something like that will take you. So it's it's yeah. uh, it's kind of like that. I started but, my with uh, broken binoculars. It was an eight uh, times fifty binoculars, but the the other tube was broken, and oh, those were you those, really just had one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and those was all too heavy for me to hold. Oh wow! So hmm. I laid laid them on the uh, window shell, mm -hmm. and was on my knees and uh, get some. Uh, on oh, the window, so yeah. And uh, what's That's the cool. fun? What's the fun is what uh, I read about the protuberances on the on the sun. Right. Uh, uh, when I was eight or nine, so it took forty six years for me to take my own picture of prominences. I see. Oh, yeah. yeah. The forty six right. years I before I read about them them and uh, was like, a, I, it was very hard for eight years old to remember protuberance. And 46 years after, wow. I took my yeah. own picture. Yeah. From, yes. So that was like, uh, it was, you, I could say that was a holy moment. Yeah. Wow. To wait 46 yeah. hours and then get an own taken picture. So that was okay, right now. <laughs> but yeah. uh, and, and it's well, not it's not a specific, uh, specifically good picture, but it it's it picture of prominences. Well, this is the travel that we did with Nico and uh, Sebastiani Yalan. Uh, this is a place in Sierra de la Ventana, what we did. Uh, it's a, a, a very mountain place. In, and this is the, 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 the window. This is the nice. mountain window. Okay. Uh, and this is a selfie that I, that I took with the camera. Nice. Uh, here's Nico. <laughs> here's Nico. Oh, yeah, cool, cool. And... Well, this is in the eclipse, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about the, the prominences. I remember seeing that. Uh, I always want to see the prominences of the sun. Always. Uh, when I bought my bother filter, I, uh, of course, I know uh, that I couldn't see it, but I, I, I can see the, the, you know, the, the, the dark spot uh, of the sun. But always want to see that plasma uh, 
show, um, goes beyond of the sun and in the in the pictures that I did I, I could took it well in this case it's, uh, it's like there but uh, well that was yeah. beautiful wow, that's what crisp here this is the oh it's very it's really nice really it's big a, it's very Whoa. big I did wow. a, the oh, that's the conversation nice. Oh, with some oh, one, wow. two, three, four, five earth, mm. one beside of, of the another one, because I do the calculation of the Very diameter cool. of the of the sun and uh, uh, and comparison with obviously the moon. I did some maths and give me the the size of the five earth, uh, putting it together, and there's another one. And and there was a uh, more. Uh, let me see if I find some crude image. I took. A, a, you can see I was a machine gun in that day. Because Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing lucky imaging in yourself. <laughs> well, At least 2019. Uh, no, it was the 2020. Uh, the four. Yes, last December. Uh, the 2019, uh, uh, I, I, it was in, in my city, in Chivilcoy, uh, 20 kilometers from here, it was the, the middle of the place that will be better, but we have clouds. <laughs> I only uh, um, could see the, uh, when it was completely, and then uh, it turns, it turns again the, the sun. Um, I don't remember in what image. Uh, I think it's in this here. Mm. Wow. Really Love the diamond beautiful. ring. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, man. Multiple prominences. That's incredible. And see wow. this. This is not. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, mountains and the, the, yeah. that's not, the, the exactly. Moon. It's not a perfect the edge sphere. of the moon. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see the craters, the mountains. Yeah, that's awesome. The ridges. That is really cool. It's Actually, really, you can uh, see it on the bottom left. Spectacular, too. beautiful. Yeah. Here's Lots some... of good stuff in that picture. Wow. This was very very shiny. This was without the. <laughs> The, the the filter no let me here he's with the uh, with the filter for everyone is seeing this is with a filter but when you put out mm. see he, oh this little uh, line is this <laughs> oh my <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> it really hurts with your eyes. Oh yeah, and oh, gosh. it's yeah. only a, a picture, and only that shows how how strong sun is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, this is this is amazing, you know. And and they are not close to each other, moon and sun. They are oh, <laughs> a little bit, there is a 150 million kilometers behind them, between them. Mm. Well, here I was continuing uh, taking pictures and I remember uh, almost uh, in, I think it was in these pictures, I see uh, through the, the, the camera, and I see the, the clouds passing by, but also the prominences with my own eyes, but not uh, directly uh, uh, for precaution, but I could see it, you know, uh, and, that's how, and that was amazing. Here, look at this. These are the prominences, but this is oh. sun, surface yeah wow that's right on the edge 
Whoa. Nice. Man. How did you do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> With a lot of I, work, that's for sure. I, I was taking pictures. Uh, one by one. Tac, yes. tac, 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 tac. Uh, I with this camera, I yeah. only can do uh, six pictures, uh, uh, one uh, by another. But I was uh, putting the 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 speed of the picture, uh, and I don't remember. The, uh, let me see. This is the the, the number zero dos sesenta y siete zero dos sesenta y siete acá. Y acá me va a tirar. Here's uh, ISO 1600 and one over uh, 1000 seconds of exposure. To get this, this is the, the original. The other one was dated, but uh, this is the, the raw format. Mm. Wow. It's more darkness. But I think in this in this time uh, it was a cloud passing by. You know, you can mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Right. Changing a lot and look at the colors though. It's beautiful. Yeah, really nice. It contrasts that. It's like a flare, mm -hmm. but it's a huge, very huge. A five planets Earth. <laughs> you, yes. It, it, yeah, in here you can see the, the clouds. In this case, it was very in this color, the sky, this very blue darkness, and and here's some uh, uh, overexposure pictures. Here's in, coming out the the corona, and here the the clouds is going passing by. Uh, so well, it's mesmerizing very, yeah i feel like i'm watching another eclipse this is great <laughs> beautiful you can see all the, the the corona structures that's really nice i love the wispy bits on the north and south poles there those are really stunning mm -hmm. and this is a uh, capable to see it with your own eyes this is amazing yeah I yeah when you see this. when you see that there is there is no substitute. I mean, that that uh, that wow moment when you can see the some structure in the corona and you see those those arcs coming out. Uh, it's like wow, you can actually see it. Mm -hmm. It's like surreal. It's awesome. Yeah, this is amazing. And well, the he's is so dark too. Yes, he is in this part. Is going. Uh started to get more flares you can see a very shiny and and then uh, well here's another one it's very it's like overexposed but oh all that flares this is not the surface this is a, a, the flares and the other ones it was uh, covered by the moon and then it starts to 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 get the, the light. Oh, and well, then I get that this. was diamond ring. That's yes. beautiful. Whoa. Yeah. Prepared. And, and I'm still taking pictures. This is one by another one. This is very fast. Yeah. It's Look like at this. Fraction of a second it happens. It's very quick. And look at this. Yeah. And I say, okay, no, I have to put again the, the filter because I yeah. will not have any more camera. Very quickly right now. And yeah, then see, I put it the and see all the brightness, it was this. Mm -hmm. It's just that oh, thin line. Yes. <laughs> it only happens one second. In this case, in this photo, and then yeah. started while well, I, I continuing, and that's it. That's a very shortly resume of the eclipse. Uh, nice. It was uh, unforgettable. 
feeling. Unforgettable feeling, yes. Of Definitely. course. Unfortunately, it wasn't dark spots uh, on the sun, sun surface, but uh, because it will be very good. Uh, uh, cool. I remember um, a guy who's doing astrophotography uh, pictures. Let me. I, I saw the, the sky page of the NASA. Wow. Uh, that, that's so. Uh, well, this is the, the, the sky page. And they put, uh, they upload some pictures of that time. Unfortunately, they don't put any photo of mine but uh, this is an amazing picture he this was took by uh, um, eduardo Schalberger, Schalberger, uh, Popo. Uh, he's from santa fe he, mm -hmm. he wasn't able to go into balcheta but uh, his this this was taken from his house uh, this was with the coronado and this they, they are the same flares that I took. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that is neat. That is neat. Well, you know, that's that's the, the real thing is is kind of this self-discovery. When you when you can even if it's your if it's totally different type or style of picture, to be able to see the same types of structures in, in celestial objects. Mm -hmm. uh, is is it, it gives you that connection and it, which is really interesting about this you know the talking about the journey of self discovery it doesn't matter how crude the picture is if you can see those same prominences with whatever equipment you have for example it's it's just it's amazing and it's real it's like wow yeah you know all all those things like when i when i took the picture of uh, whatever the eagle nebula with the pillars creation is not a great picture but hey I can see it. I can see the the pillars and uh, yeah, that's just it's like it's so cool, right? Well, I mean, to be able to do that yourself. <laughs> that's, that's, exactly, <laughs> you you makes you you know it's it's uh, it's it's wonderful and you know oh this is cool. Um, this is then, the, you know, the 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 yeah. the the back uh, how you say the back uh, the backstage. Here's the <laughs> the Max Sutton telescope behind me and that I I. I'm capable to, to, to grab it. He's my car. Uh, he's the, the, the car of Ariel that we found. Uh, this is the place. This wall helps us a lot because it was a very windy day. It was Patagonian windy. <laughs> Caesar oh, yeah. was uh, almost uh, one kilometer from us, and they are uh, they they don't have protection. So. The wind was yeah. passing by, passing by, passing by, and it, when uh, this is <laughs> the the Argentina uh, technology, <laughs> a, <cell phone laughs> friend, a piece of carton to don't get a, a hotter and start and leave it uh, taking pictures. This is from a friend. That's great. And here's Nico. Here's his Dobsonian cover. Wow. Of his car. Uh, these are people that they will pass <laughs> stuff again. That's nice. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. ten-inch uh, Dobsonian. That's a great scope because it's it's nice and light, easy to maneuver around, easy to easy to transport. That's awesome. Oh, look at this. Uh, this is Ariel with his uh, refractor with the, the homemade uh, filter, and you know, you know what? You see the the, the wall when oh, yeah. the, the eclipse uh, before it starts is look it, it's like when you see those movies of uh, Mars. It was like it would be you've been there, uh, of course. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. The landscape really changes into that that hue, that kind of rusty hue. Um, it really, it, you're right. It affects the entire, like like for example, uh, we we were close to some trees, 
the green goes mm-hmm. away. Uh, no, you know, this is desert. Yes, and but Very... even with even even if you have uh, the vegetation, it starts to neutralize. Yeah, it's it changes. Yeah, there, oh, you even have it on film. That's awesome. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's really a neat uh, effect. It kind of makes it monochrome with a hue. Hmm. Yes. And this is uh, my filter, my solar filter. And I remember uh, it was starting to rain. And when the sun comes again, uh, dry the, the water and uh, it was uh, dirty. <laughs> Leaves, uh, leaves the the dirt of the of the of the rain. <laughs> and yes. of course, yes. this is when the the clips finish, and so we start to to eat chorizo, chorizo seco, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the famous uh, Argentinian barbecue. <laughs> yes. Now th- th- this is. Um, Like um, is it a sandwich, like a chorizo sandwich or something, or no? something like that. But uh, this is with only cheese, yeah, uh, 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 bread and uh, the, okay. the chorizo, and that's it. Simple sandwich, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, and you you will eat it and eat it and eat it, <laughs> and so this is a, a picture of a uh, well. This is me, Nico, Seba, uh, um, Alan, and this is Ariel. He's uh, another friend of us that we we met in here. You know, uh, we drive uh, more uh, of the road, and then he calls me and he said, "Where are you? Uh, we are in here." But uh, he said, hey, "Man, I'm uh, six." Uh, 16 meters uh, um, behind you. Come to come with us. I have a better place, and this is was amazing, a, amazing place because that wall. Well, you can see the chorizo here. Yes, <laughs> and and that's it. That's uh, at that time we start to to return. I, this, this was maybe 3 p.m. and we uh, come to uh, to the hotel almost 1 a.m. of the morning. Uh, we only stop one time in that that night, and it was a very very good journey. Wow, what a, what a right. great experience. That's uh, really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Loved it. Yeah, yeah you yes. covered it really well, too. You, you t- covered all the, the, you know, the whole feeling of it. <laughs> you know? Did, I, did you see the, the back of, the, of my car, how it was? <laughs> yes. But I have another telescope. <laughs> it was my... Other... Of course. No, no. But... Of course, I travel alone. I did it with my fiance. Now she will be, uh, she will not support that travel. But uh, then uh, Seba, the another guy, traveled with me. So we went uh, two and two with both cars and chatting with the uh, with the walkie-talkie because uh, in that place or no, some place uh, we don't have a cell phone signal. And oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So we can be communicated with us to do well. Uh, you have to go to the bathroom. Okay, we will, we will follow you. Uh, and that communication of travel. And, and that was very intelligent because uh, maybe he um, passing by a, 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 um, a truck uh, and he said, uh, pass okay, it, it doesn't come uh, anyone. And so I passing through. Or, or he said, wait. And <laughs> when we are going to, to San Antonio Este, uh, Nico um, uh, thought that he has a, a fuel uh, in his car. But when he saw the, 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 the medidor, the, the, the fuel, uh, 
it was uh, he didn't realize he was um, with the car uh, ups, uh, upside up and uh, when we are in the middle of the desert he says uh, the the emergency of fuel uh, uh, start on <laughs> so wow. I, I I went uh, in front of him and we traveled at almost uh, 80 uh, kilometers per hour maybe there will be 60 miles per hour <laughs> in the middle of the desert <laughs> wow yes now that and that's that's the things that we always remember because it, they're funny stories and and that's all the the travel stories yeah uh, yep yep Oh, guys. Well, it's past the midnight hour, and yes. uh, I'm turning into a pumpkin, I think. So, <laughs> same here. <laughs> it's, uh, it was, it's been a great day, though, and um, uh, wonderful to spend it with all of you and with all of you in the audience, too. And uh, I know they got a lot out of it. We had people uh waking up in uh, united emirates watching it from about 4 a.m till you know work time it's it's about nine something over there in the morning uh and uh we are uh uh you know it's it's a honor to to be able to uh you know be with all of you guys you know you, you guys give me a lot of credit but Really, the only thing I do is I just kind of hook it up and and, <laughs> and and send out the emails and stuff like that. It, but it is really it's it's the presenters on this show that make the Global Star Party what it is uh, and the audience. And so um, I'm glad to, uh, you know, for me, it's an honor to go for the ride and uh, uh, to be able to interact with all of you because I'm. I get a lot out of this too. You know, it's very rich for me. And uh, so I love it. And, um, but uh, it's time, it's time to uh, call it a, a night. And um, thanks very much. Yeah, that Thank was you, awesome. Scott. Thanks a lot, Thank Scott. You and, and that for your words. And yes, <laughs> it's we'll, 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 we'll miss here. We'll miss uh, we'll miss you next week, but uh, have yeah, a yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, uh, we will not have yeah. a global star party uh, the following week. Uh, be gone all week, and we won't have any programming for that week. But uh, we'll be back uh, with some some great star parties. Uh, don't forget, uh, Dr. Linda Spilker will be on August twenty fifth. You're going to want to mark your calendar for that, um, and she will be. You know, this is this is someone that's made it full loop from from uh, her, her young life working on the Voyager spacecraft missions to uh, working on Cassini. And now she's back at, uh, with the team uh, controlling the Voyager uh, spacecraft. Uh, awesome. So I, I, that just blows my mind. It blows my <laughs> mind that they're, you know, they it's fired like a, off the engines. The, the Phoenix. The, what's that? It's like the Phoenix. It's like the Phoenix. It is. It is. I mean, they've been flying these spacecraft since the 1970s. So, mm -hmm. you know, and it was not too long ago, maybe one or two years ago, that they fired off the engine to do a course correction on one of them. And the engine had not been fired in 35 years. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it's, so it's a... Uh, it's just amazing to me to think about that. If you know, uh, we have spacecraft going into interstellar space, and uh, yeah. the New Horizon spacecraft is is uh, you know right behind them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, that would be really cool. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Good, and, uh, good night, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all. Take care. Yes. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night.